Front matter and advertisement of a voyage to the South Sea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Front matter and advertisement. A Voyage to the South Sea, undertaken by command of His Majesty, for the purpose of conveying the breadfruit tree to the West Indies, in His Majesty's ship the Bounty, commanded by Lieutenant William Bly, including an account of the mutiny on board the said ship, and the subsequent voyage of part of the crew, in the ship's boat, from Tafoya, one of the friendly islands, to Timor, a Dutch settlement in the East Indies. The whole illustrated with charts, etc. Published by permission of the Lords Commissioners of the Admiralty. London. Printed for George Nicole, bookseller to His Majesty, Paul Mall. 1792. Advertisement. At the time I published the narrative of the mutiny on board the Bounty, it was my intention that the preceding part of the voyage should be contained in a separate account. This method I have since been induced to alter. The reason of the narrative appearing first was for the purpose of communicating early information concerning an event which had attracted the public notice, and, being drawn up in a hasty manner, it required many corrections. Some circumstances likewise were omitted, and the notation of time used in the narrative being according to sea reckoning, in which the days begin and end at noon, must have produced a degree of obscurity and confusion to readers accustomed only to the civil mode and this would have increased as the remainder of the voyage on account of numerous shore occurrences at otaheite and elsewhere could not with clearness and propriety have been related in any other than the usual manner of reckoning Besides remedying these inconveniences, I have thought a fuller account of our passage from Timor to Europe than that contained in the narrative would not be unacceptable. These reasons, with the manifest convenience of comprising the whole voyage in one continued narrative, in preference to letting it appear in disjointed accounts, will, it is hoped, be allowed a sufficient excuse for having varied from the original intention. Nevertheless, for the accommodation of the purchasers of the narrative already published, those who desire it will be supplied with the other parts of the voyage separate, i.e., the part previous to the mutiny and the additional account after leaving Timor. End of Advertisement Chapter 1 of A Voyage to the South Sea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly Chapter 1 Plan of the Expedition Outfit and Occurrences to the Time of Leaving England Description of the Breadfruit 1787 The King, having been graciously pleased to comply with the request from the merchants and planters interested in His Majesty's West India possessions, that the breadfruit tree might be introduced into those islands, a vessel proper for the undertaking was bought and taken into dock at Deptford to be provided with the necessary fixtures and preparations for executing the object of the voyage. These were completed according to a plan of my much-honoured friend, Sir Joseph Banks, which in the event proved the most advantageous that could have been adopted for the intended purpose. August 16. The ship was named the Bounty. I was appointed to command her on the 16th of August, 1787. Her burden was nearly 215 tons, her extreme length on deck 90 feet 10 inches, extreme breadth twenty-four feet three inches and height in the hold under the beams at the main hatchway ten feet three inches in the cockpit were the cabins of the surgeon gunner botanist and clerk with the steward room and store rooms the between decks was divided in the following manner the great cabin was appropriated for the preservation of the plants and extended as far forward as the after hatchway 
it had two large skylights and on each side three scuttles for air and was fitted with a false floor cut full of holes to contain the garden pots in which the plants were to be brought home the deck was covered with lead and at the foremost corners of the cabin were fixed pipes to carry off the water that drained from the plants in the tubs placed below to save it for future use i had a small cabin on one side to sleep in adjoining to the great cabin and a place near the middle of the ship to eat in the bulkhead of this apartment was at the after part of the main hatchway and on each side of it were the berths of the mates and midshipmen between these berths the arm chest was placed the cabin of the master in which was always kept the key of the arms was opposite to mine this particular description of the interior parts of the ship is rendered necessary by the event of the expedition the ship was masted according to the proportion of the navy but on my application the masts were shortened as i thought them too much for her considering the nature of the voyage september three on the third of september the ship came out of dock but the carpenters and joiners remained on board much longer as they had a great deal of work to finish the next material alteration made in the fitting out was lessening the quantity of iron and other ballast i gave directions that only nineteen tons of iron should be taken on board instead of the customary proportion which was forty-five tons the stores and provisions i judged would be fully sufficient to answer the purpose of the remainder for i am of opinion that many of the misfortunes which attend ships in heavy storms of wind are occasioned by too much dead weight in their bottoms the establishment of men and officers for the ship were as follows one lieutenant to command one master one boatswain one gunner one carpenter one surgeon two master's mates two midshipmen two quartermasters one quartermaster's mate one boatswain's mate one gunner's mate one carpenter's mate one carpenter's crew one sailmaker one armorer one corporal one clerk and steward twenty-three able seamen forty-four total two skilful and careful men were appointed at sir joseph bank's recommendation to have the management of the plants intended to be brought home the one david nelson who had been on similar employment in captain cook's last voyage the other william brown as an assistant to him with these two our whole number amounted to forty-six it was proposed that our route to the society islands should be round cape horn and the greatest dispatch became necessary as the season was already far advanced but the shipwrights not being able to complete their work by the time the ship was ready in other respects our sailing was unavoidably retarded october thursday four however by the fourth of october the pilot came on board to take us down the river tuesday nine on the ninth we fell down to long reach where we received our gunners stores and guns four four-pounders and ten swivels the ship was stored and victualled for eighteen months in addition to the customary allowance of provisions we were supplied with sauerkraut portable soup essence of malt dried malt and a proportion of barley and wheat in lieu of oatmeal i was likewise furnished with a quantity of ironwork and trinkets to serve in our intercourse with the natives in the south seas and from the board of longitude i received a timekeeper made by mr kendall monday fifteen on the fifteenth i received orders to proceed to spithead november sunday four but the winds and weather were so unfavorable that we did not arrive there till the fourth of november on the twenty fourth i received from lord hood who commanded at spithead my final orders the wind which for several days before had been favorable was now turned directly against us wednesday twenty eight on the twenty eighth the ship's company received two months pay in advance and on the following morning we worked out to st helens 
where we were obliged to anchor. 1787, December, Sunday 23. We made different unsuccessful attempts to get down channel, but contrary winds and bad weather constantly forced us back to St. Helens, or Spithead, until Sunday the 23rd of December when we sailed with a fair wind. During our stay at Spithead, the rate of the timepiece was several times examined by Mr. Bailey's observations at the Portsmouth Observatory. On the 19th of December, the last time of its being examined on shore, it was one minute, fifty-two seconds, five too fast for mean time, and then losing at the rate of one second, one per day, and at this rate I estimated its going when we sailed. The object of all the former voyages to the South Seas undertaken by the command of His Present Majesty has been the advancement of science and the increase of knowledge. This voyage may be reckoned the first, the intention of which has been to derive benefit from those distant discoveries. For the more fully comprehending the nature and plan of the expedition, and that the reader may be possessed of every information necessary for entering on the following sheets, I shall here lay before him a copy of the instructions I received from the Admiralty, and likewise a short description of the breadfruit. By the Commissioners for Executing the Office of Lord High Admiral of Great Britain and Ireland, etc. Whereas the King, upon a representation from the merchants and planters interested in his majesty's west india possessions that the introduction of the breadfruit tree into the islands of those seas to constitute an article of food would be a very essential benefit to the inhabitants hath in order to promote the interest of so respectable a body of his subjects especially in an instance which promises general advantage thought fit that measures should be taken for the procuring some of these trees and conveying them to the said west india islands and whereas the vessel under your command hath in consequence thereof been stored and victualled for that service and fitted with the proper conveniences and necessaries for the preservation of as many of the said trees as from her size can be taken on board her and you have been directed to receive on board her the two gardeners named in the margin david nelson and william brown who from their knowledge of trees and plants have been hired for the purpose of selecting such as shall appear to be of a proper species and size you are therefore in pursuance of his majesty's pleasure signified to us by lord signy one of his principal secretaries of state hereby required and directed to put to sea in the vessel you command the first favorable opportunity of wind and weather and proceed with her as expeditiously as possible round cape horn to the society islands situate in the southern ocean in the latitude of about eighteen degrees south and longitude of about two hundred and ten degrees east from greenwich where according to the accounts given by the late captain cook and persons who accompanied him during his voyage the breadfruit tree is to be found in the most luxurious state having arrived at the above mentioned islands and taken on board as many trees and plants as may be thought necessary the better to enable you to do which you have already been furnished with such articles of merchandise and trinkets as it is supposed will be wanted to satisfy the natives you are to proceed from thence through endeavour straits which separate new holland from new guinea to prince's island in the straits of sunda or if it should happen to be more convenient to pass on the eastern side of java to some port on the north side of that island where any breadfruit trees which have been injured or have died may be replaced by mangosteens durians jacks nancas lanfas and other fine fruit trees of that quarter as well as the rice plant which grows upon dry land all of which species or such of them as shall be judged most eligible you are to purchase on the best terms you can from the inhabitants of that island with the ducats with which you have also been furnished for that purpose 
taking care however if the rice plants above mentioned cannot be procured at java to touch at prince's island for them where they are regularly cultivated from prince's island or the island of java you are to proceed round the cape of good hope to the west indies calling on your way thither at any places which may be thought necessary and deposit one half of such of the above mentioned trees and plants as may be then alive at his majesty's botanical gardens at st vincent for the benefit of the windward islands and then go on to jamaica and having delivered the remainder to mr east or such person or persons as may be authorized by the governor and council of that island to receive them refreshed your people and received on board such provisions and stores as may be necessary for the voyage make the best of your way back to england repairing to spithead and sending to our secretary an account of your arrival and proceedings and whereas you will receive herewith a copy of the instructions which have been given to the above-mentioned gardeners for their guidance as well as in procuring the said trees and plants and the management of them after they shall be put on board as for bringing to england a small sample of each species and such others as may be prepared by the superintendent of the botanical garden at st vincent's and by the said mr east or others for his majesty's garden at kew you are hereby required and directed to afford and to give directions to your officers and company to afford the said gardeners every possible aid and assistance not only in the collecting of the said trees and plants at the places before mentioned but for their preservation during their conveyance to the places of their destination given under our hands the twentieth november seventeen eighty seven how charles brett r d hopkins j levinson gower to lieutenant william bligh commanding his majesty's armed vessel the bounty at spithead by command of their lordships p stevens in the foregoing orders it is to be observed that i was particularly directed to proceed round cape horn but as the season was so far advanced and we were so long detained by contrary winds i made application to the admiralty for discretional orders on that point to which i received the following answer by the commissioners for executing the office of lord high admiral of great britain and ireland etc etc the season of the year being now so far advanced as to render it probable that your arrival with the vessel you command on the southern coast of america will be too late for your passing round cape horn without much difficulty and hazard you are in that case at liberty notwithstanding former orders to proceed in her to otaheite round the cape of good hope given under our hands the eighteenth december seventeen eighty seven how charles brett bayham to lieutenant william bligh commanding his majesty's armed vessel bounty spithead by command of their lordships p stevens the breadfruit is so well known and described that to attempt a new account of it would be unnecessary and useless however as it may contribute to the convenience of the reader i have given the following extracts respecting it with the plate annexed extract from the account of dampier's voyage round the world performed in sixteen eighty eight the breadfruit as we call it grows on a large tree as big and high as our largest apple trees it hath a spreading head full of branches and dark leaves the fruit grows on the boughs like apples it is as big as a penny loaf when wheat is at five shillings the bushel it is of a round shape and hath its thick tough rind when the fruit is ripe it is yellow and soft and the taste is sweet and pleasant the natives of guam use it for bread they gather it when full grown while it is green and hard then they bake it in an oven which scorches the rind and makes it black but they scrape off the outside black crust and there remains a tender thin crust and the inside is soft tender and white like the crumb of a penny loaf 
there is neither seed nor stone in the inside but all is of a pure substance like bread it must be eaten new for if it is kept above twenty-four hours it grows harsh and chalky but it is very pleasant before it is too stale this fruit lasts in season eight months in the year during which the natives eat no other sort of food of bread kind i did never see of this fruit anywhere but here the natives told us that there is plenty of this fruit growing on the rest of the ladrone islands and i did never hear of it anywhere else volume one page two hundred ninety six extract from the account of lord anson's voyage published by mr walter there was a tinny and the kind of fruit peculiar to these ladrone islands called by the indians rime but by us the breadfruit for it was constantly eaten by us during our stay upon the island instead of bread and so universally preferred that no ship's bread was expended in that whole interval footnote about two months namely from the latter end of august to the latter end of october seventeen forty two it grew upon a tree which is somewhat lofty and which towards the top divides into large and spreading branches the leaves of this tree are of a remarkable deep green are notched about the edges and are generally from a foot to eighteen inches in length the fruit itself is found indifferently on all parts of the branches it is in shape rather elliptical than round it is covered with a tough rind and is usually seven or eight inches long each of them grows singly and not in clusters this fruit is fittest to be used when it is full grown but still green in which state after it is properly prepared by being roasted in the embers its taste has some distant resemblance to that of an artichoke's bottom and its texture is not very different for it is soft and spongy extracts from the account of the first voyage of captain cook hawksworth volume two in the society islands the breadfruit grows on a tree that is about the size of a middling oak its leaves are frequently a foot and a half long of an oblong shape deeply sinuated like those of the fig tree which they resemble in consistence and color and in the exuding of a white milky juice upon being broken the fruit is about the size and shape of a child's head and the surface is reticulated not much unlike a truffle it is covered with a thin skin and has a core about as big as the handle of a small knife the edible part lies between the skin and the core it is as white as snow and somewhat of the consistence of new bread it must be roasted before it is eaten being first divided into three or four parts its taste is insipid with a slight sweetness somewhat resembling that of the crumb of wheaten bread mixed with a jerusalem artichoke pages eighty eighty one see also the plate there and at page two three two of the many vegetables that have been mentioned already as serving them for food the principal is the bread fruit to procure which costs them no more trouble or labor but climbing a tree the tree which produces it does not indeed shoot up spontaneously but if a man plants ten of them in his lifetime which he may do in about an hour he will as completely fulfil his duty to his own and future generations as the native of our less temperate climate can do by ploughing in the cold season and reaping in the summer's heat as often as these seasons return even if after he has procured bread for his present household he should convert a surplus into money and lay it up for his children it is true indeed that the bread fruit is not always in season but coconuts bananas plantains and a great variety of other fruits supply the deficiency page one nine seven extract from the account of captain cook's last voyage in the society islands i captain cook have inquired very carefully into their manner of cultivating the breadfruit tree at Otaheite, but was always answered that they never planted it. This indeed must be evident to every one who will examine the places where the young trees come up. It will be always observed that they spring from the roots of the old ones which run along near the surface of the ground. 
so that the breadfruit trees may be reckoned those that would naturally cover the plains even supposing that the island was not inhabited in the same manner that the white bark trees found at van diemen's land constitute the forests there and from this we may observe that the inhabitants of otaheite instead of being obliged to plant his bread will rather be under the necessity of preventing its progress which i suppose is sometimes done to give room for trees of another sort to afford him some variety in his food volume two page one four five in the sandwich islands the breadfruit trees are planted and flourish with great luxuriance on rising grounds where the hills rise up almost perpendicularly in a great variety of peaked forms their steep sides and the deep chasms between them are covered with trees amongst which those of the breadfruit were observed particularly to abound volume three pages one o five and one fourteen containing captain king's narrative the climate of the sandwich islands differs very little from that of the west india islands which lie in the same latitude upon the whole perhaps it might be rather more temperate captain king i b page one one six the breadfruit trees thrive in these islands not in such abundance but produce double the quantity of fruit they do on the rich plains of otaheite the trees are nearly of the same height but the branches begin to strike out from the trunk much lower and with greater luxuriance captain king i b page one twenty end of chapter one Chapter Two of A Voyage to the South Sea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter Two Departure from England. Arrival at Tenerife. Sail from thence. Arrival off Cape Horn. Severity of the weather. Obliged to bear away for the Cape of Good Hope. 1787, December, Sunday 23. On Sunday morning, the 23rd of December, 1787, we sailed from Spithead and, passing through the Needles, directed our course down channel with a fresh gale of wind at east. In the afternoon, one of the seamen, in furling the main top gallant sail, fell off the yard and was so fortunate as to save himself by catching hold of the main top mast stay in his fall at night the wind increased to a strong gale with a heavy sea tuesday twenty five it moderated however on the twenty fifth and allowed us to keep our christmas with cheerfulness but the following day it blew a severe storm of wind from the eastward which continued till the twenty ninth in the course of which we suffered greatly one sea broke away the spare yards and spars out of the starboard main chains another heavy sea broke into the ship and stove all the boats several casks of beer that had been lashed upon deck were broke loose and washed overboard and it was not without great difficulty and risk that we were able to secure the boats from being washed away entirely saturday twenty nine on the twenty ninth we were in latitude thirty nine degrees thirty five minutes north and longitude fourteen degrees twenty six minutes west when the gale abated and the weather became fair besides other mischief done to us by the storm a large quantity of our bread was damaged and rendered useless for the sea had stove in our stern and filled the cabin with water from this time to our arrival at tenerife we had moderate weather and winds mostly from the northward seventeen eighty eight january january four this forenoon we spoke a french ship bound to the mauritius saturday five tenerife the next day at nine in the forenoon we saw the island of Tenerife bearing west southwest half west about twelve leagues distant. It was covered with a thick haze except the northwesternmost part, which is a remarkable headland, resembling a horse's head, the ears very distinct. To the eastward of this head, footnote, 
south eighty two degrees east by the compass end of footnote lie two round rocks the northern boundary of teneriffe i had a good observation at noon by which i make the latitude of the two rocks twenty eight degrees forty four minutes north and their longitude by our timekeeper sixteen degrees five minutes west to the southward of these and near the shore is a high needle rock about four leagues farther to the southward the coast inclines toward the west to the road of santa cruz where we anchored at half past nine on sunday morning in twenty five fathoms water and moored along shore in the same depth with the cupola tower of the church of st francis bearing west half north one mile the east part of the road east by north the castle on the south point southwest and the west part of the grand canary south southeast a spanish packet bound to canruna an american brig and several other vessels were lying here as soon as the ship was anchored i sent an officer mr christian to wait on the governor and to acquaint him i had put in to obtain refreshments and to repair the damages we had sustained in the bad weather to this i had a very polite answer from the governor footnote marquis de branciforti and the footnote that i should be supplied with whatever the island afforded i had also directed the officer to acquaint him that i would salute provided an equal number of guns were to be returned but as i received an extraordinary answer to this part of my message purporting that his excellency did not return the same number but to persons equal in rank to himself this ceremony was omitted during this interval i was visited by the portmaster captain adams and shortly afterwards several officers came on board from his excellency to compliment me on my arrival as soon as the ship was moored i went on shore and paid my respects to him monday seven on monday morning i began to forward the ship's business with the utmost dispatch and gave the necessary directions to messrs colligan and sons the contractors for the supplies i wanted i also got leave of the governor for mr nelson to range the hills and examine the country in search of plants and natural curiosities as there was a great surf on the shore i bargained for everything i wanted to be brought off by the shore boats and agreed to give five shillings per ton of water very good wine was bought at ten pounds per pipe the contract price but the superior quality was fifteen pounds and some of this was not much inferior to the best london madeira i found this was an unfavourable season for other refreshments indian corn potatoes pumpkins and onions were all very scarce and double the price of what they are in the summer beef also was difficult to be procured and exceedingly poor the price nearly sixpence farthing per pound the corn was three current dollars per faniga which is full five shillings per bushel and biscuit at twenty-five shillings for the hundred pounds poultry was so scarce that a good fowl cost three shillings this is therefore not a place for ships to expect refreshments at a reasonable price at this time of year wine excepted but from march to november supplies are plentiful particularly fruit of which at this time we could procure none except a few dried figs and some bad oranges nautical remarks during our stay here the weather was fair with northeast winds and calms and small drizzling rain in the night the thermometer from sixty six to sixty nine degrees at noon in the shade i could make no lunar observations for the longitude but with the help of the timekeeper i have computed the situation of the town of santa cruz to be twenty eight degrees twenty eight minutes north latitude and sixteen degrees eighteen minutes west longitude i observed the variation by two compasses to be twenty degrees one minute west this much exceeded what i could have imagined for in seventeen seventy six i observed it only fourteen degrees forty minutes west a difference of above five degrees in eleven years and this makes me reflect on the uncertainty of obtaining the exact deviation of the magnetic pole 
and of course its annual variation which never can be accurately ascertained unless the observations are made always in one spot and with the same compass tenerife though considerably without the tropic is so nearly within the limits of the trade winds that navigators generally steer to it from the eastward the road of santa cruz lies on the east side of the island at the end of a range of craggy hills barren and very lofty along with you sail west by south by compass into the road with a sea unfathomable until near the shore the anchoring ground may be accounted from fifty fathoms to twenty or even fifteen the bank is very steep and gives but little time to sound for which reason it should be done effectually with a heavy lead or the ship will be too near in before a stranger is aware of it he will likewise too soon expect to find bottom owing to the great deception of the adjacent high land to obviate these difficulties it is necessary to observe while a town which lies some distance to the southward of santa cruz is open with the castle on the south part of the road though you may appear near to the shore there is no anchorage but after it is shut entirely in you get on the bank the church bearing west or west by south and the south point of the road southwest half south to southwest by west is a good situation for anchoring the depth about twenty-five fathoms the distance from the shore will be three-quarters of a mile and the southernmost land that can be seen there will be a half or quarter point of the compass farther out than the south point of the road the bottom is black soft mud with some patches of rocks for which reasons vessels that lie here any length of time buoy their cables this precaution besides being useful in that particular they think makes them ride more easy when there is much sea setting into the road which with the wind any way to the southward of east or at the southwest must be very considerable it is therefore usual to moor with four anchors though more than two are scarce ever of use mooring is however advisable if a ship is only to remain twenty-four hours and the tighter the better that the cables may keep clear of the ground the landing on the beach is generally impracticable with our boats at least without great risk but there is a very fine pier on which people may land without difficulty if there is not much swell in the road to this pier the water is conveyed by pipes for the use of shipping and for which all merchant ships pay there is a degree of wretchedness and want among the lower class of people which is not anywhere so common as among the spanish and portuguese settlements to alleviate these evils the present governor of tenerife has instituted a most charitable society which he takes the trouble to superintend and by considerable contributions a large airy dwelling that contains one hundred and twenty poor girls and as many men and boys has been built and endowed with a sufficiency of land round it not only for all present purposes but for enlarging the building for more objects of charity as their funds increase i had the honour to be shown by his excellency this asylum hospicio they call it where there appeared in every countenance the utmost cheerfulness and content the decency and neatness of the dress of the young females with the order in which they were arranged at their spinning wheels and looms in an extensive airy apartment was admirable a governess inspected and regulated all their works which were the manufacturing of ribbons of all colours coarse linens and tapes all of which were managed and brought to perfection by themselves from the silk and flax in their first state even the dyeing of the colours is performed by them these girls are received for five years at the end of which they are at liberty to marry and have for their portions their wheel and loom with a sum of money proportioned to the state of the fund which is assisted by the product of their labour and at this time estimated at two thousand dollars per annum the men and boys are not less attended to they are employed in coarser work blanketing and all kinds of common woollens if they become infirm they spend the remainder of their days here comfortably 
and under a watchful inspector who attends them in the same manner as the governess does the girls they are all visited every day by the governor and a clergyman attends them every evening by this humane institution a number of people are rendered useful and industrious in a country where the poor from the indulgence of the climate are too apt to prefer a life of inactivity though attended with wretchedness to attaining the comforts of life by industry and labor the number of inhabitants in the island i was informed were estimated at between eighty and one hundred thousand their annual export of wine is twenty thousand pipes and of brandy half that quantity vessels are frequently here from st Astasia, and thence a great quantity of teneriffe wine is carried to the different parts of the west indies under the name of madeira Teneriffe is considered of more value than all the other canaries the inhabitants however in scarce seasons receive supplies from the grand canary but their vineyards here are said to be greatly superior their produce of corn though exceedingly good is not sufficient for their consumption and owing to this the americans have an advantageous trade here for their flour and grain and take wine in return the town of santa cruz is about half a mile in extent each way built in a regular manner and the houses in general large and airy but the streets are very ill paved i am told that they are subject to few diseases but if any endemic distemper breaks out it is attended with the most fatal consequences particularly the smallpox the bad effects of which they now endeavor to counteract by inoculation for this reason they are very circumspect in admitting ships to have communication with the shore without bills of health a sloop from london called the chance william meredith master bound to barbados out nineteen days from the downs came into the road the day before we sailed she had suffered much by the bad weather but having brought no bill of health the governor would not allow any person to come on shore unless i could vouch for them that no epidemic disease raged in england at the time they sailed which i was able to do it being nearly at the same time that i left the land and by that means they had the governor's permission to receive the supplies they wanted without being obliged to perform quarantine thursday ten having finished our business at teneriffe on thursday the tenth we sailed with the wind at southeast our ship's company all in good health and spirits i now divided the people into three watches and gave the charge of the third watch to mr fletcher christian one of the mates i have always considered this as a desirable regulation when circumstances will admit of it on many accounts and am persuaded that unbroken rest not only contributes much towards the health of a ship's company but enables them to more readily exert themselves in cases of sudden emergency as it was my wish to proceed to otaheite without stopping i ordered every one to be a two-thirds allowance of bread i also directed the water for drinking to be filtered through dripstones that i had bought at teneriffe for that purpose in the evening we passed the south end of teneriffe which is a round lump of land that from the lowness of the contiguous land has at a distance the appearance of a separate island by our run from the bay of santa cruz i make the latitude of the south end of teneriffe to be twenty eight degrees six minutes north we ran all night towards the south southwest having the wind at the southeast the next morning we could see nothing of the land i now made the ship's company acquainted with the intent of the voyage and having been permitted to hold out this encouragement to them i gave assurances of the certainty of promotion to every one whose endeavours should merit it the winds for some days after leaving teneriffe were mostly from the southward fishing lines and tackle were distributed amongst the people and some dolphins were caught thursday seventeen on the seventeenth the wind came round to the northeast and continued steady in that quarter till the twenty fifth on which day at noon we were in three degrees fifty four minutes north 
as the cloudiness of the sky gave us reason to expect much rain we prepared the awnings with hoses for the convenience of saving water in which we were not disappointed from this time to our meeting with the southeast trade winds we had much wet weather the air close and sultry with calms and light variable winds generally from the southward tuesday twenty nine on the twenty ninth there was so heavy a fall of rain that we caught seven hundred gallons of water thursday thirty one on the thirty first latitude at noon two degrees five minutes north found the current setting to the northeast at the rate of fourteen miles in the twenty four hours the temperature was at eighty two degrees in the shade and eighty one and one half degrees at the surface of the sea so that the air and the water were within half a degree of the same temperature at eight o'clock in the evening we observed a violent rippling in the sea about half a mile to the northwest of us which had very much the appearance of breakers this i imagine to have been occasioned by a large school or multitude of fish as it was exactly in the track the ship had passed so that if any real shoal had been there we must have seen it at the close of the evening when a careful lookout was always kept however if it had appeared ahead of us instead of astern i should certainly have tacked to avoid it to such appearances i attribute the accounts of many shoals within the tropics which cannot be found anywhere but in maps our latitude at this time was two degrees eight minutes north and longitude nineteen degrees forty three minutes west the next morning we had more of these appearances from the number of schools of fish by which the ship was surrounded february saturday two this morning we saw a sail to the north northwest but at too great a distance to distinguish what she was monday four had very heavy rain during which we nearly filled all our empty water casks so much wet weather with the closeness of the air covered everything with mildew the ship was aired below with the fires and frequently sprinkled with vinegar and every little interval of dry weather was taken advantage of to open all the hatchways and clean the ship and to have all the people's wet things washed and dried with this weather and light unsteady winds we advanced but two and one half degrees in twelve days at the end of which time we were relieved by the southeast trade wind which we fell in with on the sixth at noon in latitude one degree twenty one minutes north longitude twenty degrees forty two minutes west thursday seven the next afternoon we crossed the equinoctial line in longitude twenty one degrees fifty minutes west the weather became fine and the southeast trade wind was fresh and steady with which we kept a point free from the wind and got to the southward at a good rate the weather continuing dry we put some of our bread in casks properly prepared for its reception to preserve it from vermin this experiment we afterwards found answered exceedingly well saturday sixteen on the sixteenth at daylight we saw a sail to the southward the next day we came up with her and found her to be the british queen simon paul master from london bound to the cape of good hope on the whale fishery she sailed from falmouth the fifth of december eighteen days before i left spithead by this ship i wrote to england at sunset she was almost out of sight astern monday eighteen in the course of this day's run the variation changed from west to east according to our observation the true and magnetic meridians coincided in latitude twenty degrees zero minutes south and longitude thirty one degrees fifteen minutes west at noon we were in latitude twenty degrees forty four minutes south and longitude thirty one degrees twenty three minutes west in our advance towards the south the wind had gradually veered round to the east and was at this time at east northeast the weather after crossing the line had been fine and clear but the air so sultry as to occasion great faintness the quicksilver in the thermometer in the daytime standing at between eighty one and eighty three degrees and one time at eighty five degrees 
In our passage through the northern tropic the air was temperate, the sun having then high south declination, and the weather being generally fine till we lost the northeast trade wind, but such a thick haze surrounded the horizon that no object could be seen except at a very small distance. The haze commonly cleared away at sunset and gathered again at sunrise. Between the northeast and the southeast trade winds, the calms and rains, if of long continuance, are very liable to produce sickness unless great attention is paid to keeping the ship clean and wholesome by giving all the air possible, drying between decks with fires, and drying and airing the people's clothes and bedding. Besides these precautions, we frequently wetted with vinegar, and every evening the pumps were used as ventilators. With these endeavors to secure health, we passed the low latitudes without a single complaint. The currents we met with were by no means regular, nor have I ever found them so in the middle of the ocean. However, from the channel to the southward as far as Madeira, there is generally a current setting to the south-southeast. Thursday, 21. On the evening of the 21st, a ship was seen in the northeast, but at too great a distance to distinguish of what country. Friday, 22. The next day the wind came round to the north and northwest so that we could no longer consider ourselves in the trade wind. Our latitude at noon was 25 degrees 55 minutes south, longitude 36 degrees 29 minutes west. Variation of the compass, 3 degrees east. Saturday, 23. Towards night the wind died away, and we had some heavy showers of rain, of which we profited by saving a ton of good water. The next day we caught a shark and five dolphins. Tuesday, 26. We bent new sails, and made other necessary preparations for encountering the weather that was to be expected in a high latitude. Our latitude at noon was 29 degrees 38 minutes south, longitude 41 degrees 44 minutes west, variation 7 degrees 13 minutes east. In the afternoon, the wind being westerly and blowing strong in squalls, some butterflies and other insects, like what we call horseflies, were blown on board of us. No birds were seen except shearwaters. Our distance from the coast of Brazil at this time was above 100 leagues. March, Sunday 2. In the forenoon, after seeing that every person was clean, divine services were performed according to my usual custom on this day. I gave to Mr. Fletcher Christian, whom I had before directed to take charge of the third watch, a written order to act as a lieutenant. Saturday, 8. We were at noon, in latitude 36 degrees 50 minutes south, and longitude 52 degrees 53 minutes west. The last four days we several times tried for soundings without finding bottom, though considerably to the westward of Captain Wallace's track, who had soundings at 54 fathoms depth, in latitude 35 degrees 40 minutes south, and longitude 49 degrees 54 minutes west. This day we tried with two hundred and forty fathoms of line, but did not find bottom. At the same time, observing a rippling in the water, we tried the current by mooring a keg with one hundred fathoms of line, by which it appeared to run to the north-northwest at the rate of a mile and a half per hour. By the noon observation, however, we were eighteen miles to the southward of our reckoning. In the afternoon we saw a turtle floating, and, not having much wind, hoisted a boat out and sent after it, but it was found to be in a putrid state with a number of crabs feeding upon it. The change of temperature now began to be sensibly felt, there being a variation in the thermometer since yesterday of eight degrees. That the people might not suffer from their own negligence, I gave orders for their light tropical clothing to be put by, and made them dress in a manner more suited to a cold climate. I had provided for this before I left England, by giving directions for such clothes to be purchased as were necessary. Monday, 10. In the forenoon we struck soundings at 83 fathoms depth, 
our latitude forty degrees eight minutes south and longitude fifty five degrees forty minutes west this i conclude to have been near the edge of the bank for the wind being at south southwest we stood towards the southeast and after running fourteen miles in that direction we could find no bottom with one hundred and sixty fathoms of line in the night we stood towards the west southwest with a southerly wind and got again into soundings the next day we saw a great number of whales of immense size that had two spout holes on the back of their head upon a complaint made to me by the master i found it necessary to punish matthew quintal one of the seamen with two dozen lashes for insolence and mutinous behavior before this i had not had occasion to punish any person on board wednesday twelve on the twelfth we caught a porpoise by striking it with the grains every one ate heartily of it and it was so well liked that no part was wasted friday fourteen on the fourteenth in the afternoon we saw a land bird like a lark and passed part of a dead whale that had been left by some whalers after they had taken the blubber off saw likewise two strange sail the next day at noon our latitude was forty three degrees six minutes south and longitude fifty eight degrees forty two minutes west had soundings at seventy five fathoms the bottom a fine greenish sand saw two hawks sunday sixteen on the sixteenth another ship was seen to the west northwest standing to the northward latitude at noon forty three degrees thirty four minutes south we continued running to the southward keeping in soundings wednesday nineteen on the nineteenth at noon by my account we were within twenty leagues of port desire but the wind blowing fresh from the northwest with thick foggy weather i did not attempt to make land we passed a good deal of rock weed and saw many whales and albatrosses and other seabirds thursday twenty on the twentieth at noon our latitude was fifty degrees twenty four minutes south and longitude sixty five degrees fifty minutes west in the afternoon the wind which had for some time past been northerly suddenly shifted to the west southwest and blew hard sunday twenty three we steered to the south southeast and on the twenty third at two o'clock in the morning we discovered the coast of tierra del fuego bearing southeast at nine in the forenoon we were off cape st diego the eastern part of tierra del fuego observed the variation here to be twenty one degrees twenty three east the wind being unfavorable i thought it more advisable to go round to the eastward of staten land than to attempt passing through the straits of miar the two opposite coasts of the straits exhibited very different appearances the land of tierra del fuego hereabouts though the interior parts are mountainous yet near the coast is of moderate height and at the distance we were from it had not an unpromising appearance the coast of staten land near the straits is mountainous and craggy and remarkable for its high peaked hills straits of lemire is a fair opening which cannot well be mistaken but if any doubt could remain the different appearances of the opposite shores would sufficiently make the straits known i did not sail within less than six leagues of the coast that we might have the wind more regular and avoid being exposed to the heavy squalls that came off from the land at noon cape st anthony bore south and the westernmost of the new year's isles southeast one quarter south five or six leagues latitude observed fifty four degrees twenty eight minutes south longitude sixty four degrees four minutes west the sight of new year's harbor almost tempted me to put in but the lateness of the season and the people being in good health determined me to lay aside all thoughts of refreshment until we should reach otaheite at two o'clock in the afternoon the easternmost of new year's isles where captain cook observed the latitude to be fifty five degrees forty minutes south bore from us south four leagues we saw the entrance isles of new year's harbor at the back of which the land is very craggy and mountainous 
This must be a very convenient port to touch at, as the access to it is safe and easy. The harbour lies south-southeast by compass from the northeast part of the easternmost of the New Year's Islands. About two leagues to the westward of Cape St. John, I observed the separation of the mountains that Captain Cook had taken notice of, which has the appearance of Staten Land being there divided into two islands. At sunset, Cape St. John bore south-southeast five or six leagues. The land hereabouts is of less height and not so rugged as near New Year's Harbor. The night coming on, I could get no good view of the coast near the Cape, and at daylight next morning we were at too great a distance. Monday, 24. We had stood to the southward all night with the wind at west, southwest, and southwest. At eight in the morning, Cape St. John bore northwest ten leagues distant. Soon after, we lost sight of the land. From the result of my lunar observation, assisted by the timekeeper, I make the longitude of the west side of Strait St. Mier, 64 degrees 48 minutes west, the easternmost of the New Year's Island, 63 degrees 52 minutes west, and the longitude of Cape St. John, 63 degrees 19 minutes west. In our run from the latitude of 12 degrees south to 48 degrees south, the ship was set 2 degrees 30 minutes to the eastward by currents, and from the latitude of 48 degrees south to Staten Land, the current set us to the westward 2 degrees 43 minutes, which I imagine to have been occasioned by an indraft into the Straits of Magellan. From the time we lost sight of the land to the end of the month, we were struggling with bad weather and contrary winds. Monday, 31. But on the morning of the 31st, the wind came to the north-northeast and made us entertain great hopes that we should be able to accomplish our passage round the Cape without much difficulty. At noon, we were in latitude 60 degrees 1 minute south and in 71 degrees 45 minutes west longitude, which is 8 degrees 26 minutes west of the meridian of Cape St. John. This flattering appearance was not of long continuance. In the night the wind became variable, and next day settled again in the west and northwest with very bad weather. April Wednesday, too. On the second in the morning the wind, which had blown fresh all night from the northwest, came round to the southwest and increased to a heavy gale. At six in the morning the storm exceeded what I had ever met with before, and the sea, from the frequent shifting of the wind, running in contrary directions, broke exceedingly high. Our ship, however, lay to very well and remained, and forced a sail. The gale continued with severe squalls of hail and sleet the remainder of this and all the next day. Friday, 4. On the 4th the wind was less violent, but far from moderate. With so much bad weather, I found it necessary to keep a constant fire night and day, and one of the watch always attended to dry the people's wet clothes, and this I have no doubt contributed as much to their health as to their comfort. Our companions in this inhospitable regions were albatrosses and two beautiful kinds of birds, the small blue petrel and pintada. A great many of these were frequently about the wake of the ship, which induced the people to float a line with hooks baited to endeavor to catch them, and their attempts were successful. The method they used was to fasten the bait a foot or two before the hook, and by giving the line a sudden jerk when the bird was at the bait, it was hooked in the feet or body. Sunday, 6. On the 6th, the weather was moderate and continued so till the 9th, with the wind varying between the northwest and southwest, of which we were able to take advantage. Monday, 7. On the 7th, observed the variation 27 degrees 9 minutes east, our latitude 60 degrees 24 minutes south, and longitude 75 degrees 54 minutes west. Wednesday, 9. On the 9th at noon, we were in latitude 59 degrees 31 minutes south, and our longitude 76 degrees 58 minutes west, which is further to the west than we had yet been. The weather was now unfavorable again, blowing strong from the westward with a high sea. 
on the tenth we saw some fish which appeared spotted and about the size of bonitos these were the only fish we had seen in this high latitude saturday twelve the stormy weather continued with the great sea the ship now began to complain and required to be pumped every hour which was no more than we had reason to expect from such a continuance of gales of wind and high seas the decks also became so leaky that it was obliged to allot the great cabin of which i had made little use except in fine weather to those people who had wet berths to hang their hammocks in and by this means the between decks was less crowded every morning all the hammocks were taken down from where they hung and when the weather was too bad to keep them upon deck they were put in the cabin so that the between decks were cleaned daily and aired with fires if the hatchways could not be opened with all this bad weather we had the additional mortification to find at the end of every day that we were losing ground for notwithstanding our utmost exertions and keeping on the most advantageous tax which if the weather had been at all moderate would have sufficiently answered our purpose yet the greater part of the time we were doing little better than drifting before the wind sunday thirteen birds as usual were about the ship and some of them caught and for the first time since we left staten land we saw some whales this morning owing to the violent motion of the ship the cook fell and broke one of his ribs and another man by a fall dislocated his shoulder the gunner who had the charge of the watch was laid up with the rheumatism and this was the first sick list that appeared on board the ship the time of full moon which was approaching made me entertain hopes that after that period we would experience some change of wind or weather in our favour but the event did not at all answer to our expectations the latitude at noon this day was fifty eight degrees nine minutes south and longitude seventy six degrees one minute west as we caught a good many birds but which were all lean and tasted fishy we tried an experiment upon them which succeeded admirably by keeping them cooped up and cramming them with ground corn they improved wonderfully in a short time so that the pinata birds became as fine as ducks and the albatrosses were as fat and not inferior in taste to fine geese some of the latter birds were caught that measured seven feet between the extremities of the wings when spread this unexpected supply came very opportunely for none of our livestock remained except hogs the sheep and poultry not being hardy enough to stand the severity of the weather sunday twenty this morning the wind died away and we had a calm for a few hours which gave us hopes that the next would be a more favourable wind a hog was killed for the ship's company which gave them an excellent meal toward noon to our great disappointment the wind sprang up again from the westward and in the afternoon blew strong with snow and hailstones monday twenty one this was the second day after the full moon but as i have remarked before it had no influence on the weather at noon our latitude was fifty eight degrees thirty one minutes south and longitude seventy degrees seven minutes west which is near seven degrees to the eastward of our situation on the morning of the ninth instant when we had advanced the furthest in our power to the westward being then in seventy six degrees fifty eight minutes west three degrees to the west of cape de Seado, the west part of the straits of magellan and at this time we were three degrees fifty two minutes to the east of it and hourly losing ground it was with much concern i saw how hopeless and even unjustifiable it was to persist any longer in attempting a passage this way to the society islands we had been thirty days in this tempestuous ocean at one time we had advanced so far to the westward to have a fair prospect of making our passage round but from that period hard gales of westerly wind had continued without intermission a few hours excepted which to borrow an expression in lord anson's voyage were quote, like the elements drawing breath to return upon us with redoubled violence unquote. 
the season was now too far advanced for us to expect more favorable winds or weather and we had sufficiently experienced the impossibility of beating round against the wind or of advancing at all without the help of a fair wind for which there was little reason to hope another consideration which had great weight with me was that if i persisted in my attempt this way and should after all fail to get round it would occasion such a loss of time that our arrival at otaheite soon enough to return in the proper season by the east indies would be rendered precarious on the other hand the prevalence of the westerly winds in high southern latitudes left me no reason to doubt of making a quick passage to the cape of good hope and thence to the eastward round new holland tuesday twenty two having maturely considered all circumstances i determined to bear away for the cape of good hope and at five o'clock on the evening of the twenty second the wind then blowing strong at west i ordered the helm to be put a weather to the great joy of every person on board our sick list at this time had increased to eight mostly with rheumatic complaints in other respects the people were in good health though exceedingly jaded the passage round cape horn into the south seas during the summer months had seldom been attended with difficulty and is to be preferred in the moderate seasons to the more distant route to the eastward round the cape of good hope and new holland if we had been one month earlier or perhaps less i doubt not but we should have effected our passage the soundings that are met with off the coast of america from the latitude of thirty six degrees south to the southward are very convenient to enable ships to judge of their distance from the land as thick fogs are very frequent near that coast if the winds are favorable to go through the states of la Mier, must considerably shorten the passage round cape horn as all the distances saved is so much gained to the westward i am informed that several harbors have been lately discovered by the south sea whalers on the north side of staten island that afford safe anchorage with supplies of wood and water while we were off cape horn i did not observe that our situation was at all affected by currents End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 of A Voyage to the South Sea。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly。Chapter 3 。Passage towards the Cape of Good Hope and search after Tristan da Cunha。Arrival at False Bay. Occurrences there. Reports concerning the Grosvenor's people. Departure from the Cape. 1788, April, Friday 25. The westerly winds and stormy weather continuing gave me no reason to repent of my determination. On the 25th at noon we were in latitude 54 degrees 16 minutes south and longitude 57 degrees 4 minutes west. The nearest of the Falkland Islands, by my reckoning, then bore north 13 degrees west, distance 23 leagues. Our stock of water being sufficient to serve us to the Cape of Good Hope, I did not think it worth while to stop at these islands, as the refreshments we might obtain there would scarce repay us for the expense of time. We therefore continued our course towards the northeast and east northeast. May, Friday, nine. On the ninth of May at eight o'clock in the evening, we were near the situation of Tristan da Cunha our latitude being thirty seven degrees seven minutes south and longitude fifteen degrees twenty six minutes west all the afternoon the weather had been clear enough for land of a moderate height to be seen at at least seven leagues i therefore concluded that we had not yet passed the meridian of the island for the most westerly position given to it from any authority is fifteen degrees zero minutes west as i wished to make this island we kept our wind on different tacks during the night that we might be nearly in the same place at daylight in the morning as on the preceding evening in the morning no land being in sight we continued to steer to the eastward saturday ten 
We ran on all day having clear weather, but without seeing anything to indicate our being near land. At noon, our latitude observed was 37 degrees 27 minutes south, which being more to the southward than we had reason to expect, I altered the course to the northward and steered northeast all the afternoon. At six o'clock in the evening, we were in latitude 37 degrees 0 minutes south and longitude 12 degrees 42 minutes west, having a clear horizon but not the least sign of being in the neighborhood of land. With the night came thick, rainy weather, and we were now to the eastward of the situation ascribed to Tristan de Cunha. I therefore determined to give over the search and to resume our course towards the Cape of Good Hope. The island of Tristan de Cunha, by Robinson's elements, is laid down in 37 degrees 12 minutes south latitude and 13 degrees 23 minutes west longitude. In Captain Cook's general map, prefixed to his last voyage, it is placed at the same latitude, but in 15 degrees west longitude. From our track, in the clearness of the weather, I am convinced, if the latitude ascribed to it as above is correct, that it is not to be found between the meridians of 16 degrees 30 minutes west and 12 degrees 30 minutes west. On the 13th I had a number of lunar observations for the longitude, the mean of which agreed exactly with the timekeeper. Footnote. In Mr. Dalrymple's collection of plans, which I had not with me, the northernmost of the islands of Tristan da Acuna is placed in latitude 37 degrees 22 minutes south and longitude 13 degrees 17 minutes west. I think it probable we missed them by being too much to the northward. In this passage, the weather was generally so cloudy that I had few opportunities to make observations of any kind except for the noon latitudes. I could not determine when we crossed the line of no variation. The nearest two observations to it were, the first in 39 degrees 51 minutes south latitude and 26 degrees 11 minutes west longitude, where the variation of the compass was found to be 3 degrees 17 minutes east, and the other in latitude 35 degrees 30 minutes south and longitude 5 degrees 21 minutes west, where I observed the variation 11 degrees 35 minutes west. Between these we had no intermediate observations for the variation. Thursday, 22. At two in the afternoon we saw the Table Mountain of the Cape of Good Hope. As it is reckoned unsafe riding in Table Bay at this time of year, I steered for False Bay. The next evening we anchored in the outer part. Saturday, 24. And on the forenoon of the 24th got the ship secured in Simons Bay, which is in the inner part of False Bay. When moored, Noah's Ark bore south 35 degrees east three-quarters of a mile, and the hospital south 72 west. We found lying there, one outward-bound Dutch Indiaman, five other Dutch ships, and a French ship. After saluting the fort, which was returned by an equal number of guns, I went on shore and dispatches were sent away to Cape Town to acquaint the governor of our arrival. A Dutch ship at this time lying in Table Bay bound for Europe, I sent letters by her to the Admiralty. It is very unusual for ships to be in Table Bay so late in the year on account of the strong northwest winds. April is the time limited. I gave the necessary directions for getting our wants supplied. The ship required to be caulked in every part, for she was so leaky that we had been obliged to pump every hour in our passage from Cape Horn. This we immediately set about, as well as repairing our sails and rigging. The severe weather we had met with and the leakiness of the ship made it necessary to examine into the state of all the stores and provisions. Of the latter, a good deal was found damaged, particularly the bread. The timekeeper I took on shore to ascertain its rate, and other instruments to make the necessary astronomical observations. Fresh meat, with soft bread and plenty of vegetables, were issued daily to the ship's company the whole time we remained there. 
A few days after our arrival, I went over to Cape Town and waited on His Excellency M. Van der Graaf, the governor, who obligingly arranged matters so much to our advantage that we scarcely felt the inconvenient of being at a distance from the Cape Town, whence we received all our supplies. The Cape Town is considerably increased within the last eight years. Its respectability with regard to strength has kept pace with its other enlargements and rendered it very secure against any attempt which is not made with considerable force. Great attention is paid to military order and discipline, and monthly signals are established to communicate with their shipping as they arrive near the coast that they might not run unawares into the hands of an enemy. I found everything much dearer than when I was here in 1780. Sheep cost four Spanish dollars each and were so small that it answered better to purchase the mutton for the ship's daily use at four pence per pound. During our stay here I took care to procure seeds and plants that would be valuable at Otaheite and the different places we might touch at in our way thither. In this I was greatly assisted by Colonel Gordon, the commander of the troops. In company with this gentleman, the loss of the Grosnevoir East Indiamen was mentioned. On this subject, Colonel Gordon expressed great concern that from anything he had said, the hopes were still entertained to flatter the affectionate wishes of the surviving friends of those unfortunate people. He said that in his travels into the Caffrey country, he had met with a native who described to him that there was a white woman among his countrymen who had a child and that she frequently embraced the child and cried most violently this was all he the colonel could understand and being then on his return home with his health much impaired by fatigue the only thing he could do was to make a friend of the native by presence and promises of reward on the condition that he would take a letter to this woman and bring him back an answer accordingly he wrote letters in english french and dutch desiring that some sign or mark might be returned either by writing with a burnt stick or by any means that she should be able to devise to satisfy him that she was there and that on receiving such token from her every effort should be made to ensure her safety and escape but the caffrey though apparently delighted with the commission which he had undertaken never returned nor has the colonel ever heard anything more of him though he had been instructed in methods of conveying information through the hottentot country to this account that i might not again have occasion to introduce so melancholy a subject i shall add the little information i received respecting it when i revisited the cape in my return towards europe a reputable farmer by the name of hullhausen who lives at swellendam eight miles journey from the cape had information from some Caffrey Hottentots that a corral or village in their country there were white men and women. On this intelligence, Mr. Hallhausen asked permission of the governor to make an expedition with some of the farmers into the country, requiring a thousand rix dollars to bear his expenses. The governor referred him to Mr. Woke, the landrose of Graft Renat, a new colony in his way but from the place where mr hallhausen lives to the landros mr walk's residence is a month's journey which he did not choose to undertake it in uncertainty as mr walk may have disapproved of the enterprise it was in october last that mr hallhausen offered to go on this service he was one of the party who went along the sea-coast in search of these unfortunate people when a few of them first made their appearance at the cape i am however informed that the dutch farmers are fond of making expeditions into the country that they may have opportunities of taking away cattle and this i apprehend to be one of the chief reasons why undertakings of this kind are not encouraged on the thirteenth of june the dublin east indiamen arrived from england on board of which ship was a party of the seventy seventh regiment under the command of colonel balfour the result of my lunar observations gave for the longitude of simon's bay eighteen degrees forty eight minutes thirty four seconds east the latitude thirty four degrees eleven minutes thirty four seconds south 
The timekeeper likewise made the longitude 18 degrees 47 minutes east. The longitude, as established by former observations, is 18 degrees 33 minutes east. The variation of the compass on shore was 24 degrees 4 minutes west, but on board of the ship it was only 22 degrees 28 minutes west. The time of the high water was three quarters past two on the full and change, and it then flowed six feet. With respect to the Cape Promontory, it lies about three miles east of the meridian of Simonstown. All the tables of latitude and longitude place the Cape in 34 degrees 29 minutes south latitude, but from the many observations of it with good instruments, I make it to lie in 34 degrees 23 minutes south, which agrees with its situation as laid down in Major Reynolds' map. The part which I call the Cape is the southernmost point of the land between Table Bay and False Bay, but the Dutch consider the westernmost part of the coast to be the Cape. Sunday, 29. On the 29th, being ready for sea, I took the timekeeper and instruments on board. The error of the timekeeper was 3.33 seconds, too too slow for the mean time at Greenwich, and its rate of going 3 seconds per day, losing. The thermometer during our stay here was from 51 to 66 degrees. July, Tuesday, 1. We had been 38 days at this place, and my people had received all the advantages that could be derived from the refreshments of every kind that are here to be met with. We sailed at 4 o'clock this afternoon and saluted the platform with 13 guns as we ran out of the bay, which were returned. End of chapter 3「4 of a Voyage to the South Sea」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly Chapter 4 Passage towards Van Diemen's Land Make the Island of St. Paul Arrival in Adventure Bay Native Scene Sail from Van Diemen's Land 1788 July we lost sight of the land the day after leaving False Bay, and steered towards the east-southeast, having variable winds the first week with much thunder, lightning, and rain. The remainder of this passage the winds were mostly between the south and west blowing strong. There were almost every day great numbers of pintada, albatrosses, blue petrels, and other oceanic birds about us, but it was observed that if the wind came from the northward only for a few hours the birds generally left us and their presence again was the forerunner of a southerly wind sunday thirteen the variation of the compass was thirty degrees thirty four minutes west which was the greatest variation we found in this track our latitude thirty six degrees twenty eight minutes south and longitude 39 degrees 0 minutes east. Sunday, 20. The latitude at noon was 40 degrees 30 minutes south, and longitude 60 degrees 7 minutes east. We were at this time scudding under the foresail and close-reefed main topsail, the wind blowing strong from the west. An hour after noon the gale increased and blew with so much violence that the ship was almost driven forecastle under before we could get the sails cleared up. As soon as the sails were taken in we brought the ship to the wind, lowered the lower yards, and got the top gallant masts upon deck, which eased the ship very much. Monday, 21. We remained lying to till late the next morning when we bore away under a reefed foresail. In the afternoon the sea ran so high that it became very unsafe to stand on. We therefore brought to the wind again and remained lying to all night without accident, excepting that the man at the steerage was thrown over the wheel and much bruised. Tuesday, 22. Towards noon the violence of the storm abated and we again bore away under the reefed foresail. Our latitude at noon, 38 degrees, 49 minutes south, in the afternoon saw some whales. 
we continued running to the eastward in this parallel it being my intention to make the island st paul monday twenty eighth on monday the twenty eighth at six in the morning we saw the island bearing east by north twelve leagues distant between ten and eleven o'clock we ran along the south side at about a league distant from the shore there was a verdure that covered the higher parts of the land but i believe it was nothing more than moss which is commonly found on the tops of most rocky islands in these latitudes we saw several whales near the shore the extent of this island is five miles from the east to west and about two or three from north to south as we passed the east end we saw a remarkable high sugar-loaf rock abreast of which i have been informed is good anchoring in twenty-three fathoms the east point bearing southwest by south by true compass i had this information from the captain of a dutch packet in which i returned to europe he likewise said there was good fresh water on the island and a hot spring which boiled fish in as great perfection as on a fire by his account the latitude which he observed in the road is thirty eight degrees thirty nine minutes south and from the anchoring place the island of amsterdam was in sight to the northward we had fair weather all the forenoon but just at noon a squall came on which was unfavourable for our observation i had however two sets of double altitudes and a good altitude exactly at noon according to the timekeeper the results of these gave the latitude of the centre of st paul thirty eight degrees forty seven minutes south the longitude i make seventy seven degrees thirty nine minutes east the variation of the compass taking the mean of what was observed to be the day before we saw the island and the day after is nineteen degrees thirty minutes west at noon we were three leagues past the island we kept on towards the east southeast and for several days continued to see rock weed which is remarked to be generally the case after ships pass st paul's but to the westward of it very seldom any is seen august wednesday thirteen in latitude forty four degrees sixteen minutes south longitude one hundred twenty two degrees seven minutes east i observed the variation of the compass to be six degrees twenty three minutes west i had no opportunity to observe it again till in the latitude of forty three degrees fifty six minutes south longitude one hundred thirty three degrees sixteen minutes east when it was one degree thirty eight minutes east so that we had passed the line of no variation in seventeen eighty on board the resolution in latitude forty four degrees twenty three minutes south longitude one hundred thirty one degrees twenty eight minutes east the variation was observed six degrees zero minutes west which is a remarkable difference we had much bad weather with snow and hail and in our approach to van diemen's land nothing was seen to indicate the nearness of the coast except a seal when we were within the distance of twenty leagues tuesday nineteen at ten o'clock this afternoon we saw the rock named the mewstone that lies near the southwest cape of van diemen's land bearing northeast about six leagues the wind blew strong from the northwest as soon as we had passed the mewstone we were sheltered from a very heavy sea which ran from the westward at eight o'clock at night we were abreast of the south cape when the wind became light and variable saw several fires inland the mewstone is a high bold rock that lies five leagues to the southeast of the southwest cape and is the part that all ships bound this way should endeavor to make its latitude is forty three degrees forty six or forty seven minutes several islands lie to the northward between that and the main among which bearing north by west from the mewstone is a high rock much resembling it and north northeast from the mewstone on the mainland is a remarkable high mountain which in this direction appears notched like a coxcomb but as viewed from the eastward seems round wednesday twenty all the twentieth we were endeavouring to get into adventure bay but were prevented by variable winds the next morning at five o'clock we anchored in the outer part and at sunrise weighed again at noon we anchored well in the bay and moored the ship 
Penguin Island bearing north 57 and one half degree east, about two miles distance, Cape Frederick Henry, north 23 degrees east, and the mouth of the lagoon south 16 degrees east. In our passage from the Cape of Good Hope, the winds were mostly from the westward with very boisterous weather, but the one great advantage that this season of the year has over the summer months is in being free from fogs. I have already remarked that the approach of the strong southerly winds is announced by many kinds of birds of the albatross or petrel tribe, and the abatement of the gale, or a shift of wind to the northward, by their keeping away. The thermometer also very quickly shows when a change of these winds may be expected by varying sometimes six or seven degrees in its height. I have reason to believe that, after we passed the island St. Paul, there was a westerly current, the ship being every day to the westward of the reckoning, which, in the whole, from St. Paul to Van Diemen's Land, made a difference of four degrees between the longitude by the reckoning and the true longitude. Thursday, 21. The ship being moored, I went in a boat to look out for the most convenient place to wood and water at, which I found to be at the west end of the beach, for the surf, though considerable, was less there than at any other part of the bay. The water was in a gully, about sixty yards from the beach. It was perfectly good, but, being only a collection from the rains, the place is always dry in the summer months, for we found no water in it when I was there with Captain Cook in January 1777. We had very little success in hauling the seine. About twenty small flounders and flat-headed fish called foxes were all that were taken. I found no signs of the natives having lately frequented this bay, or of any European vessels having been here since the resolution and discovery in 1777. From some of the old trunks of trees then cut down I saw shoots about twenty-five feet high and fourteen inches in circumference. In the evening I returned on board. Friday, 22. The next morning, the 22nd, at daylight, a party was sent on shore for wooding and watering under the command of Mr. Christian and the gunner, and I directed that one man should be constantly employed in washing the people's clothes. There was so much surf that the wood was obliged to be rafted off in bundles to the boat. Mr. Nelson informed me that in his walks today he saw a tree in a very healthy state, which he measured and found to be thirty-three and a half feet in girt, its height was proportioned to its bulk. Saturday, 23. The surf was rather greater than yesterday, which very much interrupted our wooding and watering. Nelson today picked up a male opossum that had been recently killed, or had died, for we could not perceive any wound unless it had received a blow on the back where there was a bare spot about the size of a shilling. It measured fourteen inches from the ears to the beginning of the tail, which was exactly the same length. Most of the forest trees were at this time shedding their bark. There are three kinds, which are distinguished from each other by their leaves, though the wood appears to be the same. Many of them are full one hundred and fifty feet high, but most of those we cut down were decayed at the heart. There are, besides the forest trees, Several other kinds that are firm, good wood, and may be cut for most purposes except masts. Neither are the forest trees good for masks on account of their weight, and the difficulty of finding them thoroughly sound. Mr. Nelson asserted that they shed their bark every year, and that they increase more from the seed than by suckers. I found the tide made a difference of full two feet in the height of the water in the lake at the back of the beach. At high water it was very brackish, but at low tide it was perfectly fresh to the taste, and soap showed no sign of its being the least impregnated. We had better success in fishing on board the ship than by hauling the seine on shore, for with hooks and lines a number of fine rock cod were caught. I saw today several eagles, some beautiful blue-plumaged herons, and a great variety of parakeets. A few oyster-catchers and gulls were generally about the beach, and in the lake a few wild ducks. Monday, 25. Being in the want of plank, I directed a saw-pit to be dug, and employed some of the people to saw trees in the plank. 
The greater part of this week the winds were moderate, with unsettled weather. Friday, 29. On Friday it blew strong from the southwest with rain, thunder, and lightning. We continued to catch fish in sufficient quantities for everybody, and had better success with the seine. We were fortunate also in angling in the lake, where we caught some very fine tench. Some of the people felt a sickness from eating mussels that were gathered from the rocks, but I believe that it was occasioned by eating too many. We found some spider crabs, most of them not good, being of the female sort and out of season. The males were tolerably good, and were known by the smallness of their two foreclaws, or feeders. We saw the trunk of a dead tree on which had been cut A.D. 1773. The figures were very distinct, even the slips made with the knife were discernible. This must have been done by some of Captain Furneaux's people in March 1773, fifteen years before. The marks of the knife remaining so unaltered, I imagine the tree must have been dead when it was cut, but it serves to show the durability of the wood, for it was perfectly sound at this time. I shot two gannets. These birds were of the same size as those in England. Their color is a beautiful white, with the wings and tail tipped with jet black and the top and back of the head of a very fine yellow. Their feet were black with four claws, on each of which was a yellow line the whole length of the foot. The bill was four inches long, without nostrils, and very taper and sharp-pointed. The east side of the bay being not so thick of wood as the other parts, and the soil being good, I fixed on it, at Nelson's recommendation, as the most proper situation for planting some of the fruit trees which I had brought from the Cape of Good Hope. A circumstance much against anything succeeding here is that in the dry season the fires made by the natives are apt to communicate to the dried grass and underwood, and to spread in such a manner as to endanger everything that cannot bear a severe scorching. We, however, chose what we thought the safest situations, and planted three fine young apple trees, nine vines, six plantain trees, a number of orange and lemon seed, cherry stones, plum, peach, and apricot stones, pumpkins, also two sorts of Indian corn, and apple and pear kernels. The ground is well adapted for the trees, being of a rich, loamy nature. The spot where we made our plantation was clear of underwood, and we marked the trees that stood nearest to the different things which were planted. Nelson followed the circuit of the bay, planting in such places as appeared most eligible. I have great hopes that some of these articles will succeed. The particular situations I had described in my survey of this place, but I was unfortunately prevented from bringing it home. Near the watering place, likewise, we planted on a flat, which appeared a favorable situation, some onions, cabbage roots, and potatoes. For some days past a number of whales were seen in the bay. They were of the same kind as those we had generally met with before, having two blow-holes in the back of the head. September. Monday, 1. On the night of the 1st of September we observed for the first time signs of the natives being in the neighborhood. Fires were seen on the low land near Cape Frederick Henry, and at daylight we saw the natives with our glasses. As I expected they would come round to us, I remained all the forenoon near the wooding and watering parties, making observations, the morning being very favorable for that purpose. I was, however, disappointed in my conjecture, for the natives did not appear, and it was too great a surf for a boat to land on the part where we had seen them. Tuesday. 2. The natives not coming near us, I determined to go after them, and we set out in a boat towards Cape Frederick Henry, where we arrived about eleven o'clock. I found landing impracticable, and therefore came to a grapple, in hopes of their coming to us, for we had passed several fires. After waiting near an hour, I was surprised to see Nelson's assistant come out of the wood, he had wandered thus far in search of plants and told me that he had met with some of the natives. Soon after we heard their voices like the cackling of geese, and twenty persons came out of the wood, twelve of whom went round to some rocks where the boat could get nearer to the shore than we then were. Those who remained behind were women. 
We approached within twenty yards of them, but there was no possibility of landing, and I could only throw to the shore, tied up in paper, the presents I had intended for them. I showed the different articles as I tied them up, but they would not untie the paper till I made an appearance of leaving them. They then opened the parcels, and as they took the articles out, placed them on their heads. On seeing this I returned towards them, when they instantly put everything out of their hands, and would not appear to take notice of anything we had given them. After throwing a few more beads and nails on shore, I made signs for them to go to the ship, and they likewise made signs for me to land, but as this could not be effected, I left them, in hopes of a nearer interview at the watering place. When they first came in sight, they made a prodigious clattering in their speech, and held their arms over their heads. They spoke so quick I could not catch one single word they uttered. We recollected one man whom we had formerly seen among the party of the natives that came to us in 1777, and who is particularized in the account of Captain Cook's last voyage for his humor and deformity. Some of them had a small stick, two or three feet long, in their hands, but no other weapon. Their color, as Captain Cook remarks, is a dull black, their skin is scarified about their shoulders and breast. They were of a middle stature, or rather below it. One of them was distinguished by his body being covered with red ochre, but all the others were painted black with a kind of soot that was laid on so thick over their faces and shoulders that it is difficult to say what they were like. They ran very nimbly over the rocks, had a very quick sight, and caught the small beads and nails which I threw to them with great dexterity. They talked to us sitting on their heels with their knees close into their armpits and were perfectly naked. In my return towards the ship I landed at the point of the harbour near Penguin Island and from the hills saw the water on the other side of the low isthmus of Cape Frederick Henry which forms the bay of that name. It is very extensive and in or near the middle of the bay there is a low island. From this spot it has the appearance of being a very good and convenient harbour. The account which I had from Brown, the botanist assistant, was that in his search for plants he had met an old man, a young woman, and two or three children. The old man at first appeared alarmed, but became familiar on being presented with a knife. He nevertheless sent away the young woman who went very reluctantly. He saw some miserable wigwams in which were nothing but a few kangaroo skins spread on the ground and a basket made of rushes. Among the wood that we cut we found many scorpions and centipedes with numerous black ants that were an inch long. We saw no mosquitoes, though in the summer months they are very troublesome. What is called the New Zealand tea plant grew here in great abundance so that it was not only gathered and dried to use as tea, but made excellent brooms. It bears a small pointed leaf of a pleasant smell, and its seed is contained in a berry, about the size of a pea, notched in the five equal parts on the top. The soil on the west and south sides of the bay is black mold with a mixture of fine white sand, and is very rich. The trees are lofty and large, and the underwood grows so close together that in many places it is impassable. The east side of the bay is a rich, loamy soil, but near the tops of the hills is very much encumbered with stones and rocks, the underwood thinly placed and small. The trees on the south, southeast, and southwest sides of the hill grow to a larger size than those that are exposed to the opposite points, for the sides of the trees open or exposed to the north winds are naked with few branches, while the other sides are in a flourishing state. From this I do not infer that the equatorials are more hurtful than the polar winds, but that the trees by their situation were more sheltered from the one for from the other. Wednesday, 3. A calm prevented our sailing today. The friendly interview we had had with the natives made me expect that they would have paid us a visit, but we saw nothing more of them except fires in the night upon the low land to the northward. The result of the observations I made here reduced to Penguin Island. 
place it in forty three degrees twenty one minutes eleven seconds south latitude and in longitude one hundred forty seven degrees thirty three minutes twenty nine seconds east which scarcely differs from the observations made in seventeen seventy seven the variation of the compass observed on shore was eight degrees thirty eight minutes east and on board the ship eight degrees twenty nine minutes east it was high water at the change of the moon at forty nine minutes past six in the morning the rise was two feet eight inches southerly winds of any continuance make a considerable difference in the height of the tides thursday four this forenoon having a pleasant breeze at northwest we weighed anchor and sailed out of adventure bay at noon the southernmost part of maria's isles bore north fifty two degrees east about five leagues distant penguin island south eighty six degrees west and cape frederick henry north sixty five degrees west in this position we had soundings at fifty seven fathoms a sandy bottom latitude observed forty three degrees twenty two minutes south the southern part of Maria's Islands lay in latitude 43 degrees 16 minutes south. The country is not, in general, woody, but in some of the interior parts there appeared great abundance. Among these islands I have no doubt of there being many convenient places for shipping. On the east side, in latitude 42 degrees 42 minutes south, and longitude 148 degrees 24 minutes east in July 1789, Captain Cox of the Mercury found a convenient and secure harbor from all winds, which he named Oyster Bay. Here he found wood, water, and fish in great abundance. It has two outlets and lies north, a little easterly, distance thirty-four miles from the southeasternmost island, or point, seen from Adventure Bay. Adventure Bay is a convenient and safe place for any number of ships to take in wood and water during the summer months, but in the winter, when the southerly winds are strong, the surf on all parts of the shore makes the landing exceedingly troublesome. The Bay of Frederick Henry may perhaps be found preferable, as it appears to be equally easy of access. The soundings on Adventure Bay are very regular. Near the west shore are some patches of weed, but no shoal or danger, the depth on them being from five to nine fathoms. End of chapter four. Chapter five of A Voyage to the South Sea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly chapter five rocky islands discovered see the island maatea and arrive at otaheite ship crowded by the natives seventeen eighty eight september being clear of the land we steered towards the east southeast it being my intention to pass to the southward of new zealand as i expected in that route to meet with constant westerly winds in which however i was disappointed for they proved variable and frequently from the eastward blowing strong with thick misty weather the thermometer varied from forty one to forty six degrees sunday fourteen on the fourteenth at noon we were in forty nine degrees twenty four minutes south latitude and in one hundred sixty eight degrees three minutes east longitude which is on the same meridian with the south end of new zealand we altered our course steering to the northward of east and frequently saw rock weed which i supposed to have drifted from new zealand the sea now became rougher from our being exposed to a long swell which came from the northeast friday nineteen on the nineteenth at daylight we discovered a cluster of small rocky islands bearing east by north four leagues distant from us we had seen no birds or anything to indicate the nearness of land except patches of rock weed for which the vicinity of new zealand sufficiently accounted the wind being at northeast prevented our near approach to these isles so that we were not less than three leagues distant in passing to the southward of them the weather was too thick to see distinctly 
their extent was only three and a half miles from east to west and about half a league from north to south their number including the smaller ones was thirteen i could not observe any verdure on any of them there were white spots like patches of snow but as captain cook in describing the lands of new zealand near cape south says in many places there are patches like white marble it is probable that what we saw might be of the same kind as what he had observed the westernmost of these islands is the largest they are of sufficient height to be seen at a distance of seven leagues from a ship's deck when the easternmost bore north i tried for soundings being then ten miles distant from the nearest of them and found bottoms at seventy-five fathoms a fine white sand and again at noon having run six leagues more to the east southeast we had soundings at one hundred four fathoms a fine brimstone colored sand the latitude of these islands is forty seven degrees forty four minutes south their longitude one hundred seventy nine degrees seven minutes east which is about one hundred forty five leagues to the east of the traps near the south end of new zealand variation of the compass here seventeen degrees east while in sight of the islands we saw some penguins and a white kind of gull with a forked tail captain cook's trap in seventeen seventy three was near this spot but he did not see the islands he saw seals and penguins hereabouts but considered new zealand to be the nearest land i have named them after the ship the bounty isles sunday twenty one this day we saw a seal some rockweed and a great many albatrosses i tried for soundings but found no bottom at two hundred thirty fathoms depth our latitude forty seven degrees thirty two minutes south longitude one hundred eighty two degrees thirty six minutes east october thursday two we're in forty degrees twenty seven minutes south latitude and two hundred fourteen degrees four minutes east longitude it being calm and a number of small blubbers about the ship i took up some in a bucket but i saw no difference between them and the common blubbers in the west indies we frequently in the night time observed the sea to be covered with luminous spots caused by prodigious quantities of small blubbers that from the strings which extend from them emit a light like the spark of a candle while the body continues perfectly dark friday three the third in the morning we saw a seal captain cook has remarked seeing seaweed when nearly in the same place our latitude forty degrees twenty one minutes south longitude two hundred and fifteen degrees east variation of the compass seven degrees forty five minutes east being now well to the eastward of the society islands i steered more to the northward we continued to have the southern oceanic birds accompany us and a few whales the people caught albatrosses and fattened them in the same manner which they had done when off cape horn some of these measured near eight feet between the tips of the wings when spread thursday nine on thursday the ninth we had the misfortune to lose one of our seamen james valentine who died in the night of an asthmatic complaint this poor man had been one of the most robust people on board until our arrival at adventure bay where he first complained of some slight imposition for which he was bled and got better some time afterwards the arm in which he had been bled became painful and inflamed the inflammation increased with a hollow cough and extreme difficulty of breathing to his death monday thirteen the thirteenth in the afternoon we saw two land birds like what are called sand larks our latitude at this time was twenty eight degrees three minutes south and longitude two hundred twenty three degrees twenty six minutes east thursday fourteen the next morning we saw a tropic bird and some fish the winds were light and variable with calms from this time to the nineteenth when a breeze sprang up from the northeast which gradually came round to the eastward and proved to be the trade wind our latitude on the nineteenth at noon was twenty four degrees thirteen minutes south longitude two hundred twenty two degrees seventeen minutes east 
Variation of the compass, 5 degrees, 19 minutes east. Saturday, 25. On the 25th, at half-past seven in the morning, we saw the island Maatea, called Osnaburg by Captain Wallace, who first discovered it. At noon, it bore southwest by west, one-quarter west, six miles distance. Our latitude, 17 degrees, 50 minutes south, longitude, 212 degrees, 24 minutes east. Variation, five degrees east. As Captain Wallace and Captain Cook had both passed near the south side, I ran along the north side, which is remarkably steep. The island is high and round, and not more than three miles in its greatest extent. The south side, where the declivity from the hill is more gradual, is the chief place of residence of the natives, but the north side, from the very summit down to the sea, is so steep that it can afford no support to the inhabitants. We steered pretty close to the northward of the east end, where we saw but few habitations, a very neat house on a small eminence, delightfully situated in a grove of coconut trees, particularly attracted our notice. About twenty of the natives followed us along shore, waving and showing large pieces of cloth, but the surf on the shore was too high to think of having any communication with them. I observed a great number of coconut trees, but did not see one plantain tree. There were other trees, but of what kind we could not distinguish. Near the east end are two remarkable rocks, and a reef runs off to the eastward about half a league. The latitude of Maatea is 17 degrees 53 minutes south, and by our timekeeper, its longitude is 1 degree 24 minutes east from Point Venus. Variation of the compass 5 degrees 36 minutes east. We continued our course to the westward, and at six in the evening saw Otaheite bearing west three-quarters south, the island Maatea, then in sight, bearing east half-south, eight leagues distant. As there were great probability that we should remain a considerable time at Otaheite, it could not be expected that the intercourse of my people with the natives should be of a very reserved nature. I therefore ordered that every person should be examined by the surgeon, and had the satisfaction to learn from his report that they were all perfectly free from any venereal complaint. Sunday, 26. On the 26th, at four o'clock in the morning, having run twenty-five leagues from Maatea, we brought two till daylight, when we saw Point Venus bearing southwest by west, distant about four leagues. As we drew near, a great number of canoes came off to us. Their first inquiries were if we were Tayos, which signifies friends, and whether we had come from Britanni, their pronunciation of Britain, or from Lima. They were no sooner satisfied in this than that then they crowded on board in vast numbers, notwithstanding our endeavors to prevent it, as we were working the ship in, and in less than ten minutes the deck was so full that I could scarce find my own people. At nine in the forenoon we were obliged to anchor in the outer part of Mataavi Bay in thirteen fathoms, being prevented by light variable winds from placing the ship in a proper berth. In this station the west part of One Tree Hill bore south by east, half east, one mile distant. This passage of fifty-two days from Van Diemen's Land may be rated as moderate sailing. We passed New Zealand with the spring equinox, and the winds, though strong, were at no time violent. To the southward of forty degrees zero minutes south they were variable. Between the latitudes of forty degrees and thirty-three degrees south the winds kept in the northwest quarter, Afterwards, till we got into the trade, the winds were variable, mostly from the eastward, but light and inclinable to calms. The ship was three degrees twenty-two minutes in longitude to the eastward of the dead reckoning, which the timekeeper almost invariably proved to be owing to a current giving us more easting than the log. Our track was as distant from any course of former ships as I could conveniently make it, and though we made no new discoveries, except the small cluster of islands near New Zealand, yet in the other parts of the track, as been noticed, we met with signs of being in the neighborhood of land. It may not be unworthy of remark that the whole distance which the ship had run by the log, 
in direct and contrary courses, from leaving England to our anchoring at Otaheite, was 27,086 miles, which, on an average, is at a rate of 108 miles each 24 hours. End of chapter 5「Six of a Voyage to the South Sea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter Six. Account of an English ship lately sailed from Otaheite. Death of Omai. Captain Cook's picture sent on board. Oto'o visits the ship. His visit returned. Natives well disposed towards us. Account of the cattle left by Captain Cook. Breadfruit plants promised. Visit to the Aereae Rahie. Presents made to the Areoys. 1788, October, Sunday, 26. The ship being anchored, our number of visitors continued to increase, but as yet we saw no person that we could recollect to have been of much consequence. Some inferior chiefs made me presents of a few hogs, and I made them presents in return. We were supplied with coconuts in great abundance, but breadfruit was scarce. Many inquiries were made after Captain Cook, Sir Joseph Banks, and many of their former friends. They said a ship had been here from which they had learned that Captain Cook was dead, but the circumstances of his death they did not appear to be acquainted with, and I had given particular directions to my officers and ship company that they should not be mentioned. The ship spoke of, they informed me, stayed at Otaheite one month, and had been gone four months, by some of their accounts, according to others only three months. The captain they called Tona. I understood likewise from them that Lieutenant Watts was in the ship, who, having been here in the resolution with Captain Cook, was well known to them. One of my first inquiries, as will naturally be imagined, was after our friend Omai, and it was a sensible mortification and disappointment to me to hear that not only Omai, but both the New Zealand boys who had been left with him were dead. Everyone agreed in their information that they died a natural death. Oto'o, who was the chief of Mataavi, when Captain Cook was here the last time, was absent at another part of the island. They told me messengers were sent to inform him of our arrival, and that he was expected to return soon. There appeared among the natives in general great good will towards us, and they seemed to be much rejoiced at our arrival. This whole day we experienced no instance of dishonesty. We were so much crowded that I could not undertake to remove to a more proper station without danger of disobliging our visitors by desiring them to leave the ship. This business was therefore deferred till the next morning. Monday, 27. Early in the morning, before the natives began to flock off to us, we weighed anchor to work farther into the bay and moored at about a quarter of a mile distance from the shore. Point Venus bearing north, 16 degrees east, the west part of One Tree Hill, southwest by south, and the point of the reef north, 37 degrees west, the ship lying in seven fathoms water. Several chiefs now came on board and expressed great pleasure at seeing me. Among these were Oto, the father of Oto'o, and Orae Paya, his brother, also another chief of Mataavi called Poeeno, and to these men I made presents. Two messengers likewise arrived from Oto'o to acquaint me of his being on the way to the ship, each of whom brought me as a present from Oto'o a small pig and a young plantain tree as a token of friendship. The ship was now plentifully supplied with provisions, every person having as much as he could consume. As soon as the ship was secured, I went on shore with the chief Poeeno, and accompanied by a multitude of the natives. He conducted me to the place where we had fixed our tents in 1777, and desired that I would now appropriate the spot to the same use. 
We then went across the beach and through a walk delightfully shaded with breadfruit trees to his own house. Here we found two women at work staining a piece of cloth red. These I found were his wife and her sister. They desired me to sit down on a mat which was spread for the purpose, and with great kindness offered me refreshments. I received the congratulation of several strangers who came to us and behaved with great decorum and attention. The people, however, thronged about the house in such numbers that I was much incommoded by the heat, which being observed they immediately drew back. Among the crowd I saw a man who had lost his arm just above the elbow. The stump was well covered, and the cure seemed as perfect as could be expected from the greatest professional skill. I made inquiries about the cattle that had been left here by Captain Cook, but the accounts I received were very unfavorable, and so various that for the present I shall forbear speaking of them. After staying about an hour, I got up to take leave, when the women, in a very obliging manner, came to me with a mat and a piece of their finest cloth, which they put on me after the Otaheite fashion. When I was thus dressed, they each of them took one of my hands, and accompanied me to the waterside, and at parting promised that they would soon return my visit. In this walk I had the satisfaction to see that the island had received some benefit from our previous visits. Two shaddocks were brought to me, a fruit which they had not, until we introduced it. And among the articles which they brought off to the ship and offered for sale were capsicums, pumpkins, and two young goats. On my return to the ship, I found that a small disturbance had been occasioned by one of the natives making an attempt to steal a tin pot, which, on being known to Oreepaya, he flew into a violent rage, and it was with some difficulty that the thief escaped with his life. He drove all his countrymen out of the ship, and when he saw me, he desired, if at any time I found a thief, that I would order him to be tied up and punished with a severe flogging. This forenoon a man came on board with Captain Cook's picture, which had been drawn by Mr. Weber in 1777 and left with Oto'o. It was brought to me to be repaired. The frame was broken, but the picture in no way damaged except a little in the background. They called it To'ote, which has always been their manner of pronouncing Captain Cook's name, a a re -e no Otahiti, chief of Otahiti. They said Tooote had desired Oto'o, whenever any English ship came, to show the picture, and it would be acknowledged as a token of friendship. The youngest brother of Oto'o, named Waido'a, visited me this afternoon. He appeared stupefied with drinking ava. At sunset, all our male visitors left the ship. Tuesday, 28. The next morning, early, I received a message from Oto'o to inform me of his arrival and requesting that I would send a boat for him, which I immediately did with an officer, Mr. Christian, to conduct him on board. He came with numerous attendants and expressed much satisfaction at our meeting. After introducing me to his wife, we joined noses, the customary manner of saluting, and to perpetuate our friendship he desired that we should exchange names i was surprised to find that instead of oto'o the name by which he formerly went he was now called tina the name of oto'o with the title of eere rahie i was informed had devolved to his eldest son who was yet a minor as is the custom of the country the name of tia's wife was idea with her was a woman dressed with a large quantity of cloth in the form of a hoop, which was taken off and presented to me with a large hog and some breadfruit. I then took my visitors into the cabin, and after a short time produced my presence in return. The present I made to Tina, by which name I shall hereafter call him, consisted of hatches, small adzes, files, gimlets, saws, looking-glasses, red feathers, and two shirts. To Idea I gave earrings, necklaces, and beads, but she expressed a desire also for iron, and therefore I made the same assortment for her as I had for the husband. 
Much conversation took place among them on the value of the different articles, and they appeared extremely satisfied, so that they determined to spend the day with me and requested I would show them all over the ship, and particularly the cabin where I slept. This, though I was not fond of doing, I indulged them in, and the consequent was, as I had apprehended, that they took a fancy to so many things that they had got from me nearly as much more as I had before given them. Afterwards Tina desired me to fire some of the great guns. This I likewise complied with, and, as the shot fell into the sea at a great distance, all the natives expressed their surprise by loud shouts and acclamations. I had a large company at dinner, for besides Tina and his wife there was Otoa, the father of Tina, Ore'e Paya, and Waido'a, two of his brothers, Po'e'eno, and several other chiefs. Tina is a very large man, much above the common stature, being not less than six feet four inches in height, and proportionably stout, his age about thirty-five. His wife, Idea, I judged to be about twenty-four years of age, she is likewise much above the common size of the women at Otiidi, and had a very animated and intelligent countenance. Waido'a, the younger brother of Tina, was highly spoken of as a warrior, but had the character of being the greatest drunkard in the country, and indeed to judge from the withered appearance of his skin he must have used the pernicious drink called Ava to great excess. Tina was fed by one of his attendants, who sat by him for that purpose, this being a particular custom among some of the superior chiefs, and I must do him the justice to say that he kept his attendant constantly employed. There was indeed little reason to complain of want of appetite in any of my guests. As the women are not allowed to eat in the presence of the men, Idea dined with some of her companions about an hour afterwards in private, except that her husband tina favoured them with his company and seemed to have entirely forgotten that he had already dined provisions were brought off to the ship in the greatest plenty and to prevent as much as possible anything which might occasion disputes i desired mr peckover the gunner to undertake the management of our traffic with the natives some of the hogs brought to-day weighed two hundred pounds and we purchased several for salting Goats were likewise bought off for sale, and I bought a she-goat and a kid for less than would have purchased a small hog. Our friends here expressed much disappointment that there was no portrait painter on board, Tina in particular, who wished to have had pictures of his father and family. An intimacy between the natives and our people was already so general that there was scarce a man in the ship who had not his tayo or friend. Tina continued with me the whole afternoon, in the course of which he ate four times of roast pork besides his dinner. When he left the ship he requested that I would keep for him all the presents I had given to him as he had not at Mataave a place sufficiently safe to secure them from being stolen. I therefore showed him a locker in my cabin for his use and gave him a key to it. This is perhaps not so much a proof of his want of power as to the estimation in which they hold European commodities, and which makes more than the common means of security requisite to prevent theft. I had sent Nelson and his assistant to look for plants, and it was no small pleasure for me to find by their report that according to the appearance the object of my mission would probably be accomplished with ease. I had given directions to every one on board not to make known to the islanders the purpose of our coming, lest it might enhance the value of the breadfruit plants or occasion other difficulties. Perhaps so much caution was not necessary, but at all events I wished to preserve to myself the time and manner of communication. Nelson met with two fine shaddock trees which he had planted in 1777. They were full of fruit, but not ripe. Wednesday, 29. In the morning I returned Tina's visit, for I found he expected it. He was in a small shed about a quarter of a mile to the eastward of Mata'avi Point with his wife and three children, not their own, but who they said were relations. In my walk I had picked up a numerous attendance, for everyone I met followed me. 
so that I had collected such a crowd that the heat was scarcely bearable, every one endeavouring to get a look to satisfy their curiosity. They, however, carefully avoided pressing against me, and welcomed me with cheerful countenances and great good nature. I made Tina understand that my visit was particularly to him, and gave him a second present, equal to the first, which he received with great pleasure, and to the people of consequence there were about him I also presented some article or other. There were great numbers of children, and, as I took notice of the little ones that were in arms and gave them beads, both small and great, but with much drollery and good humor, endeavored to benefit by the occasion. Boys of eight or ten years old were caught up in arms and brought to me, which created much laughter, so that in a short time I got rid of all I had brought on shore. In my return I called on Poeeno and an elderly chief, a relation of his, called Moana, the principal man of this district and with whom I judged it to be in my interest to be on good terms. I gave them several valuable articles, and as the situation here was eligible for a garden, I planted melon, cucumbers, and salad seeds. I told them many other things should be sown for their use, and they appeared much pleased as they understood I intended to plant such things as would grow to be trees and produce fruit. I saw large batches of tobacco growing without culture and many pumpkin vines. The breadfruit trees and coconut trees at this time were full of fruit. I went on board to dinner, and Moana accompanied me. In the afternoon I returned to Poe'e Nose with some additional seeds to improve the little garden I had begun to make in the forenoon. While I was giving directions I received a message from Tina inviting me to come to him at his brother Ore'e Paya's house, which was near the beach. At this time I found a great number of people collected who, on my appearance, immediately made way for me to sit down by Tina. The crowd being ordered to draw back, a piece of cloth about two yards wide and forty-one yards in length was spread on the ground, and another piece of cloth was brought by Ore'e Paya, which he put over my shoulders and round my waist in the manner the chiefs are clothed. Two large hogs, weighing each above two hundred pounds, and a quantity of baked breadfruit and coconuts were then laid before me as a present, and I was desired to walk from one end of the cloth spread on the ground to the other, in the course of which Tayo and Ihoa were repeated with loud acclamations. Footnote. Taya and Ihoa are words of the same signification, that is, friend. End footnote. This ceremony being ended, Tina desired I would send the things on board, which completely loaded the boat. We therefore waited till she came back, and then I took them on board with me, for I knew they expected some return. The present which I made on this occasion was equal to any that I had made before, but I discovered that Tina was not the sole proprietor of what she had given to me for the present I gave him was divided among those who— I guessed, had contributed to support his dignity, among whom were Moana, Poeena, and Ore'epaya. Tina, however, kept the greatest part of what I had given, and everyone seemed satisfied with the proportion he allotted them. The Otahidi breed of hogs seems to be supplanted by the European. Originally they were of the China sort, short and very thick-necked but the superior size of the european have made them encourage our breed thursday thirty at break of day tina and his wife came again to the ship and as their attendants were numerous i provided a breakfast for them of broiled and roasted pork which they preferred to tea our arrival being known all over the island we had this day a great number of strangers on board who came from the most remote parts and in the forenoon some hooks and thimbles were cut out from the blocks this induced me to order all the natives out of the ship except the chiefs and their attendants in executing these orders a daring fellow attacked the sentinel but escaped among the crowd every one knew the consequences of offending the sentinel and were exceedingly alarmed at the appearance of anger i thought necessary to assume among those who visited us to-day were two chiefs of great consequence 
Mare Mare and his son Poohaita Ea Otee A Ereas of the districts of Ataea and Ata Hoo Roo. Otee was fed at dinner in the same manner as Tina. It was evident that the attention which I showed to these chiefs seemed to carry uneasiness to Tina. At sunset my visitors took leave and were carried on shore by one of the ship's boats, which has always been regarded as a mark of distinction, and on that account preferred by them to going in their own canoes. At their request a race was rowed between our five-oared cutter and one of their double canoes with four paddles. Great exertions were used on both sides, but the cutter first reached the shore. In their return to the ship, Oreeyapa stopped them till a large piece of cloth that he had sent for was brought, which he tied to the boat hook and desired should be carried off as a trophy of their victory. Friday, 31. The next morning at sunrise, Moana came on board with a message from Tina to acquaint me that he was Matau afraid to see me till he had recovered some things that had been stolen from the ship and which he had sent after i knew there was something wrong as no canoes came off to us and on looking about we found the buoy of the best bower anchor had been taken away i imagine for the sake of some iron hoops that were on it that this might not create any coolness i sent a boat to tina to invite him and his friends to come on board which they immediately did and were no longer under any apprehensions i had made an appointment with oreepaya for him to go with me to opare this morning but the accident just mentioned caused him to break his engagement he having gone i was informed in search of what had been stolen opare is the district next to the westward of matavia one of my reasons for going to Opare was to see if Nelson would be able to procure plants there, but I gave the credit of my visit to young Oto'o, the son of Tina, who was Aere'e Rahie, and lived with the rest of Tina's children at Opare. I prepared a magnificent present for this youth, who was represented to me as the person of greatest consequence, or rather the highest rank, in the island. At noon I left the ship, accompanied by Tina, his wife Idea, and Poeeno. Moana was to have been of the party, but he insisted on remaining in the ship to prevent his countrymen from attempting to steal anything. After half an hour sailing, we arrived at Opare. During this time Tina gave me a more circumstantial account of the cattle and sheep that had been left with him, he related that after five years from the time of captain cook's departure counting sixty-three moons the people of the island aeveo joined with those of ataaroo a district of otaheite and made a descent on opare that after some resistance by which many men were killed tina and his people fled to the mountains leaving all their property to the mercy of the victorious party who destroyed almost everything which they found not convenient to take away with them some of the cattle were killed and eaten but the greater part were taken to aemeo the cows he said had produced eight calves and the ewes ten young ones the ducks among which they classed the geese had greatly increased but the turkeys and peacocks whatever was the cause had not bred it seemed to give tina great pleasure to observe how much i was concerned for the destruction of so many useful animals but the cause of his satisfaction i found did not proceed from any expectation that i should replace them but from the belief that i would take vengeance on the people who had deprived him of them for with respect to the loss of the cattle he appeared so unconcerned and indifferent that i was very angry with him there is however sufficient excuse for his resentment against the people of eimeo for the large extensive houses which we had seen in this part of otaheite in the year seventeen seventy seven were all destroyed and at present they had no other habitations than light sheds which might be taken by the four corners and removed by four men and of the many large canoes which they then had not more than three remained 
Tina, understanding from my conversation that I intended visiting some of the other islands in this neighborhood, very earnestly desired I would not think of leaving Mataavi. Here, said he, you shall be supplied plentifully with everything you want. All here are your friends and friends of King George. If you go to the other islands, you will have everything stolen from you. I replied that, on account of their good will, and a desire to serve him and his country, King George had sent out these valuable presents to him, and, will you not, Tina, send something to King George in return? Yes, he said, I will send him anything I have, and then began to enumerate the different articles in his power, among which he mentioned the breadfruit. This was the exact point to which I wished to bring the conversation, and, seizing an opportunity which had every appearance of being undesigned and accidental, I told him the breadfruit trees were what King George would like, upon which he promised me a great many should be put on board, and seemed much delighted to find it so easily in his power to send anything that would be well received by King George on landing an opare an immense crowd of natives as usual immediately thronged about us i inquired for oreepaya whom i expected to have met me here but he was not yet returned from his search after the thieves we therefore went under a shed of his to wait for him and in about a quarter of an hour he joined us bringing with him an iron scraper and one of the hoops of the buoy I thanked him for the trouble which he had taken, and assured him that I was perfectly satisfied, for he still seemed apprehensive of my displeasure. We took leave for a short time of Oreepaya, and I proceeded with Tina to make my visit to the young Oto'o, the Eire'e Rahie. When we had walked about five minutes, Tina stopped and informed me that no person could be permitted to see his son, who was covered above the shoulders. He then took off his upper garments and requested I would do the same. I replied that I had no objection to go as I would to my own king, who is the greatest in all the world, and, pulling off my hat, he threw a piece of cloth round my shoulders, and we went on. About a quarter of a mile farther towards the hills, through a delightful shade of breadfruit trees, we stopped at the side of a small serpentine river. Here I was in view of a house on the other side at about fifty yards' distance. From this house the young king was brought out on a man's shoulder, clothed in a piece of fine white cloth, and I was desired by Tina to salute him by the name of To'o'o Eire'e Rahie. The present which I had prepared was divided into three parts, and two other children made their appearance in the same manner. The first present I gave to a messenger who attended for that purpose, and I was instructed by Tina to say it was for the Eire'e Rahie, that I was his friend, that I hated thieves, and that I came from Britannia. The second present was sent in the same manner with a similar message to one of the other children, and likewise the third. As I could not see the Eire'e Rahie distinctly, I desired to be permitted to go over the river to him, but this, it seems, could not be complied with. Therefore, after seeing the presents delivered, I returned with Tina towards Oreepaya's house. I was informed that Tina had four children by his wife, Aidea, Oto'o, or To'o, the Eire'e Rahie, appeared to be about six years old, the second is a girl named Te Re Na O Ro A. The third a boy Te Re A Te Ta Pa Pa U Ra Na. And the fourth an infant girl who I did not see, named Ta Ha Mai Do O O A. When we came to the place where we had first stopped, Pina took the cloth from my shoulders and desired me to put my hat on. I expressed a desire to see more of the place, and he took me back by a different way. On passing the trunk of a tree, rudely carved, I was desired again to pull my hat off, and all uncovered their shoulders. This I discovered to be nothing more than the boundary of the king's land, on which whoever set their feet uncovered themselves out of respect. We stopped at a house belonging to Tina, where I was treated with a concert of one drum, and three flutes with singing by four men. I made some presents to the performers, and we removed to Oreepaya's house. 
where after paying my compliments to him, which I found was expected, Tina made me a present of a large hog and some coconuts. He then introduced an uncle of him called Mo Ro Roa, a very old man, much tattooed and almost blind. To this chief I made a present, and soon after I embarked with Tina, Ore'e Paya, their wives, and Po Eeno. A vast number of people were collected on the beach to see us depart, and as soon as the boat had put off, Tina desired me to fire my pocket pistol, the po o o po o e e te e te as he called it. The report seemed to electrify the whole crowd, but finding no harm done, they gave great shouts of approbation. Nelson, who accompanied me in this expedition, had but little opportunity to search after plants, the natives having crowded so much about him he saw enough however to assure him that they were to be procured here as plentiful as at mataave in our passage to the ship which we rowed in one hour nothing but brittini was inquired after and a number of ships and guns when i told them we had ships of one hundred guns they could not believe it till i drew one on paper they then asked me if it was not as big as tara which is a high projecting headland halfway between Mataavi and Opare, called by us One Tree Hill. Tina much wished that one of these large ships could be sent to Otaheite, and that myself would come in her, and bring him a number of things that he wanted, among which he particularly desired beds and high-backed elbow chairs might not be forgotten, a request perfectly according with the indolent character of Tina november saturday one as we had occasion to fix a ten on point venus this morning we moved the ship nearer to it and moored again in six fathoms the point bearing north northeast tina and several other chiefs dined on board with me after dinner i went on shore with tina and made a visit to his father otoa i likewise went to the garden which i had made near po Eeno's house and found everything had been taken care of after this i was invited to an entertainment called heiva which tina had ordered and which consisted of singing and dancing by three men and a young girl when this performance was finished i returned to the ship sunday two at daylight i sent mr christian with a party to erect our tent and soon after followed myself with tina moana and poeeno with their consent i fixed a boundary within which the natives were not to enter without leave and the chiefs cautioned them against it the principal use of the tents on shore was for a lodgment for the plants and i had now instead of appearing to receive a favour brought the chiefs to believe that i was doing them a kindness in carrying the plants as a present from them to the aere rahie no britini the party at the tent consisted of nine persons including nelson and his assistant tina dined with me on board and was to-day my only visitor nevertheless the ceremony of being fed he so scrupulously observed that even after all the attendants were sent away and we were left by ourselves i was obliged to lift the wine to his mouth the wives of the Aares are sometimes subject to this restriction after the birth of a child, but are released after a certain time on performing a ceremony called O Amo. After dinner, Tina invited me to accompany him with a present of provisions to a party of the Areos, a society described in the accounts of the former voyages. In this ceremony, he made me the principal person. Our way to the place where the offering was to be made was by the side of a river along the banks of which I had always walked before this time, but on the present occasion a canoe was provided for me and dragged by eight men. On arriving at the landing place I saw a large quantity of breadfruit with some hogs ready dressed and a quantity of cloth. At about forty yards distance sat a man who, I was informed, was a principal areo a lane being made by the crowd he was addressed by one of tina's people standing on the canoe in a speech consisting of short sentences which lasted about a quarter of an hour during this a piece of cloth was produced one end of which i was desired to hold 
and five men, one with a suckling pig and the others having each a basket of breadfruit, prepared to follow me. In this order we advanced to the Areo and laid the whole down before him. I then spoke several sentences dictated to me by Tina, the meaning of which I did not understand, and, my pronunciation not being very exact, caused a great deal of mirth. This speech being finished, I was shown another Areo, who had come from Ulaetea, and to him likewise I was required to deliver an oration. Tina understanding from me that I had children in my own country, he desired me to make one more offering on their account. There still remained three baskets of breadfruit, a small pig, and another piece of cloth. With these assisted as before, I made the offering in favor of my children to the man whom I had first addressed. He made no reply to all my fine speeches, but sat with great gravity and received everything as a matter of right and not of courtesy all that i could make out of this strange ceremony was that the areos are highly respected and that the society is chiefly composed of men distinguished by their valour or some other merit and that great trust and confidence is reposed in them but i could not comprehend what this had to do with my children or why it should be imagined that an offering made on their account to a society of men who destroyed all their children should be propitious. I learned from Tina, in talking about his children, that his first-born child was killed as soon as it came into the world, he then being an areo, but before his second child was born he quitted the society. The areos are allowed great latitude in their armors except in times of danger. Then, as they were almost all fighting men, ta ta to ta, they are restricted that they might not weaken or enervate themselves. These ceremonies being ended, I returned to the ship. Such of the natives as I had conversed with about the institution of so extraordinary a society as the areo asserted that it was necessary to prevent an overpopulation. Woro, woro, no te, my die de, woro, woro, te, ta, ta. We have too many children and too many men, was their constant excuse. Yet it does not appear that they are apprehensive of too great an increase of the lower class of people, none of them being ever admitted into the array of society. The most remarkable instance related to me of the barbarity of this institution was of Tepao, the area of the district of Tetaha, and his wife Te Te Ho De A, who is sister to Ato and considered a person of the first consequence. I was told that they have had eight children, every one of which was destroyed as soon as born. That any human being were ever so devoid of natural affection as not to wish to preserve alive one of so many children is not credible. It is more reasonable to conclude that the death of these infants was not an act of choice in the parents, but they were sacrificed in compliance with some barbarous superstition with which we are unacquainted. What strengthens this conjecture is that they have adopted a nephew as their heir, of whom they are excessively fond. In countries so limited as the islands in the South Seas, the natives of which, before they were discovered by European navigators, probably had not an idea of the existence of other lands, it is not unnatural that an increase in population should occasion apprehensions of universal distress. Orders of celibacy, which have proved so prejudicial in other countries, might perhaps in this have been beneficial so far at least as to have answered their purpose by means not criminal the number of inhabitants of otaheite have been estimated at above one hundred thousand the island however is not cultivated to the greatest advantage yet were they continually to improve in husbandry their improvement could not for a length of time keep pace with an unlimited population an idea here presents itself which however fanciful it may appear at first sight seems to merit some attention while we see among these islands so great a waste of the human species that numbers are born only to die 
and at the same time a large continent so near to them as new holland in which there is so great a waste of land uncultivated and almost destitute of inhabitants it naturally occurs how greatly the two countries might be made to benefit each other and gives occasion to regret that the islanders are not instructed in the means of emigrating to new holland which seems as if designed by nature to serve as an asylum for the superflux of inhabitants in the islands such a plan of immigration if rendered practicable to them might not only be the means of abolishing the horrid custom of destroying children as it would remove the plea of necessity but might lead to other important purposes a great continent would be converted from a desert to a populous country a number of our fellow creatures would be saved the inhabitants of the islands would become more civilized and it is not improbable but that our colonies in new holland would derive so much benefit as to more than repay any trouble of expense that might be incurred in endeavouring to promote so humane a plan the latter however is a remote consideration for the intertropical parts of new holland are those most suited to the habits and manner of living of the islanders and likewise the soil and climate are the best adapted to their modes of agriculture man placed by his creator in the warm climates perhaps would never emigrate into the colder unless under the tyrannous influence of necessity and ages might elapse before the new inhabitants would spread to our settlers though they are but barely within the limits of frost that great cause of nine-tenths of the necessities of europeans nevertheless besides forwarding the purposes of humanity and general convenience by bringing a people without land to a land without people the benefit of a mutual intercourse with a neighboring and friendly colony would in itself be no inconsiderable advantage among people so free from ostentation as the otaheitans and whose manners are so simple and natural the strictness with which the punctilios of rank are observed is surprising i know not if any action however meritorious, can elevate a man above the class in which he was born unless he was to acquire sufficient power to confirm dignity on himself if any woman of the inferior classes has a child by an arae it is not suffered to live perhaps the offspring of tepehaho and tetehodea were destined to satisfy some cruel adjustment of rank and precedency end of chapter six Chapter Seven of A Voyage to the South Sea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter Seven. A Theft Committed. Deception of the Painted Head. Conversation with a Priest. A Wrestling Match. Reports of the Natives Concerning Other Islands. Some Account of Omai. Seventeen Eighty-Eight. November monday three the trade for provisions i directed to be carried on at the tent by mr peckover the gunner moana likewise resided there as a guard over his countrymen but though it appeared to be the wish of all the chiefs that we should remain unmolested it was not possible entirely to prevent them from pilfering my table at dinner was generally crowded tina oreepa poeeno and moana were my regular guests and i was seldom without some chiefs from other districts almost every individual of any consequence has several names which makes it frequently perplexing when the same person is spoken of to know who is meant every chief has perhaps a dozen or more names in the course of thirty years so that the person who has been spoken of by one visitor will not perhaps be known to another unless other circumstances lead to a discovery the father of tina at this time called oto was known in seventeen sixty nine by the name of waapai i showed tina the preparations i was making to take on board the breadfruit plants which pleased him exceedingly but he did not forget to remind me that when the next ship came out he hoped king george would send him large axes files saws 
cloth of all kinds, hats, chairs, and bedsteads, with arms, ammunition, and, in short, everything he could think of mentioning. This afternoon the gudgeon of the rudder belonging to the large cutter was drawn out and stolen without being perceived by the man that was stationed to take care of her. Several petty thefts having been committed by the natives, mostly owing to the negligence of our own people, and, as these kind of accidents generally created alarm and had a tendency to interrupt the good terms on which we were with the chiefs, I thought it would have a good effect to punish the boat-keeper in their presence, many of them happening to be then on board, and accordingly I ordered him a dozen lashes. Tina, with several of the chiefs, attended to the punishment and interceded very earnestly to get it mitigated. The women showed great sympathy and that degree of feeling which characterizes the amiable part of their sex. The natives brought off today two different kinds of roots that grow like yams. One they call a te, which is a sweet root, common also to the friendly islands, and may be eaten as a sweet meat. The other they call opei, a root like the taya or eddy in the West Indies. A fruit called aya, which is the jambo of Bativa, was likewise brought off to us. They are as large as middle-sized apples, very juicy and refreshing, and may be eaten in large quantities. Also some aveas, which are the real otiti apple, but they were not yet in season. These are a delicious, high-flavored fruit, and before they are ripe, answer the culinary purposes of our apples. Tuesday, 4. A chief called Tu'a'a, who came from the island Uli'e'te'a, was introduced to me today by Tina as one of his particular friends. I was told that he was a priest and a person of great knowledge. I desired Tina to take what he thought proper as a present for him, and I must do Tina the justice to say he was more sparing than I should have been. I likewise received a visit today from O.A.D. Dade, a man who had been at sea with Captain Cook in 1773 and 1774, as related in the account of that voyage. He still retained some of the English words which he had learnt in that expedition. Wednesday, 5. The weather variable with lightning and frequent showers of rain. Wind east-northeast. This was the first day of our beginning to take up plants. We had much pleasure in collecting them, for the natives offered their assistance and perfectly understood the method of taking them up and pruning them. The crowd of natives was not so great as hitherto it had been. The curiosity of strangers was satisfied, and, as the weather began to be unsettled and rainy, they had almost all returned to their homes so that only the people of Mataave and Opare remained with us, except a few chiefs from other islands. Our supplies, however, were abundant, and when I considered as no small addition to our comforts, we ceased to be incommoded when on shore by the natives following us, and could take our walks almost unnoticed. In any house that we wished to enter, we always experienced a kind reception and without officiousness. The Otahitians have the most perfect easiness of manners, especially free from forwardness and formality. When they offer refreshments, if they are not accepted, they do not think of offering them the second time, for they have not the least idea of that ceremonious kind of refusal which expects a second invitation. In like manner at taking leave, we were never troubled with solicitations to prolong our visit, but went without ceremony except making use of a farewell expression at parting. Another advantage, seldom found in warm countries, was, in this part of Otaheite being free from mosquitoes, though at particular times of the year the inhabitants are pestered with great numbers of flies. Moana continued our constant friend at the tent, and with Tina and all his friends dined with me every day. The ship's barber had brought with him from London a painted head such as the hairdressers have in their shops to show the different fashions of dressing hair, and it being made with regular features and well colored, I desired him to dress it, which he did with much neatness, and with a stick and a quantity of cloth he formed a body. It was then reported to the natives that we had an English woman on board, and the quarter-deck was cleared of the crowd that she might make her appearance. 
Being handed up the ladder and carried to the after part of the deck, there was a general shout of Hua Heini no Britaini Maitai. Hua Heini signifies woman and Maitai good. Many of them thought it was living and asked if it was my wife. One old woman ran with presents of cloth and breadfruit and laid them at her feet. At last they found out the cheat, but continued all delighted with it, except the old lady who felt herself mortified and took back her presents, for which she was laughed at exceedingly. Tina and all the chiefs enjoyed the joke and after making many inquiries about the british women they strictly enjoined me when i came again to bring a ship full of them some very fine sugar-cane was brought to me each of the pieces was six inches round i had before told tina that our sugar was made of it and he was very desirous to discover the means for they were so fond of our loaf sugar that a present to any chief would have been incomplete without a piece of it another article in great estimation and likewise expected to make part of a present was scissors which they made use of to keep their beards in order by this time nelson had with assistance from the ship completed a large garden near the tents in which were sown seeds of different kinds that we had collected at the cape of good hope i likewise distributed fruit stones and almonds for planting among the chiefs who i hope will endeavour to make them succeed and as they are very fond of sweet-smelling flowers with which the women delight to ornament themselves i gave them some rose-seed thursday six we had very variable weather much rain and some westerly winds so that a considerable swell ran into the bay and a number of spotted white and black porpoises made their appearance i had the mortification to see that our garden ground had been much trod over and what was worse the chiefs appeared but little concerned at it to this kind of carelessness and indifference i attribute the miscarriage of many of the plants left here by captain cook i had now in a flourishing state two orange plants some vines a fig tree and two pineapple plants which i gave to poeeno whose residence is a place favourable for their growth we got on successfully with our plants having a hundred potted at the tent and in a fair way of doing well the cabin also was completed and ready to receive them on board i have before remarked that my friend tina was rather of a selfish disposition and this afternoon he showed a stronger instance of it than i was witness to at any time before or after his brother Ore'e Paya sent on board to me a present of a large hog and a quantity of breadfruit, but these kind of presents are much more expensive than purchasing at the market. Soon after Ore'e Paya himself came on board, Tina was with me at the time and whispered me to tell Ore'e Paya not to bring any more hogs or fruit and to take back those which he had sent this advice as may be supposed did not produce the effect intended ore paya appears to be a man of great spirit and is highly respected by his countrymen among other visitors to-day was one of the men who had been to lima in seventeen seventy six saturday eight our plants had now increased to two hundred fifty two as they were all kept on shore at the tent i augmented the guard there though from the general conduct of the natives there did not appear to be the least occasion for so much caution when i was at dinner tina desired i would permit a man to come down into the cabin who he called as ta owa or priest for i was obliged to keep a sentinel at the hatchway to prevent being incommoded at my meals with too much company a restriction which pleased the chiefs who always asked leave for any particular person to be admitted of whom they wished me to take notice the company of the priest brought on a religious conversation he said their great god was called oro and that they had many others of less consequence he asked me if i had a god if he had a son and who was his wife i told them he had a son but no wife who was his father and mother was the next question i said he never had father or mother at this they laughed exceedingly you have a god then who never had a father or mother and has a child without a wife many other questions were asked which my little knowledge of the language did not enable me to answer 
The weather was now fine again, and a great number of people were come from other parts of the island. Tina informed me that there was to be a heiva and a wrestling match on shore, and that the performers waited for our attendance. We therefore sat off with several of our friends, and, about a quarter of a mile from the tents, we found a great concourse of people formed into a ring. As soon as we were seated, a dancing heiva began, which was performed by two girls and four men. This lasted half an hour, and consisted of wanton gestures and motions, such as have been described in the account of former voyages. When the dance ended, Tina ordered a long piece of cloth to be brought. His wife Idea and myself were desired to hold the first two corners, and, the remaining part being supported by many others, we carried it to the performers and gave it them. Several other chiefs made a like present or payment. The performers were strollers that travelled about the country, as in Europe. After this the wrestling began, and the place soon became a scene of riot and confusion. A party of oreos also began to exercise a privilege, which it seems they are allowed, of taking from the women such as their clothes as they thought worth it, so that some of them were left little better than naked. One young woman who was attacked opposed them with all her strength and held fast her cloth, though they almost dragged her along the ground. Observing that I took notice of her, she held out her hand and begged my assistance, and at my request she escaped being pillaged. Soon after a ring was again made, but the wrestlers were so numerous within it that it was impossible to restore order. In the challenges they lay one hand upon their breast, and, on the bending of the arm at the elbow, with the other hand they strike a very smart blow, which, as the hand is kept hollow, creates a sound that may be heard at a considerable distance and this they do so frequently and with such force that the flesh becomes exceedingly bruised and the skin breaking bleeds considerably at this time the sound from so many resembled that of a number of people in a wood felling trees this is the general challenge but when any two combatants agree to a trial they present their hands forward joining them only at the extremities of the fingers they begin by watching to take an advantage, at length they close, seizing each other by the hair, and are most commonly parted before either receives a fall. Only a couple performed anything like the part of good wrestlers, and as they were an equal match this conflict lasted longer than any of the others, but they also were parted. Idea was the general umpire, and she managed with so much address as to prevent any quarrelling and there was no murmuring at her decisions. As her person was large, she was very conspicuous in the circle. Tina took no part in the management. Upon the whole, this performance gave me a better opinion of their strength than of their skill or dexterity. Tuesday, 11. For some time past, Tina had talked of going to the island of Tethuroa, which lies eight or nine leagues north from Otaheite, to fetch his mother, but I found I had only half understood him, for this morning he inquired when we were to sail there in the ship. However, he seemed to feel no great disappointment at my not complying with his wish. Tethu Roa, he informed me, is the property of his family. He likewise spoke to me about an island called Ro'o'o'po, the situation of which he described to be eastward of Otaheite, four or five days' sail, and that there were large animals upon it with eight legs. The truth of this account he very strenuously insisted upon, and wished me to go thither with him. I was at a loss to know whether or not Tina himself gave credit to this whimsical and fabulous account, for though they have credulity sufficient to believe anything, however improbable, they are at the same time so much addicted to that species of wit which we call humbug, that it is frequently difficult to discover whether they are in jest or earnest. Their ideas of geography are very simple. They believe the earth to be a fixed plane of great extent, and that the sun, moon, and stars are all in motion round it. I have been frequently asked by them if I have not been as far as the sun and moon, for they think we are such great travellers that scarce any undertaking is beyond our ability. 
Another island called Tapu Hoi, situated likewise to the eastward, was described to me by Tina, the inhabitants of which were said to be all warriors, and that the people of Otaheite did not dare to go there. He told me that very lately a canoe from Tapahoe was at the island Maitea, that as soon as they landed they began to fight with the people of Maitea, who killed them all except a young lad and a woman who have since been at Otaheite. I saw the boy but could get no information from him. It is most probable that this unfortunate visit of the canoe from Tapu Hoi was not designed, but occasioned by adverse winds which forced them so far from their own island, and that the people of Maitea began the attack, taking advantage of their superior numbers on account of some former quarrel. Thursday, 13. I had a large company to dine with me today. Some of my constant visitors had observed that we always drink His Majesty's health as soon as the cloth was removed, but they were by this time become so fond of wine that they would frequently remind me of the health in the middle of dinner by calling out King George, Ea Rihi, no Britanni, and would banter me if the glass was not filled to the brim. Nothing could exceed the mirth and jollity of these people when they met on board. I was assured by Oadde and several others that the vines planted at the island Huaheine by Captain Cook had succeeded and bore fruit, and that some of the other plants, both at Heeuni and Oaeteepeha, a district on the southeast part of Otaheite, had been preserved and were in a thriving state. I was likewise informed that there was a bull and cow alive at Otaheite, but on different parts of the island, the former at a place called Etea, the latter at the district of Titaha. All the rest were taken away or destroyed by the people of Aimeo. As Titaha was at no great distance, I determined to go thither myself the first opportunity, and make inquiries in hopes that the breed might still be preserved. I had much discourse with my guests about Omai. They confirmed to me that he died about thirty months after Captain Cook left the island. Soon after Captain Cook's departure from Huaheine, there were some disputes between the people of that island and those of Oeetea, in which also the natives of Bola Bola took a part. Omai, who was become of consequence from the possessing three or four muskets and some ammunition, was consulted on the occasion. Such was his opinion and assurances of success that a war was determined on and took place immediately. Victory soon followed through the means of those few arms, and many of the Uli Etea and Bola Bola men were killed. In this contest their flint proved bad, or probably the locks of the muskets had got out of order. This they remedied by a lighted stick, one man presenting the musket, and another with the burnt stick setting fire to the priming, without which contrivance their arms would have proved useless. This expedition, it seemed, consumed all their ammunition. Peace was soon after established, but I did not understand that Omai had increased his possessions or his rank. Nevertheless, I have reason to conclude that he was in some degree of favor with his countrymen from the general good character which they give of him. It appears that he always remembered England with kindness, for his accounts to his countrymen have been such as to give them not only a great idea of our power and consequence, but of our friendship and good will towards him. Taiva Rooa, the eldest of the New Zealand boys that were left with him, died a short time after Omai. About Koa, the youngest, I had always doubtful accounts till I came to Huanhini, where I learned that he likewise was dead. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of A Voyage to the South Sea》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter Eight Expedition to Taitaba after a Heifer Extraordinary Domestic Arrangements Tina's Mother Visits the Ship A Sheep Brought from Uleatea Heavy Storm Death of the Surgeon 
Taona and Toaroa harbors examined. 1788, November. After dinner I went on shore, and, while I was at the tents, from having exposed myself too much in the sun, I was taken ill and continued in much pain for near an hour. This was soon known among the natives, and I was exceedingly surprised to see Tina and all the principal people, both men and women, collecting round me and offering their assistance. For this short illness I was made ample amends by the pleasure I received from the attention and appearance of affection in these kind people. Friday, 14. This morning I had numberless inquiries after my health. The weather being fine, I invited Tina, Oreepaya, and Pueno to accompany me to Tetaha in order to inquire after the cow, and soon after sunrise we set off in the launch. Tetaha is nearly four leagues from Point Venus. On our arrival, Tina sent a man to give notice of our visit. The chief of the district, whose name was Tepaho'o, did not appear, but sent a messenger to demand if I only came to see the cow or to take it away with me. In answer to this, I sent assurances that I only desired to see it, and the chiefs who were with me spoke to the same effect. I was then desired to proceed in the boat farther along shore to the westward. In our way, Tina made me stop among some fishing canoes to purchase fish for him, which he ate raw with salt water for sauce. When we arrived at the landing place, a great number of people had collected, and soon after Te Paho'o arrived. Oreepaya and I went with him about a quarter of a mile, where I was shown one of the most beautiful heifers I ever saw. I asked if they had any more, but they all said there was no other than a bull at Itea, as before mentioned. I could not refrain from expressing my displeasure at the destruction and the foolish separation of these fine animals. I had shared with Captain Cook in the trouble of this business, and had been equally anxious for the success. The district of Tetaha is not so luxuriant and fruitful as the country about Mataavi. As I saw nothing of consequence to detain me, I made a present to Te Paho'o, and after inviting him to visit me on board the ship, which he promised to do, I took leave. Tina had remained all this time in the boat. I observed that no respect was shown to him at this place, nor was he able to procure a coconut or a breadfruit otherwise than by purchasing it. The heifer being here is a proof of this district not having been friendly to the people of Mataavi and Opare. On our way back, having to row against the wind, we stopped to refresh at Opare, and it was eight o'clock by the time we arrived at the ship. I kept my fellow travellers on board to supper, and they did not fail to remind me of the king's health. Monday, 17. Our collection of breadfruit plants at the tents continued increasing. This morning I sent twelve on board, in pots, to discover where they would thrive the best, the air being more temperate on board the ship than on shore. While I was absent from the ship, Te Paho'o had been on board and left a hog as a present for me. After dinner today, Tina, who was my constant visitor, left the table sooner than usual. When he was gone, Oreepaya, his brother, and Oadd told me a piece of scandal, which had been before hinted to me, but which till now I had not heard of with certainty. This was that Edea, Tina's wife, kept a gallant, who was a toto, or servant, and the very person who always fed Tina at dinner. And this was so far from being without Tina's knowledge or consent that they said it was by his desire. They added many other circumstances, and, as I appeared to doubt, they took several opportunities in the course of the day of mentioning it to other people, who all declared it was true. Tuesday, 18. This afternoon I saw Te Paho'o and invited him on board. Before we parted, I bargained with him for the heifer which he promised to bring in five days. My intention was that if I got the heifer, I could endeavor to purchase the bull at Itehea, but if that could not be done, then I could send the heifer as a present to the possessor of the bull, which might equally well answer my purpose. 
It has been mentioned that Tina had a place in my cabin to keep those things which I gave him as being more secure on board than on shore. I had remarked lately that his hoard seemed to diminish the more I endeavored to increase it. At length I discovered that Idea kept another hoard in the master's cabin, which she regularly enriched from her husband's whenever I gave him a present, apprehending that I should cease giving when I saw Tina's locker full. At his request I set the carpenters to work to make him a chest large enough for himself and wife to sleep on. Captain Cook had formerly given him such a chest, but it had been taken from him by the Aemea people. Friday, 21. This forenoon I received a message from Tepaho'o to acquaint me the heifer was brought to Mataavi. I immediately went on shore and found that he had been as good as his word. The purchase money was paid, which consisted of a shirt, a hatchet, a spike nail, a knife, a pair of scissors, a gimlet, and file, to which was added a small quantity of loaf sugar. Tepaho'o appeared well pleased with his bargain, and I sent the heifer to Poeeno's residence, near which was plenty of grass. In the afternoon I was invited to a heiva, the most extraordinary part of which was an oration, with some ceremonies and compliment to us. Twelve men were divided into four ranks, with two women in the front. Behind them all stood a priest who made a speech which lasted ten minutes, and which was listened to with some attention. During this the picture of Captain Cook, which had been brought for that purpose, was placed by my side. When the priest left off speaking, a piece of white cloth was wrapped round the picture, and another piece round me. The priest then spoke again for a short time, and an old man placed a piece of plated coconut leaf at my feet. The same was done to Tina, and one piece was put under the picture. After this the dancing began, which was in the same style that we had already seen. The head of the ship was the figure of a woman, and not ill-carved. As we were painting the ship's upper works, I directed this figure to be painted in colors, with which the islanders were much pleased. Not only the men, but the women desired me to bring English women when I came again. Today Oedadi, thinking that I was not convinced of the truth of what he had told me about Idea, mentioned the affair to the lady herself in my hearing, at which she laughed, but said he did ill to tell me of it. However, it was evident she was not much offended for they were both very much diverted in discoursing upon the subject. I find it is not at all uncommon for brothers to have connections with the wives of each other, particularly elder brothers with the wives of their younger brothers, which is generally allowed and no offence taken. But if any person not belonging to the family endeavours at the same intimacy, it is resented as an injury. Inclination seems to be the only binding law of marriage at Otaheite. As I proposed to get instruments on shore at Point Venus to make observations, I desired Tina to order a house to be brought there for me, which was done and fixed in half an hour, being only a light shed supported by posts. Monday, 24. Today I bought a turtle that was caught on the reefs. As Tina was going to leave me for a few days, I had it dressed for his dinner. He told me that his mother, Ube Re'ee Roa, was arrived from the island Tethuroa, and begged that I would send for her in the morning, and take care of her till he returned, which I willingly promised. Tuesday, 25. This morning I sent a boat to Opare, which returned in the afternoon with Ube Re'ee Roa and two women, her servants. As she was old and corpulent, it was with difficulty that we helped her up the ship's side. As soon as she was in the ship, she sat down on the gangway, and, clasping my knees in her arms, expressed her pleasure at seeing me by a flood of tears. Her servants then produced three pieces of cloth, which, with a large hog, some breadfruit, plantains, and coconuts, she had brought as a present. As she was fatigued by her journey, she wished to remain on board all night, and I directed accommodations to be prepared, which was done with little trouble, as nothing more was necessary than a mat and some cloth spread on the deck. She had with her a favorite cat, 
bread from one that had been given her by Captain Cook. She told me all the misfortunes that had befallen her son and friends since Captain Cook left Otaheite. All the accounts agree, in some of the cattle being now alive at the island A.E. Mayo, in number they differ, but that there were eight is the least account. Wednesday, 26. In the morning, Ube Re A A Roa, being desirous to go on shore, I made her a present of several things, which she did not care to take with her then, but requested I would keep them safe for her. Only Moana uh, and Po A A No dined with me today. They told me that Tina and his brother Oreepea were not on good terms together, and it was imagined they would fight as soon as the ship was gone. I had observed a coolness between them, and had at times endeavoured to make them more cordial, but with very little effect. Their quarrel has arisen from a disagreement between their wives. In the afternoon a canoe from Uietea arrived in which was an Aare or chief of that island, who is a nephew to Ube Re -e Roa. He brought a sheep with him. The poor animal was infected with the mange and in very poor condition. The climate had not, as far as I could judge, altered the quality of the wool, with which he was well covered except a part about the shoulders. I imagined this animal to be the English ewe left by Captain Cook. The owner assured me that they were ten sheep at Hua Hayene, the truth of which I much doubted. I was surprised, and rather mortified, to find that he set so little value on this as to let me have it at the first word for a small adze. I sent it to be kept at Poeeno's with the heifer. Friday, 28. Tina and his wife returned to Mataavi, and from appearances which I have no reason to misdoubt, were sincerely glad to see me again after their short absence. They brought, as usual, a present of a hog and fruit. This morning there was an eclipse of the sun, but the weather was so cloudy that I had only an opportunity of observing the end of the eclipse, which was at nineteen hours, forty-three minutes, fifty-three seconds. Saturday, 29. I sent a man to shear the ewe, by which a remedy could be more easily applied to cure the disease with which it was infected. The garden made near the tents was not in a prosperous condition. Most of the melons and cucumbers were destroyed by insects, and the soil being sandy was not favorable to the other seeds. I therefore chose another spot of ground farther from the seaside, and had an assortment of seeds sown. December. Monday, 1. In the night, the rudder of one of the boats was stolen from the tents. On landing in the morning, neither Tina nor any of his family came near me, being, I was informed, afraid of my displeasure. As the loss was not great, I immediately sent to assure them that I had no anger except against the person who committed the theft. In consequence of this message, Tina and some of the other chiefs came to the tents and promised that they would exert themselves to discover the thief and get the rudder restored. This was the first theft of any consequence that had been committed since the tents were on the shore, and my suspicions fell chiefly on the people who were here from some of the other islands. Tina had just begun to build a house for himself, and I promised that our carpenter should assist him. Why de Ea, the youngest brother of Tina, had lately been one of my constant visitors, and seems to have left off his former custom of getting drunk with the Ava. He was esteemed one of their best warriors, and I was told that in the quarrel with the people of Aimeo, he killed Mahaini, the chief of that island. Friday, 5. The weather for some time past had been very unsettled. This afternoon the wind blew fresh from the northwest, which occasioned the sea to break very high across the dolphin bank, and in the night such a heavy broken sea came into the bay that we were obliged to batten all the hatchways down, and to keep everybody on deck all night, though the rain came down in torrents. The ship rolled in a most violent manner. Saturday, 6. In the morning the wind increasing, and, there being no possibility of putting to sea, we struck yards and top masts and trusted to our anchors. 
The river swelled so much with the rain that the point of the land on which the tent stood became an island, and to preserve the breadfruit plants from being endangered, the people were obliged to cut a passage for the river through a part of the beach at a distance from the tent. The sea broke very high on the beach. Nevertheless, a canoe put off, and to my surprise, Tina, his wife, and Moana made their way good through the surf and came on board to see me. There was no other person in the canoe, for the weather did not admit of useless passengers. Each of them had a paddle, which they managed with great activity and skill. These kind people embraced me with many tears, and expressed their apprehensions for the safety of the ship. Towards noon, however, the sea abated considerably, but the wind continued to blow strong from the northwest. At sunset, Idea went on shore, but Tina would remain with me the whole night. Sunday, 7. The wind continued between the north and northwest, but had so much moderated that I no longer considered our situation to be alarming. At noon, Idea returned to the ship with a large hog and a supply of breadfruit and coconuts, and soon after she and Tina left the ship, having extracted a promise from me that if the weather was moderate, I would go on shore in the morning and visit their parents and sister, who, they told me, had been much alarmed on our account. I received a visit likewise from Poeeno and his wife. This woman had always shown great regard for us, and now, in our meeting, before I could be aware of it, she began beating her head violently with a shark's tooth, so that her face was covered with blood in an instant. I put a stop to this as soon as I could, and with the drying up of the blood her agitation subsided. This ceremony is frequently performed upon occasions either of joy or grief. Her husband said that if any accident happened to the ship, I should live with him, and that they would cut down trees and build me another ship. From this sample of the weather, and the information of the natives, I was convinced it would not be safe to continue in Mataevi Bay much longer, and I determined to get everything ready for sailing as speedily as I could. Monday, 8. The night proved moderate, and in the morning I went on shore, where I was received by... Ube Re'e Roa, and several other friends with great affection. The plants received no injury from the bad weather, having been carefully covered from the spray of the sea. Some were in a dormant state, and others were striking out young shoots. Nelson thought it was better to refrain a few days from taking them on board. I therefore consented to defer it. He was of the opinion that the plants could be propagated from the roots only, and I directed some boxes to be filled as we could stow them where no others could be placed. Tuesday, 9. This afternoon, in hauling the launch on shore to be repaired, many of the natives assisting, one of them, a fine boy about ten years old, was thrown down and a roller which was placed under the boat went over him. The surgeon being ill, I sent off for his assistant. Fortunately, no limb was broken, nor did he receive any material injury. The surgeon had been a long time ill, the effect of intemperance and indolence. He had latterly scarce ever stirred out of his cabin, but was not apprehended to be in a dangerous state. Nevertheless, this evening he appeared to be so much worse than usual that it was thought necessary to remove him to some place where he could have more air, but to no effect, for he died in an hour afterwards. This unfortunate man drank very hard, and was so averse to exercise, that he never would be prevailed on to take half a dozen turns upon deck at a time in the course of the voyage. Wednesday, 10. As I wished to bury the surgeon on shore, I mentioned it to Tina, who said there would be no objection, but that it would be necessary to ask his father's consent first, which he undertook to do, and immediately left me for that purpose. By this circumstance, it appears that, although the eldest son of an Eare succeeds to the title and honors of the father as soon as he is born, yet a considerable portion of authority remains with the father even after the son is of age. When Tina returned, I went with him to the spot intended for the burial place, taking with us two men to dig the grave, but on our arrival I found the natives had already begun it. 
Tina asked me if they were doing it right. There, says he, the sun rises, and there it sets. The idea that the grave should be east and west, I imagine they learnt from the Spaniards, as the captain of one of their ships was buried at Otaheite in 1774. Certain it is they had not the information from anybody belonging to our ship, for I believe we should not have thought of it. The grave, however, was marked out very exactly. At four in the afternoon the body was interned, the chiefs and many of the natives came to see the ceremony, and showed great attention during the service. Some of the chiefs were very inquisitive about what was to be done with the surgeon's cabin on account of apparitions. They said when a person died in Otaheite, and was carried to the Tupapau, that as soon as night came he was surrounded by spirits, and if any person went there by himself they would devour him. Therefore they said that not less than two people together should go into the surgeon's cabin for some time. I did not endeavor to dissuade them from this belief, otherwise than by laughing and letting them know that we had no such apprehensions. In the afternoon, the effects of the deceased were disposed of, and I appointed Mr. Thomas Denman Ledward, the surgeon's mate, to do duty as surgeon. Friday, 12. I went in a boat to examine the harbors around Opare, and found two formed by the reefs. The westernmost is the most convenient for sailing in or out, but it is not well sheltered from a northwest wind or sea. This harbor is called by the natives Taone. It is about a league and a half distant from Point Venus, and may be known by a remarkable mountain called by the natives Walre, which bears south-southeast from the entrance. The easternmost harbor is called Toaroa. It is small, but as secure as a reef harbor can well be. It is about three miles distant from Point Venus. The chief objection to this harbor is the difficulty of getting out with the common trade wind, the entrance being on the east side, not more than 100 yards wide, and the depth without convenient for warping. On the south side of the entrance is a morae. The reef side is to be kept on board and a lookout to be kept from aloft, whence the shoal water is better discerned than from the deck. Sunday, 14. This forenoon we performed divine service. Many of the principal natives attended and behaved with great decency. Some of the women at one time betrayed an inclination to laugh at our general responses, but on my looking at them they appeared much ashamed. After the service I was asked if no offering was to be made for the Eatua to eat. The weather had been fair all the last week, and at this time appeared quite settled, so that I was under no apprehensions from danger for continuing a little longer in Mataavi Bay. End of chapter 8「This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly Chapter 9 A Walk into the Country The Pe'earoa Prevailed on by the kindness of the chiefs to defer our departure Breadfruit plants collected Move the ships to Toaroa Harbor Fishing Three of the ship's company desert Indiscretion of our people on shore Instances of jealousy. Morning. Bowl brought to Opare by a prophet. The deserters recovered. Tina proposes to visit England. 1788. December. Wednesday, 17. This morning I took a walk into the country, accompanied by Nelson and my old friend Moana. The breadth of the border of lowland before we arrived at the foot of the hills was near three miles. This part of our journey was through a delightful country, well covered with breadfruit and coconut trees, and strewed with houses in which were swarms of children. We then proceeded along a valley, still among houses, with plantations of yams, taro, the cloth plant, and their favorite root, the ava. There were breadfruit trees on the sides of the hills which were dwarfs in comparison of those on the lowland. Our walk was very much interrupted by a river, the course of which was so supertine that we had to cross it several times, being carried over on men's shoulders. 
on arriving at a morai i saw a number of natives collected and was informed that the priests were performing their devotions sixteen men were sitting on their heels in the front was a pole covered with a plaited coconut branch and before each of the men there were a number of small pieces of the same leaf plaited which they call ha'irei and each had likewise a piece round his wrist one who appeared to be the chief priest prayed aloud and was answered by all the rest together after a few short sentences and responses they rose and each carried an heirei which they placed at the foot of the pole and returned to prayer this was repeated until all the heirei were delivered and then the ceremony ended i must not forget to mention that they had placed near the pole an offering of plantains and breadfruit which they left for the eatua they very kindly asked us to partake of a roasted hog that had been prepared for them whilst they were praying but as i wished to make the most of the morning before the sun was too high i declined their offer and moana bespoke refreshments to be ready for us when we returned we continued our walk up the valley which became very narrow and advanced a considerable way beyond all the houses and plantations when we were suddenly stopped by a cascade that fell into the river from a height of above two hundred feet the fall at this time was not great but in heavy rains must be considerable the natives look upon this as the most wonderful sight in the island the fall of water is the least curious part the cliff over which it comes is perpendicular forming an appearance as if supported by square pillars of stone and with a regularity that is surprising underneath is a pool eight or nine feet deep into which the water falls and in this place all the natives make a point of bathing once in their lives probably from some religious idea the hills here approach each other within a few yards and are well covered with wood as the road appeared difficult i did not care to proceed towards the mountain i cannot with certainty say how far this curious precipice is from the bay but think in the road by which we went it cannot be less than seven miles it is called peea roa in our return we found a young pig prepared for us and we made a hearty meal we dined in the house of an old acquaintance of nelson's for whom he had in seventeen seventy seven planted two shaddock plants formerly mentioned which he had brought from the friendly isles these we had the satisfaction to see were grown to fine trees and full of fruit in their plantations they do not take much pains except with the ava and the cloth plant both of which they are careful to keep clear of weeds many of the plantations of the cloth plant were fenced with stone and surrounded with a ditch the yams and plantains are mostly on the higher grounds as soon as we had finished our dinner we returned towards the ship i was much delighted in this walk with the number of children that i saw in every part of the country they are very handsome and sprightly and full of antic tricks they have many diversions that are common with the boys in england such as flying kites cat's cradle swinging dancing or jumping on a rope walking upon stilts and wrestling friday nineteen the wind to-day blew fresh but continued regular from the east and east-southeast we had likewise much rain and a long swell set into the bay i had not yet determined whether on leaving mataavi bay i would go to the island aimeo or to the harbour of toaroa near opare this uncertainty made tina and the rest of my friends very anxious and they appeared much distressed on my desiring them this afternoon to send on board all the things which they wished to have repaired by the forge without delay that what they wanted might be done before the ship left mataavi which i told them would be in a few days they very earnestly entreated i would stay one month longer i represented this as impossible and asked tina if he would not go with me to aimeo but he said that notwithstanding my protection he was certain that the aimeo people would watch for an opportunity to kill him he remained on board with me all night but his wife went on shore and returned early in the morning bringing with her some axes and other things that were in need of repair saturday twenty when i went on shore i found otoe 
Obarea Roa, Maona, and several others in great tribulation at the thoughts that we were so soon to leave them. All the people of Mataavi I saw were much concerned at my intention of going to Eimeo, and took every opportunity to prejudice me against the people of that island, to which I paid very little attention, as their motive was obvious. Sunday, 21. Their expressions of friendship and affection for me, however, I could not disregard, as I had no doubt of their being genuine and unaffected, and I felt my unwillingness to leave these kind people so much increased that the next day I sent the master and the launch to re-examine the depth of the water between this bay and Toa harbor. He returned in the evening and acquainted me that he had found a good bottom with not less than sixteen fathoms depth all the way. The harbor of Toa appearing every way safe, I determined to get the ship there as speedily as possible, and I immediately made my intentions public, which occasioned great rejoicing. Wednesday, 24. This day we took the plants on board, being 774 pots, all in a healthy state, for whenever any plant had an unfavorable appearance, it was replaced by another. The number of those rejected was 302, of which not one in ten but was found to be growing at the root. The natives reckon eight kinds of the breadfruit tree, each of which they distinguish by a different name. 1. Patea 2. Aroroa 3. Awana 4. Mire 5. Orea 6. Poero 7. Apeera 8. Rodeaea In the first, fourth, and eighth class, the leaf differs from the rest. The fourth is more sinuated. The eighth has a large broad leaf not at all sinuated. The difference of the fruit is principally in the first and eighth class. In the first, the fruit is rather larger and more of an oblong form. In the eighth, it is round and not above half the size of the others. I inquired if plants could be produced from the seed and was told they could not, but that they must be taken from the root. The plants are best collected after wet weather, at which time the earth balls round the roots, and they are not liable to suffer by being moved. The most common method of dividing time at Otaheite is by moons, but they likewise make a division of the year into six parts, each of which is distinguished by the name of the kind of breadfruit then in season. In this division they keep a small interval called Tawa, in which they do not use the breadfruit. This is about the end of February, when the fruit is not in perfection, but there is no part of the year in which the trees are entirely bare. Thursday. 25. At daylight we unmoored, and I sent the tents in the launch to Opare, with directions that, after landing them, the launch should meet the ship in the entrance of Toa Roa Harbor, to show the safest part of the channel. At half-past ten we got the ship under sail, and ran down under topsails. When we were near the launch it fell calm, and the ship shot past her. We immediately let the anchor go, but to our great surprise we found the ship was aground forwards. She had run on so easy that we had not perceived it at the time. This accident occasioned us much trouble, as we were obliged to send anchors out astern to get the ship afloat. In doing this, one of the cables swept a rock and was not got clear again without much difficulty. When the ship was moored, Point Venus bore north 46 degrees east. The east part of the harbor, north 65 degrees, east one quarter of a mile. Our distance from the shore, half a cable's length. Depth of water, eight and one half fathoms. Friday, 26. The next morning on my landing, I was welcomed by all the principal people, I may say by the whole crowd, and congratulated on the safety of the ship. Tina showed me a house near the waterside abreast the ship, which he desired I would make use of, and which was large enough for all our purposes. He and his brother O Re Paya then desired I would stay and receive a formal address and present which they called O Te. To this I assented, and a stool was brought for me to sit on. 
They then left me with Moana, and in a short time I saw Tina returning with about twenty men, who all made a stop at some distance, and a priest said a short prayer to the Eatua, to which the rest made reply. A man was then sent to me three several times, at each time bringing me a small pig and the stem of a plantain leaf. The first they told me was for the god of Bretine, the next for King George, and the last for myself. Moana then got up, and without being dictated to, made an oration for me, the purpose of which I understood to be that I received their offering with thanks, that we were good people and friends, and therefore he exhorted them to commit no thefts. He told them to bring their pigs, coconuts, and breadfruit, and they would receive good things in return, that we took nothing without their consent, and finally that every man was to quit the place, that is, the house we occupied, at night, for if they made any visit in the dark, they would be killed. With this speech the ceremony ended. I found this a delightful situation, and in every respect convenient. The ship was perfectly sheltered by the reefs in smooth water, and close to a fine beach without the least surf. A small river with very good water runs into the sea about the middle of the harbor. I gave directions for the plants to be landed, and the same party to be with them as at Mataave. Tina fixed his dwelling close to our station. Monday. 29. Some of the natives took advantage of the butcher's negligence and stole his cleaver. I complained of this to the chiefs who were on board, and they promised that they would endeavor to collect it, but an article so valuable as this was to the natives I had no great expectation of seeing restored. The ship continued to be supplied by the natives as usual. Coconuts were in such plenty that I believe not a pint of water was drunk on board the ship in the twenty-four hours. Breadfruit began to be scarce, though we purchased without difficulty a sufficient quantity for our consumption. There was, however, another harvest approaching which they expected would be fit for use in five or six weeks. The better kind of plantains also were become scarce, but a kind which they call vehe were in great plenty. This fruit does not hang on the trees like the other kinds, but grows upon an upright stalk of considerable strength and substance. Though this plantain is inferior in quality to most of the others, it affords great subsistence to the natives. We received almost every day presents of fish, chiefly dolphin and albacore, and a few small rock fish. Their fishing is mostly in the night, when they make strong lights on the reefs, which attract the fish to them. Sometimes in fine weather the canoes are out in such numbers that the whole sea appears illuminated. In the canoes they fish with hook and line, and on the reefs they struck the fish with a spear. Some likewise carry out small nets which are managed by two men. In the daytime their fishing canoes go without the reefs, sometimes to a considerable distance, where they fish with rods and lines, and catch bonitas and other fish. Whenever there is a show of fish, a fleet of canoes immediately proceeds to sea. Their hooks, being bright, are used without bait in the manner of our artificial flies. Their rods are made of bamboo, but when there are any large fish, they make use of an outrigger over the fore part of the canoe, about twenty-five feet in length, which has two prongs at the extremity, to each of which is fastened a hook and line, and when a fish takes the hook, it is raised by ropes, managed by two men in the stern of the canoe. January, 1789. Thursday, 1. Contrary to my expectation, Tina this afternoon brought on board the cleaver that had been stolen. The thief had taken it to Ata ho o ro -o, and Tina told me, which I could easily believe, that it was given up with reluctance. Friday, Two. The next morning I offered Tina a present of axes and other things, but as he suspected this was meant by way of return for getting the cleaver restored, he would not be prevailed with to accept a single article. I had constantly the company of Tina, his wife, and some of his relations, but the royal children, though so near us, never came in sight of the ship. 
the river separated them from the place occupied by our people on shore and for fear of giving alarm or offence i gave strict orders that no one should attempt to go near their place of residence monday five at the relief of the watch at four o'clock this morning the small cutter was missing i was immediately informed of it and mustered the ship's company when it appeared that three men were absent charles churchill the ship's corporal and two of the seamen william muspratt and john millward the latter of whom had been sentinel from twelve to two in the morning they had taken with them eight stands of arms and ammunition but what their plan was or which way they had gone no one on board seemed to have the least knowledge i went on shore to the chiefs and soon received information that the boat was at mataavi and that the deserters had departed in a sailing canoe for the island te Ruroa. on this intelligence i sent the master to mataavi to search for the small cutter and one of the chiefs went with him but before they had got half way they met the boat with five of the natives who were bringing her back to the ship this service rendered me by the people of mataavi pleased me much and i rewarded the men accordingly i told tina and the other chiefs that i expected they would get the deserters brought back for i was determined not to leave otaheite without them they assured me they would do everything in their power to have them taken and it was agreed that oreepaya and moana would depart the next morning for tethuroa oreepaya inquired if they had pocket pistols for said he though we may surprise and seize them before they can make use of their muskets yet if they have pistols they may do mischief even while they are held i quieted these apprehensions by assuring them that the deserters had no pistols with them tuesday six at daylight oreepaya and moana set off in two canoes for te through roa but the weather became so boisterous that they were obliged to return in the forenoon and i was happy to see them get safe in as the sea ran very high without the harbour from the first of this month the weather and winds had been much unsettled with a great deal of rain our former station at mataavi appeared not at all safe the sea at times breaking high over the dolphin bank and making a great swell on the bay oreepaya and moana both promised me that they would sail again as soon as the weather should be fine friday nine the wind continued to blow strong at sea though in the harbour we had at times but light breezes poeeno from mataavi came to see me to-day he said he was apprehensive that i was displeased with him on account of our deserters having been carried to tethuroa by a canoe from mataavi this he declared to have been done before he heard of it and that the only service in his power he had not neglected to do for me which was sending our boat back as this was really an act of friendship i received him with great cordiality and he assured me there could be no doubt from the directions tina had given of the deserters being brought to the ship as soon as the weather would admit canoes to go after them saturday ten one of the officers this morning inadvertently plucked a branch from a tree called totoe that bears the oil nut which was growing at a morae on entering with it into the house occupied by our people all the natives both men and women immediately went away when i went on shore i found this branch tied to one of the posts of the house although the effect it had on the natives was known i was much displeased at this piece of wantonness and ordered the branch to be taken away but the natives notwithstanding would not come near the place they said the house was taboo which i understood to signify interdicted and that none of them might approach it till the taboo was taken off which could only be done by tina to take anything away from a morai is regarded as a kind of sacrilege and they believe gives great offence to the eatua at my request tina took off the taboo but not before the afternoon this was performed by an offering of a plantain leaf at the moare and a prayer made to the eatua after this ceremony the house was resorted to by the natives as usual i had not yet given up the hope of obtaining the bull from itea although i had hitherto received no satisfactory answer to the messages which tina had sent at my desire 
I therefore spoke to Poeeno, who undertook to negotiate this business, and I commissioned him to make very liberal offers. He left me after dinner to return to Mataavi. In the evening a messenger arrived from him to acquaint me that, in his absence, the sheep which I had trusted to his care had been killed by a dog, and that he had sent the culprit, hoping I would kill him for the offence he had committed. This poor sheep had been so much diseased that I could not help suspecting he died without the dog's assistance, and that the story of the dog was invented to prevent my attributing it to want of care. This doubt did not appear in my answer. As for the dog, I told the messenger to do with him what he pleased. Tuesday, 13. This morning, the weather being more moderate than it had been for some days past, Oreepaya sailed with two canoes for Tethuroa. Wednesday, 14. Some business prevented Moana from accompanying him, but he followed the next day with two other canoes. The wood that we had got at Mataavi being expended, I applied to Tina, who sent three trees down to the waterside before night, which, when cut up, made a good launch load. I saw two instances of jealousy today, one of which nearly produced fatal consequences. A man was detected with a married woman by the husband, who stabbed him in the belly with a knife. Fortunately, the intestines escaped, and the wound did not prove dangerous. The other instance was a girl, who had constantly lived with my coxton, beating another girl that she discovered to have been too intimate with him. Friday, 16. In walking today with Tina near a Tupapau, I was surprised by a sudden outcry of grief. As I expressed a desire to see the distressed person, Tina took me to the place where we found a number of women one of whom was the mother of a young female child that lay dead. On seeing us, their mourning not only immediately ceased, but to my astonishment they all burst into an immoderate fit of laughter, and while we remained appeared much diverted with our visit. I told Tina the woman had no sorrow for her child, otherwise her grief would not have so easily subsided, on which he jocosely told her to cry again. They did not, however, resume their mourning in our presence. This strange behavior would incline us to think them hard-hearted and unfeeling, did we not know that they are fond parents, and in general very affectionate. It is therefore to be ascribed to their extreme levity of disposition, and it is probable that death does not appear to them with so many terrors as it does to people of a more serious cast. Sunday, 18. I received a message from Poeeno to acquaint me that he had been successful in his negotiations for the bull, which he had driven part of the way by land, but could not get farther on account of the rivers, and therefore desired a boat should be sent for him. I accordingly ordered the launch to be got ready, and at two o'clock next morning Mr. Fryer, the master, set off in her. Monday, 19. In the afternoon, the launch returned with the bull and my friend Poeeno. For the night, I directed that the bull should remain at Opare, and the next day he was taken to the cow at Mataave. Wednesday, 21. Today, Poeeno brought to me the person from whom he had the bull to receive the stipulated payment, which was one of every article of traffic that I had in my possession. This man whose name was Oweevee, they told me it was inspired by a divine spirit, and that in all manners of consequence he was consulted, for he had conversed with the Eatua. It was, they said, the Eatua that ordered him to demand the bull from Tina, which not to have complied with would have been the height of impiety. I had endeavored to convince them of the roguery of this man, thinking I had a fair argument to prove it by his selling that which the Eatua had ordered him to keep, but here I was easily defeated, for it seems the Eatua told him to sell me the beast. This being the case, I said I would not give the animals to any person, that they were now mine, and that I would leave them under the protection of Poeeno and Tina, who I hoped would take care of them for me till I returned." They both entered into my views, and promised the animals should be attended to, and told me that, while they were considered as my property, no one would attempt to take them away. Thursday, 22. 
This afternoon I received a message from Tepahoo to inform me that our deserters had passed this harbor and were at Tetaha, about five miles distant. I ordered the cutter to be got ready, and a little before sunset left the ship, taking Oadde with me. By his advice I landed at some distance from the place where the deserters were, but thinking it necessary to have the boat within call, and Oadde assuring me that there was safe landing further on, I directed the boat to proceed along shore whilst Oadde and I walked along the beach. The night was very dark and windy, and the shore being rocky, I soon lost sight of the boat. A few of the natives had joined us in our walk, and from their manner I had reason to suspect them of a design to close upon us with an intention no doubt to plunder. I was provided with pocket pistols, and on producing one they left us. Oedee was so much alarmed that I could scarce prevail on him to proceed. When we arrived at Te Pahoo's house, we were very kindly received by him and his wife. The cutter was arrived, but there being a very high surf, she could not come within a hundred yards of the shore. The deserters, I was informed, were in a house close to us, and I imagined there would be no great difficulty in securing them with the assistance of the natives. They had, however, heard of my arrival, and when I was near the house they came out without their arms and delivered themselves up. I sent directions off to the boat for one of my people to come on shore, and for the boat to return to the place where I had landed. My next business was to secure the arms, which I delivered to Te Pahoo to take charge of for the night. One musket and two bayonets were missing, which they said were lost by the canoe in which they had come from Te Thu Roa, having overset. I then took leave of Te Pahoo, who presented us with a plentiful supply of provisions, and we proceeded with the deserters toward the boat, but, as the wind had increased and it rained hard, I determined to remain on shore till the morning, and having found shelter for the people we passed the remainder of the night without accident. At daylight I sent for the arms, and we returned to the ship. Friday. 23. I learnt from the deserters that at Tethu Roa they had seen Oreepaya and Moana, who had made an attempt to secure them. They said it was their intention to have returned to the ship, and it was probable that they were so much harassed by the natives watching for an opportunity to surprise them that they might wish to have the merit of returning of their own accord to avoid the disgrace of being seized and brought back. At the time they delivered themselves up to me, it was not in their power to have made resistance, their ammunition having been spoiled by the wet. In consequence of my having been kept all night from the ship by the tempestuous weather, the timekeeper went down at ten hours, five minutes, thirty-three seconds. Its rate previous to this was one second seven, losing in twenty-four hours, and its error from the meantime at Greenwich was seven minutes, twenty-nine seconds, two, too slow. I set it going again by a common watch, corrected by observations, and endeavored to make the error the same as if it had not stopped, but being overcautious made me tedious in setting it in motion, and increased the error from meantime at Greenwich. The rate of going I did not find to have altered. At dinner, Tina congratulated me on having recovered my men, but expressed some concern that they had not been brought by Oreepaya and Moana, lest I should imagine they had not done everything in their power. To this, I replied that I was perfectly satisfied of their good intentions to serve me, and that I considered myself under great obligations to them for the troubles they had been at on my account. I learnt afterwards that they had actually seized and bound the deserters, but had been prevailed upon, by fair promises of their returning peaceably to the ship, to let them loose. The deserters, however, finding an opportunity to get possession of their arms, again set the natives at defiance. Friday, 30. This afternoon I punished one of the seamen's, Isaac Martin, with nineteen lashes for striking an Indian. This was a transgression of so serious a nature, and such a direct violation of my orders, that I would on no account be prevailed on to forgive it, though great intercession was made by some of the chiefs. Oreepaya and Moana were not yet returned from Tethu Roa. 
This place is resorted to by the principal people of this part of Otaheite at particular seasons when fish are in great plenty there. It was described to me to be a group of small keys surrounded by a reef. Their produce is chiefly coconuts and plantains. During the season, breadfruit and other provisions are daily carried over from Otaheite. Not less than a hundred sail of canoes were at Tethu Roa when our deserters were there. Tepaho'o and his wife were become my constant visitors. He had for some time past been ill, and had made Opare his place of residence for the benefit of our surgeon's advice and assistance. At this time he complained of a hoarseness and sore throat. Mr. Ledward, on examining him, discovered there had been two holes in the roof of his mouth, which, though healed, had the appearance of having been large. The adjacent parts appeared sound, yet the surgeon was of opinion that they were cancerous, and would in the end occasion his death. Saturday, 31. This morning I ordered all the chests to be taken on shore, and the inside of the ship to be washed with boiling water to kill the cockroaches. We were constantly obliged to be at great pains to keep the ship clear of vermin on account of the plants. By the help of traps and good cats, we were freed from rats and mice. When I was at Otaheite with Captain Cook, there were great numbers of rats about all the houses, and so tame that they flocked round the people at their meals for the offals which were commonly thrown to them. But at this time we scarce ever saw a rat, which must be attributed to the industry of a breed of cats left there by European ships. After breakfast I walked with Tina to Mataavi to see the cattle and the gardens. Tina had already taken so large a dose of the ava that he was perfectly stupefied. Idea, however, was with us, and she is one of the most intelligent persons I met with at Otaheite. We went first to Poeeno's house and saw the bull and cow together in a very fine pasture. I was informed that the cow had taken the bull, so that if no untoward accident happens, there is a fair chance of the breed being established. In the garden near Poeno's house, many things had failed. The Indian corn was in a fine state, and I have no doubt but that they will cultivate it all over the country. A fig tree was in a very thriving way, as were two vines, a pineapple plant, and some slips of a shaddock tree. From this place we walked to the garden at Point Venus, but I had the mortification to find that almost everything there was destroyed by the hogs. Some underground peas and Indian corn had escaped, and likewise the Kalalu green and okra of Jamaica. We returned to the ship, and after dinner I was not a little surprised to hear Dina seriously propose that he and his wife should go with me to England. He said he would only take two servants, that he much wished to see King George, who he was sure would be glad to see him. Tina and many of his countrymen were become extremely eager to get a knowledge of other countries, and were continually inquiring about the situation of the islands which we told them of in these seas. To quiet his importunity, I was obliged to promise that I would ask the king's permission to carry them to England if I came again, that then I should be in a larger ship and could have accommodations properly fitted up. I was sorry to find that Tina was apprehensive that he should be attacked by his enemies as soon as our ship left Otaheite, and that if they joined they would be too powerful for him. The illness of Te Paho'o, with whom he was on good terms, gave him much uneasiness, Te Paho'o's wife being a sister of Oto's and Aunt to Tina. They have no children, as has been before related, and if Te Paho'o were to die, he would be succeeded as a Are'e of the district of Tahaha by his brother, who is an enemy to Tina. I have on every occasion endeavored to make the principal people believe that we should return again to Otaheite, and that we should revenge any injury done in our absence to the people of Mataave and Opare'e. The wife of Oede'e is likewise an aunt to Tina, and sister to Oto. His native place is Uli'ete'a, where he has some property, but which I imagine is not of such consequence to him as the countenance of the chiefs with whom he is connected at Otaheite. End of chapter 9
Chapter Ten of A Voyage to the South Sea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter Ten: The Ship's Cable Cut in the Night. Cruelness with the Chiefs on that account. Visit to an old lady. Disturbance at a Hay Eva. Tina's hospitality. A thief taken and punished. Preparations for sailing. 1789, February, Tuesday, 3. I was present this afternoon at a wrestling match where a young man, by an unlucky fall, put his arm out of joint at the elbow. Three stout men immediately took hold of him and, two of them fixing their feet against his ribs, replaced it. I had sent for our surgeon, but before he arrived all was well except a small swelling of the muscles in consequence of the strain. I inquired what they would have done if the bone had been broken, and, to show me their practice, they got a number of sticks and placed round a man's arm, which they bound with cord. That they have considerable skill in surgery is not to be doubted. I have before mentioned an instance of an amputated arm being perfectly healed, and which had every appearance of having been treated with great propriety. The part of the beach nearest the ship has become the general place of resort towards the close of the day. An hour before sunset the inhabitants begin to collect, and here they amuse themselves with exercising the lance, dancing, and various kinds of merriment till nearly dark, when they retired to their homes. Of this cheerful scene we were spectators and partakers every fine evening. Friday, 6. An occurrence happened today which gave me great concern, not only on account of the danger with which the ship had been threatened, but as it tended greatly to diminish the confidence and good understanding which had hitherto been constantly preserved between us and the natives. The wind had blown fresh in the night, and at daylight we discovered that the cable by which the ship rode had been cut near the water's edge in such a manner that only one strand remained whole. While we were securing the ship, Tina came on board. I could not but believe he was perfectly innocent of the transaction. Nevertheless, I spoke to him in a very peremptory manner, and insisted on his discovering and bringing to me the offender. I was wholly at a loss how to account for this malicious act. My suspicions fell chiefly, I may say wholly, on the strangers that came to us from other parts of the island, for we had on every occasion received such unreserved and unaffected marks of good will from the people of Mataavi and Opare that in my mind I entirely acquitted them. The anger which I expressed, however, created so much alarm that old Oto and his wife, the father and mother of Tina, immediately quitted Opare and retired to the mountain in the midst of heavy rain, as did Tepaho'o and his family. Tina and Idee remained and expostulated with me on the unreasonableness of my anger against them. He said he would exert his utmost endeavors to discover the guilty person, but it might possibly not be in his power to get him delivered up, which would be the case if he were either of Tiaroboo, Ataooroo, or of the island Eimeo. That the attempt might have been made as much out of enmity to the people of Mataavi and Opare as to me, every one knowing the regard I had for them, and that I had declared I would protect them against their enemies. All this I was inclined to believe, but I did not think proper to appear perfectly satisfied lest Tina, who was naturally very indolent, should be remiss in his endeavors to detect the offender. To guard as much as possible against future attempts of this kind, I directed a stage to be built on the forecastle, so that the cable should be more directly under the eye of the sentinel, and I likewise gave orders that one of the midshipmen should keep watch forward. In the afternoon, Orei Paya returned from Tethuroa. He told me that Moana and himself had narrowly escaped being lost in the bad weather, and that Moana had been obliged to take shelter at Eimeo. Several canoes had been lost lately in their passage to or from Tethuroa. 
The oversetting of their canoes is not the only risk they have to encounter, but is productive of another danger more dreadful, for at such times many become a prey to the sharks which are very numerous in these seas. I was informed likewise that they are sometimes attacked by a fish which by their description I imagine to be the barracuda, as they attribute to it the same propensity. Saturday passed without my seeing anything of Tina the whole day. Sunday, 8. The next morning he and Idaea came to me and assured me that they had made the strictest inquiries concerning the injury intended us, but had not been able to discover any circumstance which could lead them to suspect who were concerned in it. This was not at all satisfactory, and I behaved towards them with great coolness, at which they were much distressed, and Idaea at length gave vent to her sorrow by tears. I could no longer keep up the pretense of mistrusting them, but I earnestly recommended to them, as they valued the King of England's friendship, that they would exert their utmost endeavours to find out the offenders, which they faithfully promised. Our reconciliation accordingly took place, and messengers were sent to acquaint Oto and Tepaho'o, and to invite them to return. It has since occurred to me that this attempt to cut the ship adrift was most probably the act of some of our own people, whose purpose of remaining at Otaheite might have been effectually answered without danger if the ship had been driven on shore. At the time I entertained not the least thought of this kind, nor did the possibility of it enter into my ideas, having no suspicion that so general an inclination or so strong an attachment to these islands could prevail among my people as to induce them to abandon every prospect of returning to their native country. A messenger came to me this afternoon from the Earea of Tiarabou, the southeast division of Otaheite, with an invitation for me to visit him. I excused myself on account of the distance, and, at Tina's request, sent back by the messenger a handsome present which I hope Tina will get the credit of. I observed with much satisfaction that a great deal of what Tina had received from me he had distributed, to some out of friendship and esteem, and to others with motives of political civility. Tuesday, 10. Tapa O'o and his family left us today to go to Tihaha, where a grand Heiva was to be performed, at which their presence was required. Wednesday, 11. A small party of Heiva people passed through Opare this morning in their way to Te Taha, where they were going by appointment. They had the civility to send me word that if I chose, they would stay to perform a short Heiva before me, and I immediately attended. It began by a dance of two young girls to the music of drums and flutes, which lasted no long time. At the conclusion, they suddenly dropped all their dress, which was left as a present for me, and went off without my seeing them any more. After this, the men danced. Their performance was more indecent than any I had before seen, but was not the less applauded on that account by the natives, who seemed much delighted after this entertainment i went with tina and adea to pay a visit to an old lady named waowaora widow Tatoa, the late aarea of tetaha who conducted the expedition against aimeo when captain cook was here in seventeen seventy seven the old lady had just landed and we found her sitting on the beach by the head of her canoe with tina was a priest and three men who carried a young dog a fowl, and two young plantain boughs. These were intended for the offering, or present, called Otee. Tina and his party seated themselves about ten yards distant from Wanowoora, and were addressed by her in short sentences for a few minutes, and received her Otee, which was exactly the same as his. Tina's priest in return made a short prayer, and his offering was presented to the old lady. Tina then rose and went to her, and embraced her in a very affectionate manner, and she returned his kindness with tears and many expressions which I could not understand. Soon after he conducted her to a shed, and we remained with her till it was time to go on board to dinner. I invited her to be of the party, but she excused herself on account of age and infirmity. 
Tina gave directions for her and her attendants to be supplied with whatever they had occasion for, and we went off to the ship. Friday, 13. This forenoon Tina sent to inform me that many strangers had arrived from all parts to be present at a great heiva which he had prepared in compliment to me. I accordingly went on shore and found a great crowd of people collected together. A ring was made at a little distance from our post, and Tina and several other chiefs came to meet me. When we were all seated, the heiva began by women dancing, after which a present of cloth and a tame, or breastplate, was laid before me. This ceremony being over, the men began to wrestle, and regularity was no longer preserved. Old Oto came to me and desired I would help put a stop to the wrestling, as the people came from different districts, some of which were ill-disposed towards others. What Oto had apprehended was not without reason, for in an instant the hole was tumult, every man took to his arms, and, as I found my single interference could be of no service, I retired to our post and ordered all my people there under arms. At the time the disturbance began, Tina and Idea were absent. Their first care was for me, and Idea came to see if I was safe at the post. She had a double covering of cloth round her, and her waist was girded with a large rope. I desired her to stay under my protection. This she would not consent to, but said she would return as soon as all was over, and away she went. I immediately gave orders for two guns to be fired from the ship without shot, which had a good effect, and as no chief was concerned in the tumult, but on the contrary all of them exerted their influence to prevent mischief, everything was soon quiet, and Tina and Idea returned to let me know all was settled. They went on board with some other chiefs and dined with me. After dinner I went on shore with Tina and his friends, and I found three large hogs dressed, and a quantity of breadfruit which he had ordered to be prepared before he went on board, and now desired I would present them to the different parties that had come to see the entertainment. One to the chief people of Atahooroo, one to the Areoos, and a third to the performers of the Heiva. I presented them according to his directions, and they were received with thankfulness and pleasure. This I looked upon as very handsomely done on the part of Tina, and I was glad to see it was regarded in the same light by his guests. These instances of liberality make full amends for the little slips which I have formerly noticed in Tina. At this time, a day seldom passed that he did not give proofs of his hospitality by entertaining the principal people that came from different parts of the island to visit him, or to see the ship. Some of the chiefs he commonly invited to dine on board, and made provisions for others on shore. Scarce any person of consequence went away without receiving some present from him. This I encouraged, and was glad it was in my power to assist him. But besides the political motives that I have alluded to, it would be unjust to Tina not to acknowledge that his disposition seemed improved, he was more open and unreserved in his manners than formerly, and his hospitality was natural and without ostentation. Monday, 16. I was present this afternoon at a wrestling match by women. The manner of challenging and method of attack was exactly the same as among the men. The only difference that I could observe was not in favor of the softer sex, for in these contests they showed less temper and more animosity than I could have imagined them capable of. The women, I was told, not only wrestle with each other, but sometimes with the men. Of this I have never seen an instance, and imagine it can happen but seldom, as the women in general are small and by no means masculine. Idea is said to be very famous at this exercise. Tuesday, 17. I walked with Tina towards the hills to see his country residence, which was at a very neat house, pleasantly situated and surrounded with plantations. From this place we saw the island Tetharoa. The next morning I went to Mataavi to look after the Indian corn, which I judged would be full ripe for gathering, but on my arrival I found that the natives had been beforehand with me, the whole being taken away. 
This I was not at all sorry for, as it shows that they value it too much to neglect cultivating it. Monday, 23. Idea sent on board for our dinners today a very fine taro pudding, and Tina brought a bunch of bananas that weighed 81 pounds, on which were 286 fine fruit, 10 had broken off in the carriage. The taro pudding is excellent eating and easily made. I shall describe this piece of cookery, as the knowledge of it may be useful in the West Indies. The taro being cleared of the outside skin is grated down, and made up in rolls of about half a pound each, which they cover neatly with leaves, and bake for near half an hour. An equal quantity of ripe coconut meat is likewise grated, from which, through a strainer, the rich milky juice is expressed. This juice is heated by putting smooth hot stones in the vessel that contain it, and the taro is then mixed with it and kept constantly stirring to prevent burning till it is ready, which is known by the coconut juice turning to a clear oil. Wednesday, 25. Idea was very uneasy today on account of her youngest child being ill. She would not accept of assistance from our surgeon, but said she had sent to Tetaha for a man who she expected would come and tell her what to do. These physical people are called Tata Rapao. Thursday, 26. This morning a man died of consumption about two miles from our post. I was informed of it by Mr. Peckover, the gunner, who I had desired to look out for such a circumstance. I therefore went accompanied by Idea in hopes of seeing the funeral ceremony, but before we arrived the body was removed to the Toa'o. It lay bare, except a piece of cloth round the loins, and another round the neck. The eyes were closed, the hands were placed, one over the pit of the stomach, and the other upon his breast. On a finger of each hand was a ring made of plaited fibers of the coconut tree, with a small bunch of red feathers. Under the To'o'apau, a hole was dug, in which at the end of the month the corpse was to be buried. The deceased was of the lower class, the Ta'apao, however, was neat, and offerings of coconuts and plaited leaves lay on the ground. The dead are sometimes brought to the Ta'apawa in wood coffins, which are not shaped like ours, but are simply a long box. This custom, Idea informed me, they learnt from the Europeans, and is not very common, as making plank is a work of great labor. March, Monday, Two. When I landed this morning, I found the inhabitants that lived near to us had left their houses and retired towards the mountains, and was informed that in the night a water cask, part of an azimuth compass, and Mr. Peckover's bedding had been stolen from the post on shore, the knowledge of which had caused a general alarm. I sent a message to complain of this theft to Tina, who did not come near me. About two hours elapsed, during which time I went on board to breakfast, and returned when I saw Tina and Opee Paya, with a number of people at a house at some distance, and soon after they all marched to the eastward, passing close by our post. Oadee, who was with me, told me they had intelligence of the thief, and were gone in quest of him, and in less than an hour news was brought that they had taken him. Shortly after, the whole party appeared with the water cask and compass. Tina had hold of the thief by the arm, and showing him to me, desired that I would kill him. The bedding, he said, he had not heard of, but would go in search of it. I applauded him for the pains he had taken in this business, and explained with some success the injustice of stealing from us, that if any of our people committed the least offence against them it did not pass unnoticed, and that friendship required on their part that those who injured us should not be protected by them. Tina stopped me from saying more by embracing me, and the whole crowd called out Tayo Mai Tai, that is, good friend. Tina then left me to inquire after the bedding, and I sent the offender on board, whom I punished with a severe flogging. I was glad to find this man was not of Opare or Mataave. The fine fruit called Avee was just coming in the season. It was likewise in season at our arrival in October. 
The breadfruit trees, I have no doubt, bear all the year round. We have seen a scarcity of breadfruit, but have never been wholly without it. Some fern root was shown to me, which, in scarce seasons, is used by the natives as bread. It bears a long, even-edged leaf, about an inch wide, and the taste somewhat resembled that of a yam. I was informed by our people that in their walks they saw in many places patches of Indian corn just making their appearance through the ground. This convinces me that the corn taken from Mataavi could not have been better disposed of. Goats are frequently offered for sale, but I rather discourage the buying of them for fear of injuring the breed. The natives will not eat them, neither will they taste the milk, and ask with some appearance of disgust why we do not milk the sows. I endeavored to prevail on Tina and Idea to eat the goat's milk by mixing it with fruit, but they would only try one spoonful. We had begun to make preparations for sailing, and Tina supplied us with a sufficient stock of wood by ordering trees to be brought down from the country. He had frequently expressed a wish that I would leave some firearms and ammunition with him, as he expected to be attacked after the ship sailed, and perhaps chiefly on account of our partiality to him. I therefore thought it but reasonable to attend to his request, and I was the more readily prevailed on as he said his intentions were to act only on the defensive. This indeed seems most suited to his disposition, which is neither active nor enterprising. If Tina had spirit in proportion to his size and strength, he would probably be the greatest warrior in Otaheite, but courage is not the most conspicuous of his virtues. When I promised to leave with him a pair of pistols, which they prefer to muskets, he told me that Idea would fight with one, and Oedee with the other. Idea has learned to load and fire a musket with great dexterity, and Oedee is an excellent marksman. It is not common for women in this country to go to war, but Idea is a very resolute woman, of a large make, and has great bodily strength. Friday, 6. I sent Mr. Fryer, the master, to San Taone Harbor. The knowledge that we intended shortly to sail having spread among the natives, a great many broken iron tools were brought from all parts of the island to be repaired at our forge. And this morning a messenger arrived from Wahea the Aarea of Te Araboo, with several pieces of Spanish iron which he desired to have made into small adds. This request was, of course, complied with. End of chapter 10、Chapter 11 of A Voyage to the South Sea This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly Chapter 11 Arrival of an Areo woman from Tethuroa. Present delivered by Tina for His Majesty. Other occurrences to the time of the ship's departure from Otaheite. 1789, March. From the 5th to the 14th of this month, the wind blew constantly from between the northwest and southwest with a great deal of rain. This was the longest continuance of westerly winds without interruption that we experienced. On the 13th, several canoes arrived here and at Mataavi from Tethuroa, and these were a large tribe of Areos, and among them Huheine Moere, the wife of Oreepaya, who is an Areo woman, and remained at Tethuroa after Oreepaya came away. On her arrival, a ceremony was performed called Ho'oapipaa, which seemed to be designed as a public visit to all their friends who were collected for the occasion. In this ceremony, there was nothing remarkable. The Areo men took their opportunity to plunder the women who were near them, and Idea made a present of some cloth to Huheine Moere and a baked hog to the Areos. Friday, 
After this ceremony, a present was produced from many of the principal people for young Otoo, the Earee Rahie, which was received by Idea, Tina being absent. This present consisted of five hogs and forty-eight baskets filled with breadfruit, coconuts, taro, and different kinds of puddings. The baskets were decorated with slips of cloth stained with a variety of colors and carried by twenty-four men, each of whom had a pole on his shoulder, at each end of which was a basket. I have seldom spoken of Otoo, who was too young to have any share in the management of affairs, and with whom we were not permitted to have any intercourse, except speaking to him now and then across a river, at which times I did not neglect to send the children some little presents, so that they always rejoiced to see me. I might have been admitted to a nearer acquaintance if I would have gone with my shoulders uncovered, as his parents did, but this I declined. The children do not all live under the same roof, the two sisters eating and sleeping in a separate house, though at other times they are generally together. The island Tethuroa may very properly be compared to some of our watering places in England, producing a similar effect upon those who visit it. Many who went there covered with scurf returned plump and fair and scarce like the same people. This alteration for the better is in a great measure to be attributed to the discontinuance of the ava, which Tethuroa does not produce. The coconut trees, likewise, which supply them with their only beverage, growing on low sandy keys and having their roots below the level of the sea, may probably have qualities different from the coconuts of Otaheite, which, with a plenty of fish, that at other times they are not accustomed to, must no doubt contribute to the amendment described. Saturday, 14. I was visited today by a very old man, an uncle to Tupia, the person who went from these islands in the Endeavour in the year 1769 and who died at Batavia. He appeared to be near seventy years old and was treated with much respect by the natives. He made several inquiries concerning his nephew and requested that when I came again I would bring his hair. At the time that Tina mentioned to me his desire of visiting England, I asked what account I could give to his friends if he should not live to return, to which he replied that I must cut off his hair and carry it to them, and they would be perfectly satisfied. Monday, 16. On the 16th I was informed that a stop was put to the sale of hogs in the district of Te Taha. Te Pahoo, the Aare of that district told me that they had very few hogs left there and that it was necessary for a certain time to prohibit every person from killing or selling that they might have time to breed i did not think it reasonable to solicit any indulgence on this head my friends at mataavi and opare promised to supply us as long as we remained there though we had considerably thinned their stock after our departure the same restriction was to take place in these districts and it being delayed on our account certainly deserves to be regarded among their acts of friendship towards us as it was generally known that we were preparing to sail a number of the natives from other parts of the island were constantly with us and petty thefts were committed whenever the negligence of our people afforded an opportunity but no attempt of any consequence was made. Thursday, 19. This evening Mr. Samwell, my clerk, returned from an excursion to the mountains, having been two days absent. He described the hills to be well clothed with wood, except the tops of the higher mountains which only produced bushes and fern. The birds he saw were blue parakeets and green doves, except one which he found burrowing in the ground and brought to me. This bird was about the size of a pigeon, and proved to be a white-bellied petrel of the same kind as those seen in high latitudes, which are called shearwaters. He likewise brought a branch of a plant, like the New Zealand tea plant, and which at Van Diemen's Land we had made use of for brooms. From the hills he saw the islands Maitea and Huaeine, which are situated nearly 
in opposite directions from Otaheite and are seventy leagues distant from each other. Friday, 27. For some days past, Tina had been busied in getting two paais, or morning dresses, made, which he intended as a present to King George. Being finished, they were this morning hung up in his house as a public exhibition, and a long prayer was made on the occasion, the substance of which was that the King of England might forever remain his friend and not forget him. When he presented the pa raiz for me to take on board, he could not refrain from shedding tears. During the short remainder of our stay here, there appeared among the natives an evident degree of sorrow that we were so soon to leave them, which they showed by unusual kindness and attention. We began this afternoon to remove the plants to the ship. They were in excellent order, the roots had appeared through the bottom of the pots and would have shot into the ground if care had not been taken to prevent it. The weather was considerably altered for the better, and a trade wind appeared settled. The rainy and bad season of the year may be reckoned to begin towards the end of November, and continue till near the end of March. During this time the winds are variable and often westerly, though we have seldom found them to blow strong in that direction. We likewise experienced frequent intervals of fine weather, but during these months so open a road as Mataavi Bay is not a safe anchoring place for ships that intend remaining any length of time at Otaheite. Tuesday, 31. Today all the plants were on board, being in 774 pots, 39 tubs, and 24 boxes. The number of breadfruit plants were 1,015, besides which we had collected a number of other plants. The Ave, which is one of the finest flavored fruits in the world. The Ea, which is a fruit not so rich, but of a fine flavor and very refreshing. The Rata, not much unlike a chestnut, which grows on a large tree in great quantities. They are singly in large pods from one to two inches broad, and may be eaten raw or boiled in the same manner of Windsor beans, and so dressed are equally good. The Oraia, which is a very superior kind of plantain. All these I was particularly recommended to collect by my worthy friend, Sir Joseph Banks. I had also taken on board some plants of the Eto and Mate, with which the natives here make a beautiful red color, and a root called Pea, of which they make an excellent pudding. I now made my last presents to several of my friends with whom I had been most intimate, particularly to Te Pahao. Several people expressed great desire to go with us to England. Oedee, who was always very much attached to us, said he considered it as his right, having formerly left his native place to sail with Captain Cook. Scarce any man belonging to the ship was without a tayo, who brought to him presents, chiefly of provisions for a sea store. April, Friday, 3. Tina and his wife, with his parents, brothers, and sister, dined with me today, and, as I meant to sail early the next morning, they all remained on board for the night. The ship was crowded the whole day with natives, and we were loaded with coconuts, plantains, breadfruit, hogs, and goats. In the evening there was no dancing or mirth on the beach such as we had been accustomed to, but all was silent. Saturday, 4. At daylight we unmoored. The stock of the best bower anchor was so much eaten by the worms that it broke in stowing the anchor. The small bower had an iron stock, and in these voyages it is very necessary that ships should be provided with iron anchor stocks. At half past six, there being no wind, we weighed, and with our boats and two sweeps, towed the ship out of the harbor. Soon after, the sea breeze came, and we stood off towards the sea. The outlet of Toaroa Harbor being narrow, I could permit only a few of the natives to be on board. Many others, however, attended in canoes till the breeze came, when I was obliged to leave them. We stood off and on almost all the remainder of the day. Tina and Idea pressed me very strongly to anchor in Mataavi Bay and stay one night longer, but, as I had already taken leave of most of my friends, I thought it better to keep to my intention of sailing. 
After dinner I ordered the presents which I had preserved for Tina and his wife to be put in one of the ship's boats, and as I had promised him firearms, I gave him two muskets, a pair of pistols, and a good stock of ammunition. I then represented to them the necessity of their going away, that the boat might return to the ship before it was dark, on which they took a most affectionate leave of me and went into the boat. One of their expressions at parting was, Yo o ra no ta e a to a te e a ve a ra. May the e a tua protect you forever and ever. All the time we remained at Otaheite, the picture of Captain Cook at the desire of Tina was kept on board the ship. On delivering it to him, I wrote on the back the time of the ship's arrival and departure with an account of the number of plants on board. Tina had desired that I would salute him at his departure with the great guns, which I could not comply with for fear of disturbing the plants, but as a parting token of our regard we manned ship with all hands and gave him three cheers. At sunset the boat returned and we made sail, bidding farewell to Otaheite, where for twenty-three weeks we had been treated with the utmost affection and regard, and which seemed to increase in proportion to our stay. That we were not insensible to their kindness, the events which followed more than sufficiently proves. For to the friendly and endearing behavior of these people may be ascribed the motives for that event which effected the ruin of an expedition that there was every reason to hope would have been completed in the most fortunate manner. To enter into a description of the island or its inhabitants I look upon as superfluous. From the accounts of former voyages and the facts which I have related, the character of the people will appear in as true a light as by any description in my power to give. The length of time that we remained at Otaheite, with the advantage of having been there before, gave me opportunities of making perhaps a more perfect vocabulary of the language than has yet appeared but i have chosen to defer it for the present as there is a probability that i may hereafter be better qualified for such a task we left otaheite with only two patients in the venereal list which shows that the disease has not gained ground the natives say it is of little consequence and we saw several instances of people that had been affected who after absenting themselves for fifteen or twenty days made their appearance again without any visible symptom remaining of the disease their method of cure i am unacquainted with but their customary diet and mode of living must contribute towards it we saw a great many people however with scrofulous habits and bad sores these they denied to be produced from any venereal cause and our surgeon was of the same opinion the result of the mean of fifty sets of lunar observations taken by me on shore gives the longitude of point venus two hundred ten degrees thirty three minutes fifty seven seconds east captain cook in seventeen sixty nine places it in two hundred ten degrees twenty seven minutes thirty seconds east in seventeen seventy seven his last voyage two hundred ten degrees twenty two minutes twenty eight seconds east the tide in the toa roa harbour was very inconsiderable and not regular the greatest rise that i observed was eleven inches but what was most singular the time of high water did not appear to be governed by the moon it being at the highest every day between noon and two o'clock the variable winds and weather at this time of the year has no doubt an influence on the tides on some days scarce any rise was perceptible end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of a voyage to the south sea this librivox recording is in the public domain a voyage to the south sea by william bly chapter twelve at the island Eaheine, a friend of Omai visits the ship, leave the Society Islands, a water spout, the island Waitootake discovered, anchor in Anamaoka Road, our parties on shore robbed by the natives, 
sail from Anna Mooka, the chiefs detained on board, part friendly. 1789. April. Sunday, 5. We steered towards the island Haoheene, which we got sight of the next morning. At noon we brought to near the entrance of Ohare Harbor, it not being my intention to anchor. We could see every part of the harbor distinctly, but my attention was particularly directed to the spot where Oma'i's house had stood, no part of which was now visible. It was near three o'clock before any canoes came off to us, for the people on shore imagined that the ship was coming into the harbor. The first that arrived had three men in it, who brought a few coconuts. I inquired about the chief, or Aarea Rahe'e, and one of the fellows with great gravity said he was the Aarea Rahe'e, and that he had come to desire I would bring the ship into harbor. I could not help laughing at his impudence, however I gave him a few nails for his coconuts, and he left us. Immediately after a double canoe in which were ten men came alongside, among them was a young man who recollected and called me by my name. Several other canoes arrived with hogs, yams, and other provisions which we purchased. My acquaintance told me he had lived with our friend Oma'i. He confirmed the account that had already been given, and informed me that of all the animals which had been left with Oma'i, the mare only remained alive. He said that Oma'i and himself had often rowed together, and I observed that many of the islanders who came on board had the representation of a man on horseback tattooed on their legs. After the death of Oma'i, his house was broken to pieces and the materials stolen. The firearms were at Uli Aitea, but useless. I inquired after the seeds and plants, and was informed that they were all destroyed except one tree, but of what kind that was I could not make out from their description. I was much pressed to take the ship into the harbor, and Oma'i's companion requested me to let him go to England. When they found out that I would not stop among them, they seemed jealous of our going to Uli Aitea, and it appeared to give them some satisfaction when I told them that I should not go near that island. The canoes had left us, and we were making sail when we discovered an Indian in the water swimming towards the shore, which in all probability he would not have been able to reach. We took him up, and luckily another canoe coming alongside, we put him in her. The people of the canoe said that the man was insane, but how he came to be swimming so far from the land we could not conjecture. At six o'clock we made sail and ran all night to the southwest and southwest by south, between the islands Huaheene and Uliatea. The next morning I altered the course, steering more to the southwest for the friendly islands. Thursday, 9 on the ninth at nine o'clock in the morning the weather became squally and a body of thick black clouds collected in the east soon after a water spout was seen at no great distance from us which appeared to great advantage from the darkness of the clouds behind it as nearly as i could judge it was about two feet diameter at the upper part and about eight inches at the lower I had scarcely made these remarks when I observed that it was advancing rapidly towards the ship. We immediately altered our course and took in all the sails except the foresail, soon after which it passed within ten yards of our stern, making a rustling noise but without our feeling the least effect from it being so near us. The rate at which it travelled I judged to be about ten miles per hour, going towards the west in the direction of the wind. In a quarter of an hour after passing us, it dispersed. I was never so near a water spout before. The connection between the column, which was higher than our mastheads, and the water below was no otherwise visible than by the sea being disturbed in a circular space of about six yards in diameter, the center of which, from the whirling of the water around it, formed a hollow and from the outer part of the circle the water was thrown up with much force in a spiral direction and could be traced to the height of fifteen or twenty feet at this elevation we lost sight of it and could see nothing of its junction with the column above 
it is impossible to say what injury we should have suffered if it had passed directly over us masts i imagine might have been carried away but i do not apprehend it would have endangered the loss of a ship saturday eleven as we sailed very near the track made in former voyages i had little reason to expect that we should at this time make any new discovery nevertheless on the eleventh at daylight land was seen to the south-southwest at about five leagues distance which appeared to be an island of a moderate height on the north part was a round hill the northwest part was highest and steep the southeast part sloped off to a low point the wind had been westerly since the preceding noon and at the time we saw the island the ship was standing to the northwest at six we tacked to the southward and as we advanced in that direction discovered a number of low keys of which at noon we counted nine they were all covered with trees the large island first seen had a most fruitful appearance its shore being bordered with flat land on which grew innumerable coconut and other trees and the higher grounds beautifully interspersed with lawns the wind being light and unfavorable we endeavored all day but without success to get near the land in the night we had a heavy squall which obliged us to clew up all our sails and soon after it fell calm Sunday twelve the winds were light and variable all day with calms at two in the afternoon we were within three miles of the southernmost key and could see a number of people within the reefs shortly after a canoe in which were four men paddled off to us and came alongside without showing any signs of apprehension or surprise i gave them a few beads and they came into the ship one man who seemed to have an ascendancy over the others looked about the ship with some appearance of curiosity but none of them would venture to go below they asked for some boiled fresh pork which they saw in a bowl belonging to one of the seamen and it was given to them to eat with boiled plantains being told that i was the aare or chief of the ship the principal person came and joined noses with me and presented to me a large mother-of-pearl shell which hung with plaited hair round his neck this he fastened round my neck with signs of great satisfaction they spoke the same language as at otaheite with very little variation as far as i could judge in the small vocabulary that i made whilst conversing with these men only four words out of twenty-four differed from the otaheite the name of the large island they told me was watootake and the aorae was called lomakaya they said there were no hogs dogs or goats upon the island nor had they yams or taro but that plantains coconuts fowls breadfruit and aves were there in great abundance notwithstanding they said that no hogs were on the island it was evident they had seen such animals for they called them by the same name as is given to them at otaheite which made me suspect that they were deceiving me however i ordered a young boar and sow to be put into their canoe with some yams and taro as we could afford to part with some of these articles i also gave to each of them a knife a small adze some nails beads and a looking-glass the latter they examined with great curiosity but with the ironwork they appeared to be acquainted calling it aourae which is the common name for iron among the islands where it is known as they were preparing to leave us the chief of the canoe took possession of everything that i had given to the others one of them showed some signs of dissatisfaction but after a little altercation they joined noses and were reconciled i now thought they were going to leave the ship but only two of them went into the canoe the other two proposing to stay all night with us and to have the canoe return for them in the morning i would have treated their confidence with the regard it merited but it was impossible to say how far the ship might be driven from the island in the night this i explained to them and they reluctantly consented to leave us they were very solicitous that somebody from the ship should go on shore with them and just before they quitted us they gave me a wooden spear which was the only thing the paddles accepted they had brought with them in the canoe it was a common long staff pointed with toa wood 
the island of Waitootake, is about ten miles in circuit, its latitude from eighteen degrees fifty minutes to eighteen degrees fifty four minutes south, and longitude two hundred degrees nineteen minutes east. A group of small keys, eight in number, lie to the southeast, four or five miles distance from Waitootake, and a single one to the west southwest. The southernmost of the group is in latitude 18 degrees 58 minutes south. Variation of the compass 8 degrees 14 minutes east. The people that came off to us did not differ in appearance from the natives of Hervey's Islands, seen in Captain Cook's last voyage, though much more friendly and inoffensive in their manner. They were tattooed across the arms and legs, but not on the loins or posteriors like the people of Otaheite from their knowledge of iron they have doubtless communication with hervey's islands which are not more than eighteen leagues distant from them in the night a breeze sprang up from the south and we continued our course to the westward saturday eighteen on the eighteenth at sunset we saw savage island and in the night passed by to the southward of it tuesday twenty one at eleven o'clock in the forenoon on the twenty-first we saw the island Kao from the masthead, bearing northwest by west, three-quarters west. This island is a high mountain with a sharp-pointed top, and is the northwesternmost of all the friendly islands. At noon we saw it very distinctly from the deck, it being then nineteen leagues distant from us. Thursday, twenty-three the wind being to the southward we could not fetch ana mokoa at which island i intended to stop before the evening of the twenty third when we anchored in the road in twenty three fathoms the extremes of ana mokoa bearing east by north and south by east our distance from the shore being half a league in the middle of the day a canoe had come off to us from the island mango in which was a chief named latoomei lange who dined with me immediately on our anchoring several canoes came alongside with yams and coconuts but none of the natives offered to come on board without first asking permission as yet i had seen no person with whom i could recollect to have been formerly acquainted I made inquiries after some of our old friends, particularly the chiefs, but I found myself not sufficiently master of the language to obtain the information I wanted. Friday, 24. Our station being inconvenient for watering, at daylight we weighed, and worked more to the eastward where we anchored in twenty-one fathoms, the extremes of Anamaooka, bearing north eighty-five degrees east and south thirty-three degrees west, the sandy bay south seventy-three degrees east, our distance from the shore half a league. Sounded all round the ship and found the ground to be a coarse coral bottom, but with even soundings. By this time some large sailing canoes were arrived from different islands, in the neighborhood of Anamooka, and an old lame man named Tepa, whom I had known in 1777, and immediately recollected, came on board. Two other chiefs, whose names were Nooka-Boo and Kunokapo, were with him. Tepa, having formerly been accustomed to our manner of speaking their language, I found I could converse with him tolerably well. He informed me that Poolaho, Feeno, and Tubo were alive and at Tangataboo, and that they would come hither as soon as they heard of our arrival, of which he promised to send them immediate notice. He said the cattle which we left at Tangataboo had all bred, and that the old ones were yet living. He inquired after several people who were here with Captain Cook. Being desirous to see the ship, I took him and his companions below, and showed them the breadfruit and other plants, at seeing which they were greatly surprised. I made each of them a present, and when they had satisfied their curiosity, I invited them to go on shore with me in the ship's boat. I took Nelson with me to procure some breadfruit plants, one of our stock being dead, and two or three others a little sickly. When we landed there were about two hundred people on the beach, most of them women and children. 
Tepa showed me a large boat house which he told me we might make use of, thinking we should have a party on shore as our ships had formerly. I went with him in search of water, but could find no better place than where Captain Cook had watered, which is a quarter of a mile inland from the east end of the beach. I next walked to the west point of the bay, where some plants and seeds had been sown by Captain Cook, and had the satisfaction to see in a plantation close by about twenty fine pineapple plants, but no fruit, this not being the proper season. They told me they had eaten many of them, that they were fine and large, and that at Tonga Taboo there were great numbers. When I returned to the landing place I was desired to sit down, and a present was brought me which consisted of some bundles of coconuts only. This fell short of my expectations, however I appeared satisfied, and distributed beads and trinkets to the women and children near me. Numerous were the marks of mourning with which these people disfigure themselves, such as bloody temples, their heads deprived of most of the hair, and what was worse, almost all of them with the loss of some of their fingers. Several fine boys, not above six years old, had lost both their little fingers, and some of the men besides these had parted with the middle finger of the right hand. The chiefs went off with me to dinner, and I found a brisk trade carrying on at the ship for yams. Some plantains and breadfruit were likewise brought on board, but no hogs. In the afternoon more sailing canoes arrived, some of which contained not less than ninety passengers. We purchased eight hogs, some dogs, fowls, and shaddocks. Yams were in great abundance, very fine and large. One yam weighed above forty-five pounds. Among the people that came this afternoon were two of the name Tubal, which is a family of the first distinction among the friendly islands. One of them was chief of the island Lefuoaga. With him and Tepa I went on shore to see the wooding place. I found a variety of sizable trees, but the kind with which I principally pitched upon was the Barentonia of Foster. I acquainted Tepa with my intention of sending people to cut wood, which, meeting with his approbation, we parted. Saturday, 25. On the 25th at daylight, the wooding and watering parties went on shore. I had directed them not to cut the kind of tree. Footnote. Exocaria agalocha, Lynn S.P. P.L. Called in the Malay language, Kaja Mata Buta, which signifies the tree that wounds the eyes. End of footnote. Which, when Captain Cook wooded here in 1777, blinded for a time many of the woodcutters. They had not been an hour on shore before one man had an axe stolen from him and another an adze. Tepa was applied to who got the axe restored, but the adze was not recovered. In the evening we completed wooding. Sunday, 26. In the morning Nelson went on shore to get a few plants, but no principal chief being among the people, he was insulted and a spade taken from him. A ship's grapple was likewise stolen from the watering party. Taper recovered the spade for us, but the crowd of natives was become so great by the number of canoes that had arrived from different islands, that it was impossible to do anything where there was such a multitude of people without a chief of sufficient authority to command the whole. I therefore ordered the watering party to go on board and determined to sail, for I could not discover that any canoe had been sent to acquaint the chiefs of Tangotabo'o of our being here. For some time after the thefts were committed, the chiefs kept away, but before noon they came on board. At noon we unmoored, and at one o'clock got under sail. The two tubos, Kuno Kapo, Latoomai Lang, and another chief were on board, and I acquainted them that unless the grapple was returned they must remain in the ship. They were surprised and not a little alarmed. Canoes were immediately dispatched after the grapple, which I was informed could not possibly be brought to the ship before the next day, as those who had stolen it immediately sailed with their prize to another island. Nevertheless, I detained them till sunset, when their uneasiness and impatience increased to such a degree 
that they began to beat themselves about the face and eyes, and some of them cried bitterly. As this distress was more than the grapple was worth, and I had no reason to imagine that they were privy to or in any manner connected in the theft, I could not think of detaining them any longer and called their canoes alongside. I then told them they were at liberty to go, and made each of them a present of a hatchet, a saw, with some knives, gimblets, and nails. This unexpected present, and the sudden change in their situation, affected them not less with joy than they had before been with apprehension. They were unbounded in their acknowledgments, and I have little doubt but that we parted better friends than if the affair had never happened. We stood to the northward all night with light winds. Monday, 27. And on the next day, the 27th at noon, were between the islands Tofoa and Kotoo. Latitude observed 19 degrees, 18 minutes south. Thus far the voyage had advanced in a course of uninterrupted prosperity, and had been attended with many circumstances equally pleasing and satisfactory. A very different scene was now to be experienced. A conspiracy had been formed which was to render all our past labor productive only of extreme misery and distress. The means had been concerted and prepared with so much secrecy and circumspection that no one circumstance appeared to occasion the smallest suspicion of the impending calamity. End of chapter 12「The wind being northerly in the evening, we steered to the westward to pass to the south of Tofoya. I gave directions for this course to be continued during the night. The master had the first watch, the gunner the middle watch, and Mr. Christian the morning watch. This was the turn of duty for the night. Tuesday, 28. Just before sunrising, while I was yet asleep, Mr. Christian, with the master at arms, gunner's mate, and Thomas Burkett, seaman, came into my cabin, and seizing me, tied my hands with a cord behind my back, threatening me with instant death if I spoke or made the least noise. I, however, called as loud as I could in hopes of assistance, but they had already secured the officers who were not of their party by placing sentinels at their doors. There were three men at my cabin door besides the four within, Christian had only a cutlass in his hand, the others had muskets and bayonets. I was hauled out of bed and forced on deck in my shirt, suffering great pain from the tightness with which they had tied my hands. I demanded the reason of such violence, but received no other answer than abuse for not holding my tongue. The master, the gunner, the surgeon, Mr. Elphinstone, master's mate, and Nelson were kept confined below, and the fore hatchway was guarded by sentinels. The boatswain and carpenter, and also the clerk, Mr. Samuel, were allowed to come upon deck, where they saw me standing abaft the mizzenmast, with my hands tied behind my back under a guard, with Christian at their head. The boatswain was ordered to hoist the launch out with a threat, if he did not do it instantly, to take care of himself. When the boat was out, Mr. Hayward and Mr. Hallett, two of the midshipmen, and Mr. Samuel were ordered into it. I demanded what their intention was in giving this order, and, and endeavored to persuade the people near me not to persist in such acts of violence, but it was to no effect. Hold your tongue, sir, or you are dead this instant, was constantly repeated to me. The master by this time had sent to request that he might come on deck, which was permitted, but he was soon ordered back again to his cabin. I continued my endeavors to turn the tide of affairs, when Christian changed the cutlass which he had in his hand for a bayonet that was brought to him, and, 
holding me with a strong grip by the cord that tied my hands he with many oaths threatened to kill me immediately if i would not be quiet the villains round me had their pieces cocked and bayonets fixed particular people were called on to go into the boat and were hurried over the side whence i concluded that with these people i was to be set adrift i therefore made another effort to bring about a change but with no other effect than to be threatened with having my brains blown out the boatswain and seamen who were to go in the boat were allowed to collect twine canvas lines sails cordage and eight and twenty gallon cask of water and mr samuel got one hundred fifty pounds of bread with a small quantity of rum and wine also a quadrant and compass but he was forbidden on pain of death to touch either map ephemeris book of astronomical observations sextant timekeeper or any of my surveys or drawings the mutineers having forced those of the seamen who they meant to get rid of into the boat christian directed a dram to be served to each of his own crew i then unhappily saw that nothing could be done to effect the recovery of the ship there was no one to assist me and every endeavour on my part was answered with threats of death the officers were next called upon deck and forced over the side into the boat while i was kept apart from every one abaft the mizzenmast christian armed with a bayonet holding me by the bandage that secured my hands the guard round me had their pieces cocked but on my daring the ungrateful wretches to fire they uncocked them isaac martin one of the guards over me i saw had an inclination to assist me and as he fed me with shaddock my lips being quite parched we explained our wishes to each other by our looks but this being observed martin was removed from me he then attempted to leave the ship for which purpose he got into the boat but with many threats they obliged him to return the armourer joseph coleman and two of the carpenters mackintosh and norman were also kept contrary to their inclination they begged of me after i was astern in the boat to remember that they had declared they had no hand in the transaction michael byrne i am told likewise wanted to leave the ship it is of no moment for me to recount my endeavours to bring back the offenders to a sense of their duty all i could do was by speaking to them in general but it was to no purpose for i was kept securely bound and no one except the guard suffered to come near me to mr samuel i am indebted for securing my journals and commission with some material ship papers without these i had nothing to certify what i had done and my honour and character might have been suspected without my possessing a proper document to have defended them all this he did with great resolution though guarded and strictly watched he attempted to save the timekeeper in a box with my surveys drawings and remarks for fifteen years past which were numerous when he was hurried away with damn your eyes you are well off to get what you have it appeared to me that christian was for some time in doubt whether he should keep the carpenter or his mates at length he determined on the latter and the carpenter was ordered into the boat he was permitted but not without some opposition to take his tool chest much altercation took place among the mutinous crew during the whole business some swore i'll be damned if he does not find his way home if he gets anything with him meaning me and when the carpenter's chest was carrying away damn my eyes he will have a vessel built in a month while others laughed at the helpless situation of the boat being very deep and so little room for those who were in her as for christian he seemed as if meditating destruction on himself and every one else i asked for arms but they laughed at me and said i was well acquainted with the people among whom i was going and therefore did not want them four cutlasses however were thrown into the boat after we were veered astern the officers and men being in the boat they only waited for me of which the master-at-arms informed christian who then said come captain bligh your officers and men are now in the boat and you must go with them if you attempt to make the least resistance you will instantly be put to death and without further ceremony with a tribe of armed ruffians about me i was forced over the side where they untied my hands 
Being in the boat, we were veered astern by a rope. A few pieces of pork were thrown to us, and some clothes, also the cutlasses I have already mentioned. It was then that the armorer and carpenter called out to me to remember that they had no hand in the transaction. After having undergone a great deal of ridicule, and being kept some time to make sport for these unfeeling wretches, we were at length cast adrift in the open ocean. I had with me in the boat the following persons. John Fryer, Master. Thomas Ledward, Acting Surgeon. David Nelson, Botanist. William Peckover, Gunner. William Cole, Boatswain. William Purcell, Carpenter. William Elphinston, Master's Mate. Thomas Hayward, John Howlett, Midshipman. John Norton, Peter Linkletter, Quartermasters. Lawrence Lebejeau, Sailmaker. John Smith, Thomas Hall, Cooks. George Simpson, Quartermaster's Mate. Robert Tinkler, A Boy. Robert Lamb, Butcher. Mr. Samuel, Clerk. There remained on board the bounty Fletcher Christian, Master's Mate. Peter Haywood, Edward Young, George Stewart, Midshipman. Charles Churchill, Master at Arms. John Mills, Gunner's Mate. James Morrison, Boatswain's Mate. Thomas Burkett, Matthew Quintal, John Sumner, John Millward, William McCoy, Henry Hillbrand, Michael Brin, William Muspratt, Alexander Smith, John Williams, Thomas Ellison, Isaac Martin, Richard Skinner, Matthew Thompson, Abel Seaman, William Brown, Gardener, Joseph Coleman, Armorer, Charles Norman, Carpenter's Mate, Thomas McIntosh, Carpenter's Crew, in all twenty-five hands and the most able men of the ship's company. Having little or no wind, we rode pretty fast towards Tafoya, which bore northeast about ten leagues from us. While the ship was in sight, she steered to the west-northwest, but I considered this only as a feint, for when we were sent away, huzzah for Otaheite was frequently heard among the mutineers. Christian, the chief of the mutineers, is of a respectable family in the north of England. This was the third voyage he had made with me, and, as I found it necessary to keep my ship's company at three watches, I had given him an order to take charge of the third, his abilities being thoroughly equal to the task, and by this means the master and gunner were not at watch and watch. Haywood is also of a respectable family in the north of England, and a young man of abilities as well as Christian. These two had been objects of my particular regard and attention, and I had taken great pains to instruct them, having entertained hopes that as professional men they would have become a credit to their country. Young was well recommended, and had the look of an able, stout seaman. He, however, fell short of what his appearance promised. Stuart was a young man of credible parents in the Orkneys, at which place on the return of the resolution from the South Seas in 1780, we received so many civilities that on that account only I should gladly have taken him with me. But, independent of this recommendation, he was a seaman and had always borne a good character. Notwithstanding the roughness with which I was treated, the remembrance of past kindnesses produced some signs of remorse in Christian. When they were forcing me out of the ship, I asked him if this treatment was a proper return for the many instances he had received of my friendship. He appeared disturbed at my question and answered with much emotion, That, Captain Bly, is the thing. I am in hell. I am in hell. As soon as I had time to reflect, I felt an inward satisfaction which prevented any depression of my spirits, Conscious of my integrity and anxious solicitude for the good of the service in which I had been engaged, I found my mind wonderfully supported, and I began to conceive hopes, notwithstanding so heavy a calamity, that I should one day be able to account to my king and country for the misfortune. A few hours before my situation had been particularly flattering. 
I had a ship in the most perfect order, and well stored with every necessary both for service and health. By early attention to those particulars I had as much as lay in my power, provided against any accident, in case I could not get through Endeavour Straits, as well as against what might befall me in them. Add to this the plants had been successfully preserved in the most flourishing state, so that upon the whole the voyage was two-thirds completed, and the remaining part to all appearances in a very promising way, every person on board being in perfect health, to establish which was ever amongst the principal objects of my intention. It will very naturally be asked, what could be the reason for such a revolt? An answer to which I can only conjecture that the mutineers had flattered themselves with the hopes of a more happy life among the Otaheitians than they could possibly enjoy in England, and this, joined to some female connections, most probably occasioned the whole transaction. The women at Otaheite are handsome, mild, and cheerful in their manners and conversation, possessed of great sensibility, and have sufficient delicacy to make them admired and beloved. The chiefs were so much attached to our people that they rather encouraged their stay among them than otherwise, and even made them promises of large possessions under these and many other attendant circumstances equally desirable it is now perhaps not so much to be wondered at though scarcely possible to have been foreseen that a set of sailors most of them void of connections should be led away especially when in addition to such powerful inducements they imagined it in their power to fix themselves in the midst of plenty on one of the finest islands in the world where they need not labour and where the allurements of dissipation are beyond anything that can be conceived the utmost however that any commander could have supposed to have happened is that some of the people would have been tempted to desert but if it should be asserted that a commander is to guard against an act of mutiny and piracy in his own ship more than by the common rules of service it is as much to say that he must sleep locked up and when awake be girded with pistols Desertions have happened more or less from most of the ships that have been at the Society Islands, but it has always been in the commander's power to make the chiefs return their people. The knowledge, therefore, that it was unsafe to desert, perhaps first led mine to consider with what ease so small a ship might be surprised, and that so favourable an opportunity would never offer to them again. The secrecy of this mutiny is beyond all conception. Thirteen of the party who were with me had always lived forward among the seamen, yet neither they nor the messmates of Christian, Stuart, Hayward, and Young had ever observed any circumstances that made them in the least suspect what was going on. To such a close-planned act of villainy, my mind being entirely free from any suspicion, it is not wonderful that I fell a sacrifice. Perhaps if there had been marines on board, a sentinel at my cabin door might have prevented it, for I slept with the door always open that the officer of the watch might have access to me on all occasions, the possibility of such a conspiracy being ever the farthest from my thoughts. Had their mutiny been occasioned by any grievances, either real or imaginary, I must have discovered symptoms of their discontent which would have put me on my guard but the case was far otherwise. Christian in particular I was on the most friendly terms with. That very day he was engaged to have dined with me, and the preceding night he excused himself from supping with me on the pretense of being unwell, for which I felt concerned, having no suspicions of his integrity or honour. End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of a Voyage to the South Sea This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly Chapter fourteen Proceed in the launch to the island Tafoya. Difficulty in obtaining supplies there. Treacherous attack of the natives. Escape to sea and bear away for New Holland. 1789. April my first determination was to seek a supply of breadfruit and water at Tafoya, and afterwards to sail for Tonga Taboo 
and there risk a solicitation to Poulaho, the king, to equip our boat and grant us a supply of water and provisions, so as to enable us to reach the East Indies. The quantity of provisions I found in the boat was 150 pounds of bread, 16 pieces of pork, each piece weighing 2 pounds, 6 quarts of rum, 6 bottles of wine, with 28 gallons of water, and 4 empty barracoas. Fortunately, it was calm all the afternoon till about 4 o'clock, when we were so far to windward that, with a moderate easterly breeze which sprung up, we were able to sail. It was nevertheless dark when we got to Tofoa, where I expected to land, but the shore proved to be so steep and rocky that we were obliged to give up all thoughts of it and keep the boat under the lee of the island with two oars, for there was no anchorage. Having fixed on this mode of proceeding for the night, I served to every person half a pint of grog, and each took to his rest as well as our unhappy situation would allow. Wednesday, 29 in the morning at dawn of day we rode along shore in search of a landing place and about ten o'clock we discovered a cove with a stony beach at the northwest part of the island where i dropped the grapple within twenty yards of the rocks a great surf ran on the shore but as i was unwilling to diminish our stock of provisions i landed mr samuel and some others who climbed the cliffs and got into the country to search for supplies the rest of us remained at the cove not discovering any other way into the country than that by which mr samuel had proceeded it was great consolation to me to find that the spirits of my people did not sink notwithstanding our miserable and almost hopeless situation towards noon mr samuel returned with a few quarts of water which he had found in holes but he had met with no spring or any prospect of a sufficient supply in that particular and had seen only the signs of inhabitants as it was uncertain what might be our future necessities i only issued a morsel of bread and a glass of wine to each person for dinner i observed the latitude of this cove to be nineteen degrees forty one minutes south this is the northwest part of Tafoya, the northwesternmost of the friendly islands. The weather was fair, but the wind blew so strong from the east southeast that we could not venture to sea. Our detention made it absolutely necessary to endeavor to obtain something towards our support, for I was determined, if possible, to keep our first stock entire. We therefore weighed and rowed along shore to see if anything could be got, and at last discovered some coconut trees but they were on top of high precipices and the surf made a dangerous landing both one and the other however we got the better of some of the people with much difficulty climbed the cliffs and got about twenty coconuts and others flung them to ropes by which we hauled them through the surf into the boat this was all that could be done here and as i found no place so safe as the one we had left to spend the night at i returned to the cove and having served a coconut to each person we went to rest again in the boat thursday thirty at daylight we attempted to put to sea but the wind and weather proved so bad that i was glad to return to our former station where after issuing a morsel of bread and a spoonful of rum to each person we landed and i went off with mr nelson mr samuel and some others into the country having hauled ourselves up the precipice by long vines which were fixed there by the natives for that purpose this being the only way into the country we found a few deserted huts and a small plantain walk but little taken care of from which we could collect only three small bunches of plantains after passing this place we came to a deep gully that led towards a mountain near a volcano and as i conceived that in the rainy season very great torrents of water must pass through it we hoped to find sufficient for our use remaining in some holes of the rocks but after all our search the hole that we collected was only nine gallons we advanced within two miles of the foot of the highest mountain in the island on which is the volcano that is almost constantly burning the country near it is covered with lava and has a most dreary appearance as we had not been fortunate in our discoveries and saw nothing to alleviate our distresses except the plantains and water above mentioned we returned to the boat exceedingly fatigued and faint 
when i came to the precipice whence we were to descend into the cove i was seized with such a dizziness in my head that i thought it scarce possible to effect it however by the assistance of nelson and others they at last got me down in a weak condition every person being returned by noon i gave about an ounce of pork and two plantains to each with half a glass of wine i again observed the latitude of this place nineteen degrees forty one minutes south the people who remained by the boat i directed to look for fish or what they could pick up about the rocks but nothing edible could be found so that upon the whole we considered ourselves on as miserable a spot of land as could well be imagined i could not say positively from the former knowledge i had of this island whether it was inhabited or not but i knew it was considered inferior to the other islands and i was not certain but that the indians only resorted to it at particular times i was very anxious to ascertain this point for in case there had been only a few people here and those could have furnished us with but very moderate supplies the remaining in this spot to have made preparations for our voyage would have been preferable to the risk of going amongst multitudes where perhaps we might lose everything a party therefore sufficiently strong i determined should go another route as soon as the sun became lower and they cheerfully undertook it about two in the afternoon the party set out but after suffering much fatigue they returned in the evening without any kind of success at the head of the cove about one hundred fifty yards from the waterside there was a cave the distance across the stony beach was about one hundred yards and from the country into the cove there was no other way than that which i have already described the situation secured us from the danger of being surprised and i determined to remain on shore for the night with a part of my people that the others might have more room to rest in the boat with the master whom i directed to lie at a grapple and be watchful in case we should be attacked i ordered one plantain for each person to be boiled and having supped on this scanty allowance with a quarter of a pint of grog and fixed the watches for the night those whose turn it was laid down to sleep in the cave before which we kept up a good fire yet notwithstanding we were much troubled with flies and mosquitoes may friday one at dawn of day the party set out again in a different route to see what they could find in the course of which they suffered greatly for want of water they however met with two men a woman and a child the men came with them to the cove and brought two coconut shells of water i endeavoured to make friends of these people and sent them away for breadfruit plantains and water soon after other natives came to us and by noon there were thirty about us from whom we obtained a small supply but i could only afford one ounce of pork and a quarter of a breadfruit to each man for dinner with half a pint of water for i was fixed in my resolution not to use any of the bread or water in the boat no particular chief was yet among the natives they were notwithstanding tractable and behaved honestly exchanging the provisions they brought for a few buttons and beads the party who had been out informed me of their having seen several neat plantations so that it remained no longer a doubt of their being settled inhabitants on the island for which reason i determined to get what i could and to sail the first moment that the wind and weather would allow us to put to sea i was much puzzled in what manner to account to the natives for the loss of my ship i knew they had too much sense to be amused with the story that the ship was to join me for she was not in sight from the hills i was at first doubtful whether i should tell the real fact or say that the ship had overset and sunk and that we only were saved the latter appeared to be the most proper and advantageous for us and i accordingly instructed my people that we might all agree in one story as i expected inquiries were made about the ship and they seemed readily satisfied with our account but there did not appear to be the least symptom of joy or sorrow in their faces though i fancied i discovered some marks of surprise some of the natives were coming and going the whole afternoon and we got enough of breadfruit plantains and coconuts for another day but of water they brought us only about five pints 
A canoe also came in with four men, and brought a few coconuts and breadfruit, which I bought as I had done the rest. Nails were much inquired after, but I would not suffer any to be shown, as they were wanted for the use of the boat. Towards evening I had the satisfaction to find our stock of provision somewhat increased, but the natives did not appear to have much to spare. What they brought was in such small quantities that I had no reason to hope we should be able to procure from them sufficient to stock us for our voyage. At sunset all the natives left us in quiet possession of the cove. I thought this was a good sign, and made no doubt that they would come again the next day with a better supply of food and water, with which I hoped to sail without further delay for if in attempting to get to tongataboo we should be driven to leeward of the islands there would be a larger quantity of provisions to support us against such a misfortune at night i served a quarter of a breadfruit and a coconut to each person for supper and a good fire being made all but the watch went to sleep saturday two at daybreak the next morning i was pleased to find every one's spirits a little revived and that they no longer regarded me with those anxious looks which had constantly been directed towards me since we lost sight of the ship every countenance appeared to have a degree of cheerfulness and they all seemed determined to do their best as there was no certainty of our being supplied with water by the natives i sent a party among the gullies in the mountains with empty shells to see what could be found in their absence the natives came about us as i expected and in greater numbers two canoes also came in from round the north side of the island in one of these was an elderly chief called makaa soon after some of our foraging party returned and with them came a good-looking chief called egaafo or perhaps more properly aafo eig or ehae signifying a chief to each of these men i made a present of an old shirt and a knife and i soon found that they had either seen me or heard of my being at anamaoka they knew i had been with captain cook who they inquired after and also captain clerk they were very inquisitive to know in what manner i had lost my ship during this conversation a young man named nagaete appeared whom i remembered to have seen at anamooka he expressed much pleasure at our meeting i inquired after poulaho and feeno who they said were at tongataboo and aefo agreed to accompany me thither if i would wait till the weather moderated the readiness and affidability of this man gave me much satisfaction this however was but of short duration for the natives began to increase in number and i observed some symptoms of a design against us soon after they attempted to haul the boat on shore on which i brandished my cutlass in a threatening manner and spoke to aafo to desire them to desist which they did and everything became quiet again my people who had been in the mountains now returned with about three gallons of water i kept buying up the little breadfruit that was brought to us and likewise some spears to arm my men with having only four cutlasses two of which were in the boat as we had no means of improving our situation i told our people i would wait till sunset by which time perhaps something might happen in our favor for if we attempted to go at present we must fight our way through which we could do more advantageously at night and that in the meantime we would endeavor to get off to the boat what we had bought the beach was lined with the natives and we heard nothing but the knocking of stones together which they had in each hand i knew very well this was the sign of an attack at noon i served a coconut and a breadfruit to each person for dinner and gave some to the chiefs with whom i continued to appear intimate and friendly they frequently importuned me to sit down but i as constantly refused for it occurred both to nelson and myself that they intended to seize hold of me if i gave them such an opportunity keeping therefore constantly on our guard we were suffered to eat our uncomfortable meal in some quietness after dinner we began by little and little to get our things into the boat which was a troublesome business on account of the surf 
I carefully watched the motions of the natives, who continued to increase in number, and found that, instead of their intention being to leave us, fires were made, and places fixed on for their stay during the night. Consultations were also held among them, and everything assured me we would be attacked. I sent orders to the master that when he saw us coming down he should keep the boat close to the shore that we might more readily embark. I had my journal on shore with me, writing the occurrences in the cave, and on sending it down to the boat it was nearly snatched away but for the timely assistance of the gunner. The sun was near setting when I gave the word, on which every person who was on shore with me boldly took up his proportion of things and carried them to the boat. The chiefs asked me if I would not stay with them all night. I said, no, I never sleep out of my boat, but in the morning we will again trade with you, and I shall remain till the weather is moderate that we may go, as we have agreed, to see Pou'u'aho at Tongataboo. Maka'akabao then got up and said, You will not sleep on shore? Then Mati, which directly signifies we will kill you, and he left me. The onset was now preparing. Every one, as I had described before, kept knocking stones together, and Aefo quitted me. All but two or three things were in the boat when I took Nagaeetai by the hand and we walked down the beach, every one in a silent kind of horror. While I was seeing the people embark, Nagaeete wanted me to speak to Aefo, but I found he was encouraging them to the attack, and it was my determination if they had then begun to have killed him for his treacherous behavior. I ordered the carpenter not to quit me till the other people were in the boat. Nagaeete, finding I would not stay, loosed himself from my hold and went off, and we all got into the boat except one man, who, while I was getting on board, quitted it and ran up the beach to cast the stern fast off, notwithstanding the master and others called him to return while they were hauling me out of the water. I was no sooner in the boat than the attack began by about two hundred men. The unfortunate poor man who had run up the beach was knocked down, and the stones flew like a shower of shot. Many Indians got hold of the stern rope and were near hauling the boat on shore, which they would certainly have effected if I had not had a knife in my pocket with which I cut the rope. We then hauled off to the grapnel, everybody being more or less hurt. At this time I saw five of the natives about the poor man they had killed, and two of them were beating him about the head with stones in their hands. We had no time to reflect, for, to my surprise, they filled their canoes with stones, and twelve men came off after us to renew the attack, which they did so effectually as nearly to disable us all. Our grapnel was foul, but Providence here assisted us. The fluke broke, and we got to our oars and pulled to sea. They, however, could paddle round us, so that we were obliged to sustain the attack without being able to return it, except with such stones as lodged in the boat, and in this I found we were very inferior to them. We could not close, because our boat was lumbered and heavy, of which they knew how to take advantage. I therefore adopted the expedience of throwing overboard some clothes, which, as I expected, they stopped to pick up, and, as it was by this time almost dark, they gave over the attack and returned towards the shore, leaving us to reflect on our unhappy situation. The poor man killed by the natives was John Norton. This was the second voyage with me as a quartermaster, and his worthy character made me lament his loss very much. He has left an aged parent, I am told, whom he supported. I once before sustained an attack of a similar nature with a smaller number of Europeans against a multitude of Indians. It was after the death of Captain Cook and the Morae at Owahe, where I was left by Lieutenant King. Yet notwithstanding this experience, I had not an idea that the power of a man's arm could throw stones from two to eight pounds weight with such force and exactness as these people did. Here, unhappily, we were without firearms, which the Indians knew, and it was a fortunate circumstance that they did not begin to attack us in the cave, 
for in that case our destruction must have been inevitable and we should have had nothing left for it but to sell our lives as dearly as we could in which i found every one cheerfully disposed to concur this appearance of resolution deterred them supposing that they could effect their purpose without risk after we were in the boat taking this as a sample of the disposition of the natives there was but little reason to expect much benefit by persevering in the attempt of visiting poulaho for i considered their good behaviour formerly to have proceeded from a dread of our firearms and which therefore was likely to cease as they knew we were now destitute of them and even supposing our lives not in danger the boat and everything we had would most probably be taken from us and therefore all hopes precluded of ever being able to return to our native country we set our sails and steered along shore by the west side of the island to foa the wind blowing fresh from the eastward my mind was employed at considering what was best to be done when i was solicited by all hands to take them towards home and when i told them that no hopes of relief for us remained except what might be found at new holland till i came to timor a distance of full one thousand two hundred leagues where there was a dutch settlement but in what part of the island i knew not they all agreed to live on one ounce of bread and a quarter of a pint of water per day therefore after examining our stock of provisions and recommending to them in the most solemn manner not to depart from their promise we bore away across the sea where the navigation is but little known in a small boat twenty-three feet long from stem to stern deep laden with eighteen men i was happy however to see that every one seemed better satisfied with our situation than myself our stock of provisions consisted of about one hundred and fifty pounds of bread twenty-eight gallons of water twenty pounds of pork three bottles of wine and five quarts of rum the difference between this and the quantity we had on leaving the ship was principally owing to our loss in the bustle and confusion of the attack a few coconuts were in the boat and some breadfruit but the latter was trampled to pieces end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of a voyage to the south sea this librivox recording is in the public domain a voyage to the south sea by william bligh chapter fifteen passage towards new holland islands discovered in our route our great distresses see the reefs of new holland and find a passage through them seventeen eighty nine may it was about eight o'clock at night when we bore away under a reefed lugged foresail and having divided the people into watches and got the boat in a little order we returned god thanks for our miraculous preservation and fully confident of his gracious support i found my mind more at ease than it had been for some time past sunday three at daybreak the gale increased the sun rose very fiery and red a sure indication of a severe gale of wind at eight it blew a violent storm and the sea ran very high so that between the seas the sail was becalmed and when on top of the sea it was too much to have set but we could not venture to take in the sail for we were in very imminent danger and distress the seas curling over the stern of the boat which obliged us to bail with all our might a situation more distressing has perhaps seldom been experienced our bread was in bags and in danger of being spoiled by the wet to be starved to death was inevitable if this could not be prevented i therefore began to examine what clothes there were in the boat and what other things could be spared and having determined that only two suits should be kept for each person the rest was thrown overboard with some rope and spare sails which lightened the boat considerably and we had more room to bail the water out fortunately the carpenter had a good chest in the boat in which we secured the bread the first favourable moment his tool chest also was cleared and the tools stowed in the bottom of the boat so that this became a second convenience i served a teaspoonful of rum to each person for we were very wet and cold 
with a quarter of a breadfruit which was scarcely edible for dinner our engagement was now strictly to be carried into execution and i was fully determined to make our provisions last eight weeks let the daily portions be ever so small at noon i considered our course and distance from tofoya to be west northwest three quarters west eighty six miles latitude nineteen degrees twenty seven minutes south i directed the course to the west northwest that we might get a sight of the islands called fiji if they laid in the direction the natives had pointed out to me the weather continued very severe the wind veering from northeast to east southeast the sea ran higher than in the forenoon and the fatigue of bailing to keep the boat from filling was exceedingly great we could do nothing more than keep before the sea in the course of which the boat performed so well that i no longer dreaded any danger in that respect but among the hardships we were to undergo that of being constantly wet was not the least monday four the night was very cold and at daylight our limbs were so benumbed that we could scarcely find the use of them at this time i served a teaspoonful of rum to each person from which we all found great benefit as i have mentioned before i determined to keep to the west northwest till i got more to the northward for i not only expected to have better weather but to see the fiji islands as i have often understood from the natives of anamooka that they lie in that direction captain cook likewise considered them to be northwest by west from tonga to Bo'o. just before noon we discovered a small flat island of a moderate height bearing west southwest four or five leagues i observed our latitude to be eighteen degrees fifty eight minutes south our longitude was by account three degrees four minutes west from the island of tofoa having made a north seventy two degrees west course distance ninety five miles since yesterday noon i divided five small coconuts for our dinner and every one was satisfied a little afternoon other islands appeared and at a quarter past three o'clock we could count eight bearing from the south round by the west to northwest by north those to the south which were the nearest being four leagues distant from us i kept my course to the northwest by west between the islands the gale having considerably abated at six o'clock we discovered three other small islands to the northwest the westernmost of them bore northwest half west seven leagues i steered to the southward of these islands a west northwest course for the night under a reefed sail served a few broken pieces of breadfruit for supper and performed prayers the night turned out fair and having had tolerable rest every one seemed considerably better in the morning and contentedly breakfasted on a few pieces of yams that were found in the boat after breakfast we examined our bread a great deal of which was damaged and rotten this nevertheless we were glad to keep for use i had hitherto been scarcely able to keep any account of our run but we now equipped ourselves a little better by getting a log line marked and having practised at counting seconds several could do it with some degree of exactness the islands we had passed lie between the latitude of nineteen degrees five minutes south and eighteen degrees nineteen minutes south and according to my reckoning from three degrees seventeen minutes to three degrees forty six minutes west longitude from the island to foa the largest may be about six leagues in circuit but it is impossible for me to be very correct to show where they are to be found again is the boast my situation enabled me to do the sketch i have made will give a comparative view of their extent i believe all the larger islands are inhabited as they appeared very fertile at noon i observed in latitude eighteen degrees ten seconds south and considered my course and distance from yesterday noon northwest by west half west ninety four miles longitude by account from tofoya four degrees twenty nine minutes west for dinner i served some of the damaged bread and a quarter of a pint of water about six o'clock in the afternoon we discovered two islands one bearing west by south six leagues and the other northwest by north eight leagues 
I kept to the windward of the northernmost, and passing by it at ten o'clock, I resumed our course to the northwest and west northwest for the night. Wednesday, six. The weather was fair, and the wind moderate all day from the east northeast. At daylight, a number of other islands were in sight from south southeast to the west, and round to the northeast by east. Between those and the northwest I determined to pass. At noon a small sandy island, or key, two miles distant from me, bore from east to south three-quarters west. I had passed ten islands, the largest of which I judged to be six or eight leagues in circuit. Much larger lands appeared in southwest and north-northwest, between which I directed my course. Latitude observed seventeen degrees seventeen minutes south, Course since yesterday noon, north, 50 degrees west, distance, 84 miles, longitude made by account, 5 degrees, 37 minutes west. Our allowance for the day was a quarter of a pint of coconut milk and the meat, which did not exceed two ounces to each person. It was received very contentedly, but we suffered great drought. I durst not venture to land as we had no arms and were less capable of defending ourselves than we were at Tofoya. To keep an account of the boat's run was rendered difficult from being constantly wet with the sea breaking over us, but as we advanced towards the land the sea became smoother and I was enabled to form a sketch of the islands which will serve to give a general knowledge of their extent and position. Those we were near appeared fruitful and hilly, some very mountainous, and all of a good height. To our great joy we hooked a fish, but we were miserably disappointed by its being lost and trying to get it into the boat. We continued steering to the northwest between the islands, which by the evening appeared of considerable extent, woody and mountainous. At sunset the southernmost bore from the south to southwest by west, and the northernmost from north by west half west to northeast half east. At six o'clock we were nearly midway between them, and about six leagues distant from each shore, when we fell in with a coral bank, on which we had only four feet water, without the least break on it or ruffle of the sea to give us warning. I could see that it extended about a mile on each side of us, but as it is probable that it may extend much further, I have laid it down so in my sketch. I directed the course west by north for the night and served to each person an ounce of the damaged bread and a quarter of a pint of water for supper. As our lodgings were very miserable and confined for want of room, I endeavored to remedy the latter defect by putting ourselves at watch and watch, so that one half always sat up while the other lay down on the boat's bottom or upon a chest, with nothing to cover us but the heavens. Our limbs were dreadfully cramped, for we could not stretch them out, and the nights were so cold, and we so constantly wet, that after a few hours' sleep we could scarce move. Thursday, 7. At dawn of day we again discovered land from west-southwest to west-northwest, and another island north-northwest, the latter a high round lump but of little extent, the southern land that we had passed in the night was still in sight. Being very wet and cold, I served a spoonful of rum and a morsel of bread for breakfast. The land in the west was distinguished by some extraordinary high rocks which, as we approached them, assumed a variety of forms. The country appeared to be agreeably interspersed with high and low land, and in some places covered with wood. Off the northeast part lay some small rocky islands, between which and an island four leagues to the northeast I directed my course, but a lee current very unexpectedly set us very near to the rocky isles, and we could only get clear of it by rowing, passing close to the reef that surrounded them. At this time we observed two large sailing canoes coming swiftly after us along shore, and, being apprehensive of their intentions, we rowed with some anxiety, fully sensible of our weak and defenseless state. At noon it was calm and the weather cloudy, my latitude is therefore doubtful to three or four miles. Our course since yesterday noon, northwest by west, distant seventy-nine miles, 
latitude by account sixteen degrees twenty nine minutes south and longitude by account from tofoya six degrees forty six minutes west being constantly wet it was with the utmost difficulty i could open a book to write and i am sensible that what i have done can only serve to point out where these lands are to be found again and give an idea of their extent all the afternoon we had light winds at north northeast the weather was very rainy attended with thunder and lightning only one of the canoes gained upon us which by three o'clock in the afternoon was not more than two miles off when she gave over chase if i may judge from the sale of these vessels they are of a similar construction with those at the friendly islands which with the nearness of their situation gives reason to believe that they are the same kind of people whether these canoes had any hostile intention against us must remain a doubt perhaps we might have benefited by an intercourse with them but in our defenceless situation to have made the experiment would have been risking too much i imagine these to be the islands called fiji as their extent direction and distance from the friendly islands answers to the description given of them by those islanders heavy rain came on at four o'clock when every person did their utmost to catch some water and we increased our stock to thirty-four gallons besides quenching our thirst for the first time since we had been at sea but an attendant consequence made us pass the night very miserably for being extremely wet and having no dry things to shift or cover us we experienced cold and shivering scarcely to be conceived most fortunately for us the forenoon turned out fair and we stripped and dried our clothes the allowance i issued to-day was an ounce and a half of pork a teaspoonful of rum half a pint of coconut milk and an ounce of bread the rum though so small in quantity was of the greatest service a fishing line was generally towing from the stern of the boat but though we saw great numbers of fish we could never catch one at noon i observed in latitude sixteen degrees four minutes south and found we had made a course from yesterday noon north sixty two degrees west distance sixty two miles longitude by account from tofoya seven degrees forty two minutes west the land passed yesterday and the day before is a group of islands fourteen or sixteen in number lying between the latitude of sixteen degrees twenty six minutes south and seventeen degrees fifty seven minutes south and in longitude by my account four degrees forty seven minutes to seven degrees seventeen minutes west from tofoya three of these islands are very large having from thirty to forty leagues of sea coast in the afternoon we cleaned out the boat and it employed us till sunset to get everything dry and in order hitherto i had issued the allowance by gas but i now made a pair of scales with two coconut shells and having accidentally some pistol balls in the boat twenty-five of which weighed one pound or sixteen ounces i adopted one footnote it weighed two hundred seventy two grains and a footnote note from reader two hundred seventy two grains or one twenty-fifth of a pound equals about eighteen grams pretty slim ration no matter how you slice it end of note i adopted one as the proportion of weight that each person should receive of bread at the times i served it i also amused all hands with describing the situation in new guinea and new holland and gave them every information in my power that in case any accident happened to me those who survived might have some idea of what they were about and be able to find their way to timor which at present they knew nothing of more than the name and some not even that at night i served a quarter of a pint of water and half an ounce of bread for supper saturday nine in the morning a quarter of a pint of coconut milk and some of the decayed bread was served for breakfast and for dinner i divided the meat of four coconuts with the remainder of the rotten bread which was only edible by such distressed people at noon i observed the latitude to be fifteen degrees forty seven minutes south course since yesterday north seventy five degrees west distance sixty four miles longitude made by account eight degrees forty five minutes west 
in the afternoon i fitted a pair of shrouds for each mast and contrived a canvas weather cloth round the boat and raised the quarters about nine inches by nailing on the seats of the stern sheets which proved of great benefit to us the wind had been moderate all day in the southeast quarter with fine weather but about nine o'clock in the evening the clouds began to gather and we had a prodigious fall of rain with severe thunder and lightning by midnight we caught about twenty gallons of water being miserably wet and cold i served to the people a teaspoonful of rum each to enable them to bear with their distressed situation the weather continued extremely bad and the wind increased we spent a very miserable night without sleep except such as could be got in the midst of rain the day brought no relief but its light the sea broke over us so much that two men were constantly bailing and we had no choice how to steer being obliged to keep before the waves for fear of the boat filling the allowance now regularly served to each person was one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and a quarter of a pint of water at eight in the morning at noon and at sunset to-day i gave about half an ounce of pork for dinner which though any moderate person would have considered only as a mouthful was divided into three or four the rain abated towards noon and i observed the latitude to be fifteen degrees seventeen minutes south course north sixty seven degrees west distance seventy eight miles longitude made ten degrees west the wind continued strong from south southeast to southeast with very squally weather and a high breaking sea so that we were miserably wet and suffered great cold in the night monday eleven in the morning at daybreak i served to every person a teaspoonful of rum our limbs being so cramped that we could scarce move them our situation was now extremely dangerous with sea frequently running over our stern which kept us bailing with all our strength at noon the sun appeared which gave us as much pleasure as in a winter's day in england i issued the twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and a quarter of a pint of water as yesterday latitude observed fourteen degrees fifty minutes south course north seventy one degrees west distance one hundred two miles and longitude by account eleven degrees thirty nine minutes west from tofoya in the evening it rained hard and we again experienced a dreadful night tuesday twelve at length the day came and showed to me a miserable set of beings full of wants without anything to relieve them some complained of great pain in their bowels and every one of having almost lost the use of his limbs the little sleep we got was no ways refreshing as we were covered with sea and rain i served a spoonful of rum at day dawn and the usual allowance of bread and water for breakfast dinner and supper at noon it was almost calm no sun to be seen and some of us shivering with cold course since yesterday west by north distance eighty nine miles latitude by account fourteen degrees thirty three minutes south longitude made thirteen degrees nine minutes west the direction of our course was to pass to the northward of the new hebrides the wet weather continued and in the afternoon the wind came from the southward blowing fresh in squalls as there was no prospect of getting our clothes dried i recommended to every one to strip and wring them through the salt water by which means they received a warmth that while wet with rain they could not have this afternoon we saw a kind of fruit on the water which nelson told me was the barentonia of foster and as i saw the same again in the morning and some men of war birds i was led to believe that we were not far from land we continued constantly shipping seas and bailing and were very wet and cold in the night but i could not afford the allowance of rum at daybreak wednesday thirteen at noon i had a sight of the sun latitude fourteen degrees seventeen minutes south course west by north seventy nine miles longitude made fourteen degrees twenty eight minutes west all this day we were constantly shipping water and suffered much cold and shiverings in the night thursday fourteen fresh gales at southeast and gloomy weather with rain and a high sea 
at six in the morning we saw land from southwest by south eight leagues to northwest by west three quarters west six leagues which soon after appeared to be four islands one of them much larger than the others and all of them high and remarkable at noon we discovered a small island and some rocks bearing northwest by north four leagues and another island west eight leagues so that the whole were six in number the four i had first seen bearing from south half east to southwest by south our distance three leagues from the nearest island my latitude observed was thirteen degrees twenty nine minutes south and longitude by account from tofoya fifteen degrees forty nine minutes west course since yesterday noon north sixty three degrees west distance eighty nine miles at four in the afternoon we passed the westernmost island friday fifteen at one in the morning another island was discovered bearing west northwest five leagues distance and at eight o'clock we saw it for the last time bearing northeast seven leagues a number of gannets boobies and men-of-war birds were seen these islands lie between the latitude of thirteen degrees sixteen minutes and fourteen degrees ten minutes south their longitude according to my reckoning is fifteen degrees fifty one minutes to seventeen degrees six minutes west from the island to foya footnote by making a proportional allowance for error afterwards found in the dead reckoning i estimate the longitude of these islands to be from one hundred sixty seven degrees seventeen minutes east to one hundred sixty eight degrees thirty four minutes east from greenwich End of footnote the largest island i judged to be about twenty leagues in circuit the others five or six the easternmost is the smallest island and most remarkable having a high sugar-loaf hill the sight of these islands served only to increase the misery of our situation we were very little better than starving with plenty in view yet to attempt procuring any relief was attended with so much danger that prolonging of life even in the midst of misery was thought preferable while there remained hope of being able to surmount our hardships for my part i consider the general run of cloudy and wet weather to be a blessing of providence hot weather would have caused us to have died with thirst and probably being so constantly covered with rain or sea protected us from that dreadful calamity as i had nothing to assist my memory i could not then determine whether these islands were a part of the new hebrides or not i believe them to be a new discovery which i have since found true but though they were not seen by either monsieur bougainville or captain cook they are so nearly in the neighbourhood of the new hebrides that they must be considered part of the same group they are fertile and inhabited as we saw smoke in several places the wind was at southeast with rainy weather all day the night was very dark not a star could be seen to steer by and the sea broke continually over us i found it necessary to counteract as much as possible the effect of the southerly winds to prevent being driven too near new guinea for in general we were forced to keep so much before the sea that if we had not at intervals of moderate weather steered a more southerly course we should inevitably from a continuance of the gales have been thrown inside of that coast in which case there would most probably have been an end to our voyage saturday sixteen in addition to our miserable allowance of one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and a quarter of a pint of water i issued for dinner about an ounce of salt pork to each person i was often solicited for this pork but i considered it more proper to issue it in small quantities than suffer it to be all used at once or twice which would have been done if i had allowed it at noon i observed in thirteen degrees thirty-three minutes south longitude bade from tofoya nineteen degrees twenty-seven minutes west course north eighty-two degrees west distance one hundred one miles the sun breaking out through the clouds gave us hopes of drying our wet clothes but the sunshine was of short duration we had strong breezes at southeast by south and dark gloomy weather with storms of thunder lightning and rain the night was truly horrible and not a star to be seen so that our steerage was uncertain 
Sunday, 17. At dawn of day I found every person complaining, and some of them solicited extra allowance which I positively refused. Our situation was miserable, always wet, and suffering extreme cold in the night without the least shelter from the weather. Being constantly obliged to bail to keep the boat from filling was perhaps not to be reckoned an evil, as it gave us exercise. The little rum we had was of great service. When our nights were particularly distressing, I generally served a teaspoonful or two to each person, and it was always joyful tidings when they heard of my intentions. At noon, a waterspout was nearly on board of us. I issued an ounce of pork in addition to the allowance of bread and water, but before we began to eat, every person stripped, and having wrung their clothes through the sea water, found much warmth and refreshment. Course since yesterday noon, west southwest, distance one hundred miles. Latitude by account fourteen degrees eleven minutes south, and longitude made twenty one degrees three minutes west. The night was dark and dismal the sea constantly breaking over us and nothing but the wind and waves to direct our steerage it was my intention if possible to make new holland to the southward of endeavour straits being sensible that it was necessary to preserve such a situation as would make a southerly wind a fair one that we might range along the reefs till an opening should be found into smooth water and we the sooner be able to pick up some refreshments monday eighteen in the morning the rain abated when we stripped and wrung our clothes through the sea-water as usual which refreshed us greatly every person complained of violent pain in their bones i was only surprised that no one was yet laid up the customary allowance of one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and a quarter of a pint of water was served at breakfast dinner and supper at noon i deduced my situation by account for we had no glimpse of the sun to be in latitude fourteen degrees fifty two minutes south course since yesterday noon west southwest one hundred six miles longitude made from tofoya twenty two degrees forty five minutes west saw many boobies and noddies a sign of being in the neighbourhood of land in the night we had very severe lightning with heavy rain and were obliged to keep bailing without intermission tuesday nineteen very bad weather and constant rain at noon latitude by account fourteen degrees thirty seven minutes south course since yesterday north eighty one degrees west distance one hundred miles longitude made twenty four degrees thirty minutes west with the allowance of bread and water served half an ounce of pork to each person for dinner wednesday twenty fresh breezes east northeast with constant rain at times a deluge always bailing at dawn of day some of my people seemed half dead our appearances were horrible and i could look no way but i caught the eye of some one in distress extreme hunger was now too evident but no one suffered from thirst nor had we much inclination to drink that desire perhaps being satisfied through the skin the little sleep we got was in the midst of water and we constantly awoke with severe cramps and pains in our bones this morning i served about two teaspoonfuls of rum to each person and the allowance of bread and water as usual at noon the sun broke out and revived every one i found we were in latitude fourteen degrees forty nine minutes south longitude made twenty five degrees forty six minutes west course south eighty eight degrees west distance seventy five miles all the afternoon we were so covered with rain and salt water that we could scarcely see we suffered extreme cold and every one dreaded the approach of night sleep though we longed for it afforded no comfort for my part i almost lived without it thursday twenty one at two o'clock in the morning we were overwhelmed with a deluge of rain it fell so heavy that we were afraid it would fill the boat and were obliged to bail with all our might at dawn of day i served a larger allowance of rum towards noon the rain abated and the sun shone but we were miserably cold and wet the sea breaking constantly over us so that notwithstanding the heavy rain we had not been able to add to our stock of fresh water 
latitude by observation fourteen degrees twenty nine minutes south and longitude made by account from tofoya twenty seven degrees twenty five minutes west course since yesterday noon north seventy eight degrees west ninety nine miles i now considered myself nearly on the meridian with the east part of new guinea friday twenty two strong gales from the east southeast to south southeast a high sea and dark dismal night our situation this day was extremely calamitous we were obliged to take the course of the sea running right before it and watching with the utmost care as the least error in the helm would in a moment have been our destruction at noon it blew very hard and the foam of the sea kept running over our stern and quarters i however got propped up and made an observation of the latitude in fourteen degrees seventeen minutes south course north eighty five degrees west distance one hundred thirty miles longitude made twenty nine degrees thirty eight minutes west the misery we suffered this night exceeded the preceding the sea flew over us with great force and kept us bailing with horror and anxiety saturday twenty three at dawn of day i found every one in a most distressed condition and i began to fear that another such night would put an end to the lives of several who seemed no longer able to support their sufferings i served an allowance of two teaspoonfuls of rum after drinking which having wrung our clothes and taken our breakfast in bread and water we became a little refreshed towards noon the weather became fair but with very little abatement of the gale and the sea continued equally high with some difficulty i observed the latitude to be thirteen degrees forty four minutes south course since yesterday noon north seventy four degrees west distance one hundred sixteen miles longitude made thirty one degrees thirty two minutes west from tofoya the wind moderated in the evening and the weather looked much better which rejoiced all hands so that they ate their scanty allowance with more satisfaction than for some time past the night also was fair but being always wet with the sea we suffered much from the cold sunday twenty four a fine morning i had the pleasure to see produced some cheerful countenances and the first time for fifteen days past we experienced comfort from the warmth of the sun we stripped and hung our clothes up to dry which were by this time become so threadbare that they would not keep out either wet or cold at noon i observed in latitude thirteen degrees thirty three minutes south longitude by account from tofoya thirty three degrees twenty eight minutes west course north eighty four degrees west distance one hundred fourteen miles with the usual allowance of bread and water for dinner i served an ounce of pork to each person this afternoon we had many birds about us which are never seen far from land such as boobies and noddies allowance lessened as the sea began to run fair and we shipped but little water i took the opportunity to examine into the state of our bread and found that according to the present mode of issuing there was a sufficient quantity remaining for twenty-nine days allowance by which time i hoped we should be able to reach to more but as this was very uncertain and it was possible that after all we might be obliged to go to java i determined to portion the allowance so as to make our stock hold out six weeks i was apprehensive that this would be ill received and that it would require my utmost resolution to enforce it for small as the quantity was which i intended to take away for our future good yet it might appear to my people to be robbing them of life and some who were less patient than their companions i expected would very ill brook it however on my representing the necessity of guarding against delays that might be occasioned in our voyage by contrary winds or other causes and promising to enlarge upon the allowance as we got on they cheerfully agreed to my proposal it was accordingly settled that every person should receive one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread for breakfast and the same quantity for dinner so that by omitting the proportion for supper we had forty-three days allowance monday twenty five at noon some noddies came so near to us that one of them was caught by hand this bird was about the size of a small pigeon 
I divided it with its entrails into eighteen portions, and by a well-known method of sea by who shall have this, footnote, one person turns his back on the object that is to be divided, another then points separately to the portions, and each of them asking aloud who shall have this, to which the first answers by naming somebody. This impartial method of division gives every man an equal chance of the best share. End of footnote. It was distributed with the allowance of bread and water for dinner, and ate up, bones and all, with salt water for sauce. I observed the latitude 13 degrees 32 minutes south, longitude made 35 degrees 19 minutes west, course north 89 degrees west, distance 108 miles. In the evening several boobies flying very near to us, we had a good fortune to catch one of them. This bird is as large as a duck. Like the knotty, it has received its name for suffering itself to be caught on the masts and yards of ships. They are the most presumptive proofs of being in the neighborhood of land of any sea-fowl we are acquainted with. I directed the bird to be killed for supper, and the blood to be given to three of the people who were the most distressed for want of food. The body, with the entrails, beak, and feet, I divided into eighteen shares, and with an allowance of bread which I made a merit of granting, we made a good supper, compared with our usual fare. Tuesday, 26. Fresh breezes from the southeast with fine weather. In the morning we caught another booby so that Providence appeared to be relieving our wants in an extraordinary manner. Towards noon we passed a great many pieces of the branches of trees, some of which appeared to have been no long time in the water. I had a good observation for the latitude, and had found our situation to be in 13 degrees 41 minutes south, longitude by account from Tafoya 37 degrees 13 minutes west, course south 85 degrees west, 112 miles. The people were overjoyed at the addition to their dinner, which was distributed in the same manner as on the preceding evening, giving the blood to those who were most in want of food. To make the bread a little savory, most of the people frequently dipped it in salt water, but I generally broke mine into small pieces and ate it in my allowance of water out of a coconut shell with a spoon, economically avoiding to take too large a piece at a time, so that I was as long at dinner as if it had been a much more plentiful meal. The weather was now serene, which nevertheless was not without its inconveniences, for we began to feel distress of a different kind from that which we had lately been accustomed to suffer. The heat of the sun was so powerful that several of the people were seized with a languor and faintness which made life indifferent. We were so fortunate as to catch two boobies in the evening, their stomachs contained several flying fish and small cuttlefish, all of which I saved to be divided for dinner the next day. Wednesday, 27. A fresh breeze at east-southeast with fair weather. We passed much driftwood this forenoon and saw many birds. I therefore did not hesitate to pronounce that we were near the reefs of New Holland. From my recollection of Captain Cook's survey of this coast, I considered the direction of it to be northwest, and I was therefore satisfied that, with the wind to the southward of east, I could always clear any dangers. At noon I observed in latitude 13 degrees 26 minutes south, course since yesterday north 82 degrees west, distance 109 miles, longitude made 39 degrees 14 minutes. After writing my accounts, I divided the two birds with their entrails and the contents of their maws into eighteen portions, and as the prize was a very valuable one, it was divided as before by calling out who should have this, so that today, with the allowance of a twenty-fifth of a pound of bread at breakfast and another at dinner, with a proportion of water, I was happy to see that every person thought he had feasted. In the evening we saw Gannett, and the clouds remained so fixed in the west that I had little doubt of our being near the land. The people, after taking their allowance of water for supper, amused themselves with conversing on the probability of what we should find. Thursday, 28. 
at one in the morning the person at the helm heard the sound of breakers and i no sooner lifted up my head than i saw them close under our lee not more than a quarter of a mile distant from us i immediately hauled on the wind to the north-northeast and in ten minutes we could neither see nor hear them i have already mentioned my reason for making new holland so far to the southward for i never doubted of numerous openings in the reef through which i could have access to the shore and knowing the inclination of the coast to be to the northwest and the wind mostly to the southward of east i could with ease rein such a barrier of reefs till i should find a passage which now became absolutely necessary without a moment's loss of time the idea of getting into smooth water and finding refreshments kept my people's spirits up their joy was very great after we had got clear of the breakers to which we had approached much nearer than i thought was possible without first discovering them friday twenty nine in the morning at daylight we could see nothing of the land nor of the reefs we bore away again and at nine o'clock saw the reefs the sea broke furiously over every part and we had no sooner got near to them than the wind came at east so that we could only lie along the line of the breakers within which we saw the water so smooth that every person already anticipated the heartfelt satisfaction that he should receive as soon as we could get within them i now found we were embayed for we could not lie clear with the sails the wind having backed against us and the sea set in so heavy towards the reef that our situation was become unsafe we could effect but little with the oars having scarcely strength to pull them and i began to apprehend that we should be obliged to attempt pushing over the reef even this i did not despair of effecting with success when happily we discovered a break in the reef about one mile from us and at the same time an island of moderate height within it nearly in the same direction bearing west half north i entered the passage with a strong stream running to the westward and found it about a quarter of a mile broad with every appearance of deep water on the outside the reef inclined to the northeast for a few miles and from thence to the northwest on the south side of the entrance it inclined to the south-southwest as far as i could see it and i conjecture that a similar passage to this which we are now entered may be found near the breakers that i first discovered which are twenty-three miles south of this channel i did not recollect what latitude providential channel footnote providential channel is laid down by captain cook in twelve degrees thirty four minutes south longitude one hundred forty three degrees thirty three minutes east and the footnote lies in but i considered it to be within a few miles of this which is situate in twelve degrees fifty one minutes south latitude being now happily within the reefs and in smooth water i endeavoured to keep near them to try for fish but the tide set us to the northwest, and i therefore bore away in that direction and having promised to land on the first convenient spot we could find all our past hardships seemed already to be forgotten at noon i had a good observation by which our latitude was twelve degrees forty six minutes south whence the foregoing situations may be considered as determined with some exactness the island first seen bore west southwest five leagues this which i have called the island direction will in fair weather always show the channel from which it bears due west and may be seen as soon as the reefs from a ship's masthead it lies in the latitude of twelve degrees fifty one minutes south these however are marks too small for a ship to hit unless it can hereafter be ascertained that passages through the reef are numerous along the coast which i am inclined to think they are in which case there would be little risk even if the wind was directly on the shore my longitude made by dead reckoning from the island to foya to our passage through the reefs is forty degrees ten minutes west providential channel i imagine must lie very nearly under the same meridian with our passage by which it appears that we had outrun our reckoning one degree nine minutes we now returned god thanks for his gracious protection and with much content took our miserable allowance of a twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and a quarter of a pint of water for dinner 
End of chapter 15「Avoids to the South Sea」by William Bly Chapter 16 Progress to the Northward Along the Coast of New Holland Land on Different Islands in Search of Supplies May 1789 as we advanced within the reefs, the coast began to show itself very distinctly in a variety of high and low land, some parts of which were covered with wood. In our way towards the shore we fell in with the point of a reef which is connected with that towards the sea, and here we came to a grapnel and tried to catch fish but had no success. The island direction at this time bore south three or four leagues. Two islands lay about four miles to the west by north, and appeared eligible for a resting place, if for nothing more. But on our approach to the nearest island it proved to be only a heap of stones, and its size too inconsiderate to shelter the boat. We therefore proceeded to the next, which was close to it, and towards the main. On the northwest side of this I found a bay, and a fine sandy point to land at. Our distance was about a quarter of a mile from a projecting part of the main, which bore from south-west to south to north-northwest three-quarters west. We landed to examine if there were any signs of the natives being near us. We saw some old fireplaces, but nothing to make me apprehend that this would be an unsafe situation for the night. Everyone was anxious to find something to eat, and it was soon discovered that there were oysters on the rocks for the tide was out, but it was nearly dark, and only a few could be gathered. I determined therefore to wait till the morning, when I should better know how to proceed, and I directed that one half of our company should sleep on shore, and the other half in the boat. We would gladly have made a fire, but, as we could not accomplish it, we took our rest for the night, which happily was calm and undisturbed. Friday, 29. The dawn of day brought greater strength and spirits to us than I expected, for, notwithstanding every one was very weak, there appeared strength sufficient remaining to make me conceive the most favorable hopes of our being able to surmount the difficulties we might yet have to encounter. As there were no appearances to make me imagine that any of the natives were near us, I sent out parties in search of supplies, while others of the people were putting the boat in order that we might be ready to go to sea, in case any unforeseen cause should make it necessary. One of the guardians of the rudder had come out in the course of the night and was lost. This, if it had happened at sea, might have been attended with the most serious consequences, as the management of the boat could not have been so nicely preserved as these very heavy seas required. I had been apprehensive of this accident, and had in some measure prepared for it, by having grommets fixed on each quarter of the boat for oars, but our utmost readiness in using them would not probably have saved us. It appears therefore a providential circumstance that it happened in a place of safety, and that it was in our power to remedy the defect, for by great good luck we found a large staple in the boat which answered the purpose. The parties returned, highly rejoiced at having found plenty of oysters and fresh water. I also made a fire by the help of a small magnifying glass, and, what was still more fortunate, we found among the few things which had been thrown into the boat and saved, a piece of brimstone and a tinder box, so that I secured fire for the future. One of the people had been so provident as to bring away with him from the ship a copper pot. By being in possession of this article, we were enabled to make a proper use of the supply we now obtained for, with a mixture of bread and a little pork, we made a stew that might have been relished by people of far more delicate appetites, and of which each person received a full pint. The general complaints of disease among us were a dizziness in the head, great weakness of the joints, and violent tenismus, most of us having had no evacuation by stool since we left the ship. I had constantly a severe pain at my stomach, but none of our complaints were alarming, 
on the contrary every one retained marks of strength that with a mind possessed of a tolerable share of fortitude seemed able to bear more fatigue than i imagined we should have to undergo in our voyage to timor as i would not allow the people to expose themselves to the heat of the sun it being near noon every one took his allotment of earth where it was shaded by the bushes for a short sleep the oysters which we found grew so fast to the rocks that it was with difficulty they could be broken off and at length we discovered it to be the most expeditious way to open them where they were fixed they were of a good size and well tasted to add to this happy circumstance in the hollow of the land there grew some wire grass which indicated a moist situation on forcing a stick about three feet long into the ground we found water and with little trouble dug a well which produced as much as our occasions required it was very good but i could not determine if it was a spring or not we were not obliged to make the well deep for it flowed as fast as we emptied it which as the soil was apparently too loose to retain water from the rains renders it probable to be a spring on the south side of the island likewise we found a small run of good water besides places where fires had been made there were other signs of the natives sometimes resorting to this island i saw two ill-constructed huts or wigwams which had only one side loosely covered and a pointed stick was found about three feet long with a slit in the end of it to sling stones with the same as the natives at van diemen's land use the track of some animal was very discernible and nelson agreed with me that it was the kangaroo but whether these animals swim over from the mainland or are brought here by the natives to breed it is impossible to determine the latter is not improbable as they may be taken with less difficulty in a confined spot like this than on the continent the island is about a league in circuit it is a high lump of rocks and stones covered with wood but the trees are small the soil which is very indifferent and sandy being barely sufficient to produce them the trees that came within our knowledge were the manchineal and a species of puro also some palm trees the tops of which we cut down and the soft interior part or heart of them was so palatable that it made a good addition to our mess nelson discovered some fern roots which i thought might be good roasted as a substitute for bread but in this i was mistaken it however was very serviceable in its natural state to allay thirst and on that account i directed a quantity to be collected to take into the boat many pieces of coconut shells and husks were found about the shore but we could find no coconut trees neither did i see any on the main i had cautioned the people not to touch any kind of berry or fruit that they might find yet they were no sooner out of my sight than they began to make free with three different kinds that grew all over the island eating without any reserve the symptoms of having eaten too much began at last to frighten some of them but on questioning others who had taken a more moderate allowance their minds were a little quieted the others however became equally alarmed in their turn dreading that such symptoms would come on and that they were all poisoned so that they regarded each other with the strongest marks of apprehension uncertain what would be the issue of their imprudence fortunately the fruit proved wholesome and good one sort grew on a small delicate kind of vine they were the size of a large gooseberry and very like in substance but had only a sweet taste the skin was a pale red streaked with yellow the long way of the fruit it was pleasant and agreeable another kind grew on bushes like that which is called the seaside grape in the west indies but the fruit was very different being more like elderberries and grew in clusters in the same manner the third sort was a blackberry this was not in such plenty as the others and resembled a bolus or a large kind of sloe both in size and taste when i saw that these fruits were eaten by the birds i no longer doubted of their being wholesome and those who had already tried the experiment not finding any bad effect made it a certainty that we might eat of them without danger wild pigeons parrots and other birds were about the summit of the island but having no firearms relief of that kind was not to be expected 
unless we should find some unfrequented spots where the birds were so tame that we might take them with our hands the shore of this island is very rocky except the place at which we landed and here i picked up many pieces of pumice stone on the part of the main nearest to us were several sandy bays which at low water became an extensive rocky flat the country had rather a barren appearance except in a few places where it was covered with wood a remarkable range of rocks lay a few miles to the southwest and a high peaked hill seemed to terminate the coast towards the sea with islands to the southward a high fair cape showed the direction of the coast to the northwest about seven leagues distant and two small isles lay three or four leagues to the northward of our present station i saw a few bees or wasps and several lizards and the blackberry bushes were full of ant nests webbed like a spider's but so close and compact as not to admit the rain a trunk of a tree about fifty feet long lay on the beach from which i conclude that a heavy sea sets in here with a northerly wind this day being the anniversary of the restoration of king charles the second and the name being not inapplicable to our present situation for we were restored to fresh life and strength i named this restoration island for i thought it probable that captain cook might not have taken notice of it the other names which i have presumed to give the different parts of the coast are meant only to show my route more distinctly at noon i observed the latitude of the island to be twelve degrees thirty nine minutes south our course having been north sixty six degrees west distance eighteen miles from yesterday noon the wind was at east southeast with very fine weather in the afternoon i sent parties out again to gather oysters with which and some of the inner part of the palm top we made another good stew for supper each person receiving a full pint and a half but i refused bread to this meal for i considered that our wants might yet be very great and was intent on saving our principal support whenever it was in my power after supper we again divided and those who were on shore slept by a good fire saturday thirty in the morning i discovered a visible alteration in our company for the better and i sent them away again to gather oysters we had now only two pounds of pork left this article which i could not keep under lock and key as i did the bread had been pilfered by some inconsiderate person but every one denied having any knowledge of this act i therefore resolved to put it out of their power for the future by sharing what remained for our dinner while the party was out picking up oysters i got the boat in readiness for the sea and filled all our water vessels which amounted to nearly sixty gallons the party being returned dinner was soon ready which was as plentiful a meal as the supper on the preceding evening and with the pork i gave an allowance of bread as it was not yet noon i sent the people once more to gather oysters for a sea store recommending them to be as diligent as possible for that i was determined to sail in the afternoon at noon i again observed the latitude twelve degrees thirty nine minutes south it was then high water the tide had risen three feet but i could not be certain from whence the flood came i deduced the time of high water at full and change to be ten minutes past seven in the morning early in the afternoon the people returned with a few oysters that they had collected and everything was put into the boat i then examined the quantity of bread remaining and found thirty-eight days allowance according to the last mode of issuing a twenty-fifth of a pound at breakfast and dinner fair weather and moderate breezes at east southeast and southeast being ready for sea i directed every person to attend prayers at four o'clock we were preparing to embark when about twenty of the natives appeared running and hallowing to us on the opposite shore they were each armed with a spear or lance and a short weapon which they carried in their left hand they made signs for us to come to them on the top of the hills we saw the heads of many more whether these were their wives and children or others who waited for our landing meaning not to show themselves lest we might be intimidated i cannot say but as i found we were discovered to be on the coast i thought it prudent to make the best of our way for fear of being pursued by canoes 
though from the accounts of captain cook the chance was that there were very few if any of consequence on any part of the coast i passed these people as near as i could with safety they were naked and apparently black and their hair or wool bushy and short i directed my course within two small islands that lie to the north of restoration island passing between them and the mainland towards fair cape with a strong tide in my favour so that i was abreast of it by eight o'clock the coast we passed was high and woody as i could see no land without fair cape i concluded that the coast inclined to the northwest and west northwest i therefore steered more towards the west but by eleven o'clock at night we met with low land which inclined to the northeast and at three o'clock in the morning i found that we were in bayed which obliged us to stand back for a short time to the southward sunday thirty one at daybreak i was exceedingly surprised to find the appearance of the country entirely changed as if in the course of the night we had been transported to another part of the world for we had now a low sandy coast in view with very little verdure or anything to indicate that it was at all habitable to a human being except a few patches of small trees or brushwood many small islands were in sight to the northeast about six miles distant the eastern part of the main bore north four miles and fair cape south southeast five or six leagues i took the channel between the nearest island and the mainland which were about one mile apart leaving all the islands on the starboard side some of these were very pretty spots covered with wood and well situated for fishing large shoals of fish were about us but we could not catch any in passing this strait we saw another party of indians seven in number running towards us shouting and making signs for us to land some of them waved green branches of the bushes which were near them as a token of friendship but some of their other motions were less friendly a little farther off we saw a larger party who likewise came towards us i therefore determined not to land though i much wished to have some intercourse with these people nevertheless i laid the boat close to the rocks and beckoned them to approach but none of them would come within two hundred yards of us they were armed in the same manner as the people we had seen from restoration island they were stark naked their colour black with short bushy hair or wool and in their appearance were similar to them in every respect an island of a good height bore north half-west four miles from us at which i resolved to land and from thence to take a look at the coast at this isle we arrived about eight o'clock in the morning the shore was rocky but the water was smooth and we landed without difficulty i sent two parties out one to the northward and the other to the southward to seek for supplies and others i ordered to stay by the boat on this occasion fatigue and weakness so far got the better of their sense of duty that some of the people expressed their discontent at having worked harder than their companions and declared that they would rather be without their dinner than go in search of it one person in particular went so far as to tell me with a mutinous look that he was as good a man as myself it was not possible for me to judge where this might have an end if not stopped in time therefore to prevent such disputes in future i determined either to preserve my command or die in the attempt and seizing the cutlass i ordered him to take hold of another and defend himself on which he called out that i was going to kill him and immediately made concessions i did not allow this to interfere further with the harmony of the boat's crew and everything soon became quiet the parties continued collecting what they could find which were some fine oysters and clams and a few small dogfish that were caught in the holes of the rocks we also found some rainwater in the hollow of the rocks on the north part of the island so that of this essential article we were again so fortunate as to obtain a full supply after regulating the mode of proceeding i walked to the highest part of the island to consider our route for the night to my surprise no more of the mainland could be seen here than from below the northernmost part in sight which was full of sand hills bearing west by north about three leagues except for the isles to the east southeast and south that we had passed i could only discover a small key northwest by north 
as this was considerably farther from the main than the spot on which we were at present i judged it would be a more secure resting-place for the night for here we were liable to an attack if the indians had canoes as they undoubtedly must have observed our landing my mind being made up on this point i returned after taking a particular look at the island we were on which i found only to produce a few bushes and some coarse grass the extent of the whole not being two miles in circuit on the north side in the sandy bay i saw an old canoe about thirty-three feet long lying bottom upward and half buried in the beach it was made of three pieces the bottom entire to which the sides were sewed in the common way it had a sharp projecting prow rudely carved in resemblance to the head of a fish the extreme breadth was about three feet and i imagine it was capable of carrying twenty men the discovery of so large a canoe confirmed me in the purpose of seeking a more retired place for our night's lodging at noon the parties all returned but had found much difficulty in gathering the oysters from their close adherence to the rocks and the clams were scarce i therefore saw that it would be of little use to remain longer in this place as we should not be able to collect more than we could eat i named this sunday island it lies north by west three-quarters west from restoration island the latitude by a good observation eleven degrees fifty-eight minutes south we had a fresh breeze at southeast by south with fair weather at two o'clock in the afternoon we dined each person having a full pint and a half of stewed oysters and clams thickened with small beans which nelson informed me were a species of delicos having eaten heartily and completed our water i waited to determine the time of high water which i found to be at three o'clock and the rise of the tide about three feet according to this it is high water on the full and change at nineteen minutes past nine in the morning i observed the flood to come from the southward though at restoration island i thought it came from the northward i think captain cook mentions that he found a great irregularity in the set of the flood of this coast we steered for the key seen in the northwest by north where we arrived just at dark but found it so surrounded by a reef of rocks that i could not land without danger of staving the boat and on that account we came to a grapnel for the night monday june one at dawn of day we got on shore and tracked the boat into shelter for the wind blowing fresh without and the ground being rocky it was not safe to trust her at a grapnel lest she be blown to sea i was therefore obliged to let her ground in the course of the ebb from appearances i expected that if we remained till night we should meet with turtle as we discovered recent tracks of them innumerable birds of a naughty kind made this island their resting-place so that we had reason to flatter ourselves with hopes of getting supplies in greater abundance than it had hitherto been in our power our situation was at least four leagues distant from the main we were on the northwesternmost of four small keys which were surrounded by a reef of rocks connected by sandbanks except between the two northernmost and there it likewise was dry at low water the whole forming a lagoon island into which the tide flowed at this entrance i kept the boat as usual i sent parties away in search of supplies but to our great disappointment we could only get a few clams and some delicios with these and the oysters we had brought from sunday island i made up a mess for dinner with the addition of a small quantity of bread towards noon nelson and some others who had been to the easternmost key returned but nelson was in so weak a condition that he was obliged to be supported by two men his complaint was a violent heat in his bowels a loss of sight much drought and an inability to walk this i found was occasioned by his being unable to support the heat of the sun and that when he was fatigued and faint instead of retiring into the shade to rest he had continued to attempt more than his strength was equal to i was glad to find that he had no fever and it was now that the little wine which i had so carefully saved became of real use i gave it in small quantities with some pieces of bread soaked in it and he soon began to recover 
the boatswain and carpenter also were ill and complained of headache and sickness of the stomach others who had not had any evacuation by stool became shockingly distressed with the tenismus so that there were but few without complaints an idea prevailed that the sickness of the boatswain and carpenter were occasioned by eating the delisos myself however and some others who had taken the same food felt no inconvenience but the truth was that many of the people had eaten a large quantity of them raw and nelson informed me that they were constantly teasing him whenever a berry was found to know if it was good to eat so that it would not have been surprising if many of them had been really poisoned our dinner was not so well relished as at sunday island because we had mixed the delisos with our stew the oysters and soup however was eaten by every one except nelson whom i fed with a few small pieces of bread soaked in half a glass of wine and he continued to mend in my walk round the island i found several coconut shells the remains of an old wigwam and the backs of two turtles but no sign of any quadruped one of the people found three sea fowls eggs as is common on such spots the soil is little other than sand yet it produced small toa trees and some others that we were not acquainted with there were fish in the lagoon but we could not catch any our wants therefore were not likely to be supplied here not even with water for our daily expense nevertheless i determined to wait till the morning that we might try our success in the night for turtle and birds a quiet night's rest also i conceived would be of essential service to those who were unwell the wigwam and turtle shells were proof that the natives at time visited this place and that they had canoes the remains of the large canoe that we saw at sunday island left no room to doubt but i did not apprehend that we ran any risk by remaining here a short time i directed our fire however to be made in the thicket that we might not be discovered by its light at noon i observed the latitude of this island to be eleven degrees forty seven minutes south the mainland extended towards the northwest and was full of white sand hills another small island lay within us bearing west by north one quarter north three leagues distant our situation being very low we could see nothing of the reef towards the sea the afternoon was advantageously spent in sleep there were however a few not disposed to it and those were employed in dressing some clams to take with us for the next day's dinner others we cut up in slices to dry which i knew was the most valuable supply we could find here but they were very scarce towards evening i cautioned every one against making too large a fire or suffering it after dark to blaze up mr samuel and mr peckover had superintendence of this business while i was strolling about the beach to observe if i thought it could be seen from the main i was just satisfied that it could not when on a sudden the island appeared all in a blaze that might have been discerned at a much more considerable distance i ran to learn the cause and found it was occasioned by the imprudence and obstinacy of one of the party who in my absence had insisted in having a fire to himself in making which the flames caught the neighbouring grass and rapidly spread this misconduct might have produced very serious consequences by discovering our situation to the natives for if they had attacked us we had neither arms nor strength to oppose an enemy thus the relief which i expected from a little sleep was totally lost and i anxiously waited for the flowing of the tide that we might proceed to sea it was high water at half-past five this evening whence i deduced the time on the full and change of the moon to be fifty-eight past ten in the morning the rise was nearly five feet i could not observe the set of the flood but imagined it to come from the southward and that i was mistaken at restoration island as i found the time of high water gradually later the more we advanced to the northward at restoration island high water full and change seven hours ten sunday island high water full and change nine hours nineteen here high water full and change ten hours fifty eight after eight o'clock mr samuel and mr peckover went out to watch for turtle and three men went to the east key to endeavour to catch birds 
all the others complaining of being sick took their rest except mr hayward and mr elphinston whom i directed to keep watch about midnight the bird party returned with only twelve noddies birds which i have already described to be about the size of pigeons but if it had not been for the folly and obstinacy of one of the party who separated from the other two and disturbed the birds they might have caught a great number i was so much provoked at my plans being thus defeated i gave this offender a good beating footnote robert lamb this man when he came to java acknowledged he had eaten nine birds raw after he had separated from his two companions End of footnote. i now went in search of the turtling party who had taken great pains but without success this did not surprise me as it was not to be expected the turtle would come near us after the noise which had been made at the beginning of the evening in extinguishing the fire i therefore desired them to come back but they requested to stay a little longer as they still hoped to find some before daylight however they returned by three o'clock without any reward for their labor tuesday two the birds we half dressed that they might keep the better and these with a few clams made the whole of the supply procured here i tied a few gilt buttons and some pieces of iron to a tree for any of the natives that might come after us and finding my invalids much better for their night's rest we embarked and departed by dawn of day wind at southeast course to the north by west when we had run two leagues to the northward the sea suddenly became rough which not having before experienced since we were within the reefs i concluded to be occasioned by an open channel to the ocean soon afterwards we met with a large shoal on which were two sandy keys between these and two others four miles to the west i passed on to the northward the sea still continuing to be rough towards noon i fell in with six other keys most of which produced some small trees and brushwood these formed a pleasing contrast with the mainland we had passed which was full of sand hills the country continued hilly and the northernmost land the same we had seen from the lagoon island appeared like downs sloping towards the sea nearly abreast of us was a flat-topped hill which on account of its shape i called pudding pan hill and a little to the northward were two other hills which we called the paps and here was a small tract of country without sand the eastern part of which forms a cape whence the coast inclines to the northwest by north at noon i observed in the latitude eleven degrees eighteen minutes south the cape bearing west distant ten miles five small keys bore from the northeast to southeast the nearest of them about two miles distant and a low sandy key between us and the cape bore west distant four miles my course from the lagoon island had been north half west distance thirty miles i am sorry it was not in my power to obtain a sufficient knowledge of the depth of water but in our situation nothing could be undertaken that might have occasioned delay it may however be understood that to the best of my judgment from appearances a ship may pass wherever i have omitted to represent danger i divided six birds and issued one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread with half a pint of water to each person for dinner and i gave half a glass of wine to nelson who was now so far recovered as to require no other indulgence the gunner when he left the ship brought his watch with him at which we had regulated out time till to-day when unfortunately it stopped so that noon sunrise and sunset are the only parts of the twenty-four hours which from henceforward i can speak with certainty as to time the wind blew fresh from the south-south-east and south-east all the afternoon with fair weather as we stood in to the north by west we found more sea which i attributed to our receiving less shelter from the reefs to the eastward it is probable they did not extend so far north as this at least it may be concluded that there is not a continued barrier to prevent shipping having access to the shore i observed that the stream set to the northwest which i considered to be the flood in some places along the coast we saw patches of wood at five o'clock steering to the northwest 
we passed a large and fair inlet into which i imagine there is a safe and commodious entrance it lies in latitude eleven degrees south about three leagues to the northward of this is an island at which we arrived about sunset and took shelter for the night under a sandy point which was the only part we could land at this being rather a wild situation i thought it best to sleep in the boat nevertheless i sent a party away to see if anything could be got but they returned without success they saw a great number of turtle bones and shells where the natives had been feasting and their last visit seemed to be of late date the island was covered with wood but in other respects it was a lump of rocks wednesday three we lay at grapnel till daylight with a very fresh gale and cloudy weather the main bore from south-east by south to north-northwest half-west three leagues and a mountainous island with a flat top north by west four or five leagues between which and the mainland were several other islands the spot we were at which i call turtle island lies in latitude by account ten degrees fifty two minutes south and forty two miles west from restoration island abreast of it the coast has the appearance of a sandy desert but improves about three leagues farther to the northward where it terminates in a point near to which are many small islands i sailed between these islands where i found no bottom at twelve fathoms the high mountainous island with a flat top and four rocks to the southeast of it that i call the brothers being on my starboard hand soon after an extensive opening appeared in the mainland in which were a number of high islands i called this the bay of islands we continued steering to the northwest several islands and keys were in sight to the northward the most northerly island was mountainous having on it a very high round hill and a smaller was remarkable for a single peaked hill the coast to the northward and westward of the bay of islands is high and woody and has a broken appearance with many islands close to it among which there are fine bays and convenient places for shipping the northernmost of these islands i call wednesday island to the northwest of this we fell in with a large reef which i believe joins a number of keys that were in sight from the northwest to the east northeast we therefore stood to the southwest half a league when it was noon and i had a good observation of the latitude in ten degrees thirty one minutes south wednesday island bore east by south five miles the westernmost land in sight southwest two or three leagues the islands to the northward from northwest by west to northeast and the reef from west to northeast distant one mile i was now tolerably certain that we should be clear of new holland in the afternoon i know not how far this reef extends it may be a continuation or a detached part of the range of shoals that surround the coast i believe the mountainous islands to be separate from the shoals and have no doubt that near them may be found good passages for ships but i rather recommend to those who are to pass the strait from the eastward to take their direction from the coast of new guinea yet i likewise think that a ship coming from the southward will find a fair strait in the latitude of ten degrees south i much wish to have ascertained this point but in our distressful situation any increase of fatigue or loss of time might have been attended with the most fatal consequences i therefore determined to pass on without delay as an addition to our dinner of bread and water i served to each person six oysters at two o'clock in the afternoon as we were steering to the southwest towards the westernmost part of the land in sight we fell in with some large sandbanks that run off from the coast i therefore called this shoal cape we were obliged to steer to the northward again till we got round the shoals when i directed the course to the west at four o'clock the westernmost of the islands to the northward bore north four leagues wednesday island east by north five leagues and shoal cape southeast by east two leagues a small island was seen bearing west at which we arrived before dark and found that it was only a rock where boobies resort for which reason i called it booby island here terminated the rocks and shoals of the north part of new holland for except booby island no land was seen to the westward of south after three o'clock this afternoon
i find that booby island was seen by captain cook and by a remarkable coincidence of ideas received from him the same name but i cannot with certainty reconcile the situation with some parts of the coast that i have seen to his survey i ascribe this to the various forms in which land appears when seen from the different heights of a ship and a boat the chart i have given is by no means meant to supersede that made by captain cook who had better opportunities than i had and was in every respect properly provided for surveying the intention of mine is chiefly to render this narrative more intelligible and to show in what manner the coast appeared to me from an open boat i have little doubt but that the opening which i named the bay of islands is endeavour straits and that our track was to the northward of prince of wales isles perhaps by those who shall hereafter navigate these seas more advantage may be derived from the possession of both our charts than from either of them singly End of chapter sixteen Chapter seventeen of a voyage to the south sea this librivox recording is in the public domain a voyage to the south sea by william bligh chapter seventeen passage from new holland to the island timor arrive at kapang reception there june seventeen eighty nine wednesday three at eight o'clock in the evening we once more launched into the open ocean miserable as our situation was in every respect i was secretly surprised to see that it did not appear to affect any one so strongly as myself on the contrary it seemed as if they had embarked on a voyage to timor in a vessel sufficiently calculated for safety and convenience so much confidence gave me great pleasure and i may venture to assert that to this cause our preservation is chiefly to be attributed i encouraged every one with hopes that eight or ten days would bring us to a land of safety and after praying to god for a continuance of his most gracious protection i served an allowance of water for supper and directed our course to the west southwest to counteract the southerly winds in case they should blow strong we had been just six days on the coast of new holland in the course of which we found oysters a few clams some birds and water but perhaps a benefit nearly equal to this we received by having been relieved from the fatigue of being constantly in the boat and enjoying good rest at night these advantages certainly preserved our lives and small as the supply was i am very sensible how much it alleviated our distresses by this time nature must have sunk under the extremes of hunger and fatigue some would have ceased to struggle for a life that only promised wretchedness and misery and others though possessed of more bodily strength must soon have followed their unfortunate companions even in our present situation we were the most deplorable objects but the hopes of a speedy relief kept up our spirits for my own part incredible as it may appear i felt neither extreme hunger nor thirst my allowance contented me knowing i could have no more thursday four i served one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and an allowance of water for breakfast and the same for dinner with an addition of six oysters to each person at noon latitude observed ten degrees forty-eight minutes south course since yesterday noon south eighty-one degrees west distance one hundred eleven miles longitude by account from shoal cape one degree forty five minutes west a strong trade wind at east southeast with fair weather this day we saw a number of water snakes that were ringed yellow and black and towards noon we passed a great deal of rock weed though the weather was fair we were constantly shipping water which kept two men always employed to bail the boat friday five at noon i observed in latitude ten degrees forty five minutes south our course since yesterday west one quarter north one hundred eight miles longitude made three degrees thirty five minutes west 
Six oysters were, as yesterday, served to each man in addition to the usual allowance of bread and water. In the evening a few boobies came about us, one of which I caught with my hand. The blood was divided among three of the men who were weakest, but the bird I ordered to be kept for our dinner the next day. Served a quarter of a pint of water for supper, and to some who were most in need, half a pint. In the course of the night, being constantly wet with the sea, we suffered much cold and shiverings. Saturday, 6. At daylight I found that some of the clams which had been hung up to dry for sea store were stolen, but every one solemnly denied having any knowledge of it. This forenoon we saw a gannet, a sand lark, and some water snakes, which in general were from two to three feet long. The usual allowance of bread and water was served for breakfast, and the same for dinner with the bird, which I distributed in the usual way of who shall have this. I proposed to make to more about the latitude of nine degrees thirty minutes south, or ten degrees south. At noon I observed the latitude to be ten degrees nineteen minutes south, course north seventy-seven degrees west, distance one hundred seventeen miles, longitude made from Shoal Cape, the north part of New Holland, five degrees thirty-one minutes west. In the afternoon I took an opportunity of examining our store of bread, and found remaining nineteen days' allowance, at the former rate of serving one twenty-fifth of a pound three times a day. Therefore, as I saw every prospect of a quick passage, I again ventured to grant an allowance for supper, agreeable to my promise at the time it was discontinued. Sunday, 7. We passed the night miserably wet and cold, and in the morning I heard heavy complaints. The sea was high and breaking over us. I could only afford the allowance of bread and water for breakfast, but for dinner I gave out an ounce of dried clams to each person, which was all that remained. At noon I altered the course to west-northwest to keep more from the sea, as the wind blew strong. Latitude observed nine degrees thirty-one minutes south, course north fifty-seven degrees west, distance eighty-eight miles, longitude made six degrees forty-six minutes west. The sea ran very high all this day, and we had frequent showers of rain, so that we were continually wet, and suffered much cold in the night. Mr. Ledward, the surgeon, and Lawrence Lebeau, an old hardy seaman, appeared to be giving way very fast. I could only assist them by a teaspoon or two of wine, which I had carefully saved, expecting such a melancholy necessity. Monday, 8. Wind at southeast. The weather was more moderate than it had been for some days past. A few gannets were seen. At noon I observed in 8 degrees 45 minutes south, course west-northwest one-quarter west, 106 miles, longitude made 8 degrees 23 minutes west. The sea being smooth, I steered west by south. At four in the afternoon we caught a small dolphin, which was the first relief of the kind that we obtained. I issued about two ounces to each person, including the offals, and saved the remainder for dinner the next day. Towards evening the wind freshened and it blew strong all night, so that we shipped much water and suffered greatly from the wet and cold. Tuesday, 9. At daylight as usual I heard much complaining, which my own feelings convinced me was too well founded. I gave the surgeon and Lobo a little wine, but I could afford them no further relief except encouraging them with hopes that a very few days longer, at our present fine rate of sailing, would bring us to Timor. Gannets, boobies, men of war, and tropic birds were constantly about us. Served the usual allowance of bread and water, and at noon we dined on the remains of the dolphin, which amounted to about an ounce per man. I observed the latitude to be 9 degrees 9 minutes south, longitude made 10 degrees 8 minutes west, course since yesterday noon south 76 degrees west, distance 107 miles. This afternoon I suffered great sickness from the nature of part of the stomach of the fish which had fallen to my share at dinner. At sunset served an allowance of bread and water for supper. Wednesday, 10. 
in the morning after a very comfortless night there was a visible alteration for the worse in many of the people which gave me great apprehensions an extreme weakness swelled legs hollow and ghastly countenances a more than common inclination to sleep with an apparent debility of understanding seemed to me the melancholy presages of an approaching dissolution the surgeon and le boy in particular were most miserable objects i occasionally gave them a few teaspoonsfuls of wine out of the little that remained which greatly assisted them the hopes of being able to accomplish the voyage was our principal support the boatswain very innocently told me that he really thought I looked worse than any one in the boat. The simplicity with which he uttered such an opinion amused me, and I returned him a better compliment. Our latitude at noon was nine degrees sixteen minutes south, longitude from the north part of New Holland twelve degrees one minute west, course since yesterday noon west half south one hundred eleven miles birds and rockweed showed that we were not far from land but i expected such signs here as there are many islands between the east part of timor and new guinea the night was more moderate than the last thursday eleven every one received the customary allowance of bread and water and an extra allowance of water was given to those who were most in need at noon i observed in latitude nine degrees forty one minutes south course seventy seven degrees west distance one hundred nine miles longitude made thirteen degrees forty nine minutes west i had little doubt of having now passed the meridian of the eastern part of timor which is laid down in one hundred twenty eight degrees east this diffused universal joy and satisfaction in the afternoon we saw gannets and many other birds, and at sunset we kept a very anxious lookout. In the evening we caught a booby which I reserved for our dinner the next day. Friday, 12. At three in the morning, with an excess of joy, we discovered some more bearing from west-southwest to west-northwest, and I hauled on a wind to the north-northeast till daylight, when the land bore from southwest by south, to northeast by north our distance from the shore two leagues it is not possible for me to describe the pleasure which the blessings of the sight of this land diffused among us it appeared scarce credible to ourselves that in an open boat and so poorly provided we should have been able to reach the coast of timor in forty-one days after leaving tafoya having in that time run by our log a distance of three thousand six hundred eighteen miles and that notwithstanding our extreme distress no one should have perished in the voyage i have already mentioned that i knew not where the dutch settlement was situated but i had a faint idea it was at the southwest part of the island i therefore after daylight bore away along shore to the south southwest which I was the more readily induced to do as the wind would not suffer us to go towards the northeast without great loss of time. The day gave us a most agreeable prospect of the land, which was interspersed with woods and lawns, the interior part mountainous, but the shore low. Towards noon the coast became higher with some remarkable headlands. We were greatly delighted with the general look of the country which exhibited many cultivated spots and beautiful situations, but we could only see a few small huts, whence I concluded that no European resided in this part of the island. Much sea ran on the shore which made landing impracticable. At noon we were abreast of a high headland, the extremes of the land bore southwest half west and north northeast half east our distance offshore being three miles latitude by observation nine degrees fifty nine minutes south and my longitude by dead reckoning from the north part of new holland fifteen degrees six minutes west with the usual allowance of bread and water for dinner i divided the bird we had caught the night before and to the surgeon and le bon i gave a little wine the wind blew fresh at east and east southeast with very hazy weather during the afternoon we continued our course along a low shore covered with innumerable palm-trees called the fan-palm from the leaf spreading like a fan 
but here we saw no signs of cultivation nor had the country so fine an appearance as to the eastward this however was only a small tract for by sunset it improved again and i saw several great smokes where the inhabitants were clearing and cultivating their grounds we had now run twenty-five miles to the west-southwest since noon and were west five miles from a low point which in the afternoon i imagine had been the southernmost land and here the coast formed a deep bend with low land in the bight that appeared like islands the west shore was high but from this part of the coast to the high cape which we were abreast of at noon the shore is low and i believe shoal i particularly remarked this situation because here the very high ridge of the mountains that run from the east end of the island terminate and the appearance of the country changes for the worse that we might not run past any settlement in the night i determined to preserve my situation till the morning and therefore brought two under a close reefed foresail we were here in shoal water our distance from the shore being half a league the westernmost land in sight bearing west southwest half west served bread and water for supper and the boat lying to very well all but the officer of the watch endeavoured to get a little sleep saturday thirteen at two in the morning we wore and stood in shore till daylight when i found we had drifted during the night about three leagues to the west southwest the southernmost land in sight bearing west on examining the coast and not seeing any sign of a settlement we bore away to the westward having a strong gale against a weather current which occasioned much sea the shore was high and covered with wood but we did not run far before low land again formed the coast the points of which opening at west i once more fancied we were on the south part of the island but at ten o'clock we found the coast again inclining towards the south part of it bearing west southwest half west at the same time high land appeared in the southwest but the weather was so hazy that it was doubtful whether the two lands were separated the opening only extending one point of the compass for this reason i stood towards the outer land and found it to be the island roti i returned to the shore we had left and brought to a grapnel in the sandy bay that i might more conveniently calculate my situation in this place we saw several smokes where the natives were clearing their grounds during the little time we remained here the master and carpenter very much importuned me to let them go in search of supplies to which at length i assented but not finding any other person willing to be of their party they did not choose to quit the boat i stopped here no longer than for the purpose just mentioned and we continued steering along shore we had a view of a beautiful-looking country as if formed by art into lawns and parks the coast is low and covered with woods in which are innumerable fan palm trees that look like coconut walks the interior part is high land but very different from the more eastern parts of the island where it is exceedingly mountainous and to appearance the soil better at noon the island roti bore southwest by west seven leagues i had no observation for the latitude but by account we were in ten degrees twelve minutes south our course since yesterday noon being south seventy seven degrees west fifty four miles the usual allowance of bread and water was served for breakfast and dinner and to the surgeon and lebeau i continued to give wine we had a strong breeze at east southeast with hazy weather all the afternoon at two o'clock having run through a very dangerous breaking sea the cause of which i attributed to be a strong tide setting to windward and shoal water we discovered a spacious bay or sound with a fair entrance about two or three miles wide i now conceived hopes that our voyage was nearly at an end as no place could appear more eligible for shipping or more likely to be chosen for a european settlement i therefore came to a grapnel near the east side of the entrance in a small sandy bay where we saw a hut a dog and some cattle and i immediately set the boatswain and gunner away to the hut to discover the inhabitants the southwest point of the entrance bore west half south three miles the southeast point south by west three quarters of a mile and the island rotai from south by west one quarter west 
to southwest one quarter west about five leagues as we lay there i found the ebb came from the northward and before our departure the falling of the tide discovered to us a reef of rocks about two cables length from the shore the whole being covered at high water renders it dangerous on the opposite shore there appeared very high breakers but there is nevertheless plenty of room and certainly a safe channel for a first-rate man of war the bay or sound within seemed to be of considerable extent the northern part being about five leagues distant here the land made in moderate risings joined by lower grounds but the island rote to the southward is the best mark by which to know this place i had just time to make these remarks when i saw the boatswain and gunner returning with some of the natives i therefore no longer doubted of our success and that our expectations would be fully gratified they brought five indians and informed me they had found two families where the women treated them with european politeness from these people i learned that the governor resided in a place called kapang which was some distance to the northeast i made signs for one of them to go in the boat and show us the way to kapang intimating that i would pay him for his troubles the man readily complied and came into the boat these people were of a dark tawny colour had long black hair and chewed a great deal of beetle their dress was a square piece of cloth round the hips in the folds of which was stuck a large knife a handkerchief wrapped round the head and another hanging by the four corners from the shoulders which served as a bag for their beetle equipage they brought us a few pieces of dried turtle and some ears of indian corn this last was the most welcome for the turtle was so hard that it could not be eaten without being first soaked in hot water they offered to bring us some other refreshments if i would wait but as the pilot was willing i determined to push on it was about half an hour past four when we sailed by the direction of the pilot we kept close to the east shore under all our sail but as night came on the wind died away and we were obliged to try at the oars which i was surprised to see we could use with some effect at ten o'clock finding we advanced but slowly i came to a grapnel and for the first time i issued double allowance of bread and a little wine to each person sunday fourteen at one o'clock in the morning after the most happy and sweet sleep that ever men enjoyed we weighed and continued to keep the east shore on board in very smooth water when at last we found we were again open to the sea the whole of the land to the westward that we had passed being an island which the pilot called pulo samo the northern entrance of this channel was about a mile and a half or two miles wide and i had no ground at ten fathoms the report of two cannon that were fired gave new life to every one and soon after we discovered two square-rigged vessels and a cutter at anchor to the eastward we endeavoured to work to windward but were obliged to take to our oars again having lost ground on each tack we kept close to the shore and continued rowing until four o'clock when i brought to a grapnel and gave another allowance of bread and wine to all hands as soon as we had rested a little we weighed again and rowed till near daylight when we came to a grapnel off a small fort in town which the pilot told me was kapang among the things which the boatswain had thrown into the boat before we left the ship was a bundle of signal flags that had been used by the boats to show the depth of the water and soundings with these we had in the course of the passage made a small jack which i now hoisted in the main shrouds as a signal of distress for i did not think it proper to land without leave soon after daybreak a soldier hailed us to land which i immediately did among a crowd of indians and was agreeably surprised to meet with an english sailor who belonged to one of the vessels in the road his captain told me he was the second person in the town i therefore desired to be conducted to him as i was informed the governor was ill and could not be spoken with captain spikerman received me with great humanity i informed him of our distressed situation and requested the care might be taken of those who were with me without delay on which he gave directions for their immediate reception at his own house and went himself to the governor to know at what time i could be permitted to see him 
which was fixed to be eleven o'clock. I now desired my people to come on shore, which was as much as some of them could do, being scarce able to walk. They, however, were helped to the house, and found tea with bread and butter provided for their breakfast. The abilities of a painter, perhaps, could seldom have been displayed to more advantage than in the delineation of the two groups of figures which at this time presented themselves to each other. An indifferent spectator would have been at a loss which most to admire, the eyes of famine sparkling at immediate relief, or the horror of their preservers at the sight of so many spectres whose ghastly countenances, if the cause had been unknown, would rather have excited terror than pity. Our bodies were nothing but skin and bones, our limbs were full of sores, and we were clothed in rags. In this condition, with the tears of joy and gratitude flowing down our cheeks, the people of Timor beheld us with a mixture of horror, surprise, and pity. The governor, Mr. William Adrian Van Est, notwithstanding extreme ill health, became so anxious about us that I saw him before the appointed time. He received me with great affection and gave me the fullest proofs that he was possessed of every feeling of a humane and good man. Sorry as he was, he said, that such a calamity could ever have happened to us, yet he considered it to be the greatest blessing of his life that we had fallen under his protection, and, though his infirmity was so great that he could not do the office of a friend himself, he would give such orders as I might be certain would procure us every supply we wanted. A house should be immediately prepared for me, and with respect to my people he said that I might have room for them either at the hospital or on board of Captain Spikerman's ship which lay in the road, and he expressed much uneasiness that Capang could not afford them better accommodations, the house being assigned to me being the only one uninhabited and the situation of the few families that lived at this place such that they could not conveniently receive strangers. For the present, till matters could be properly regulated, he gave direction that victuals for my people should be dressed at his own house. On returning to Captain Sparkerman's house, I found that every kind of relief had been given to my people. The surgeon had dressed their sores, and the cleaning of their persons had not been less attended to, several friendly gifts of apparel having been presented to them. I desired to be shown to the house that was intended for me, which I found ready with servants to attend. It consisted of a hall, with a room at each end, and a loft overhead, and was surrounded by a piazza, with an outer apartment in one corner, and a communication from the back part of the house to the street. I therefore determined, instead of separating from my people, to lodge them all with me, and I divided the house as follows. One room I took to myself, the other I allotted to the master, surgeon, Mr. Nelson, and the gunner, and the loft to the other officers, and the outer apartment to the men. The hall was common to the officers, and the men had the back piazza. Of this disposition I informed the governor, and he sent down chairs, tables, and benches, with bedding and other necessaries for the use of every one. The governor, when I took my leave, had desired me to acquaint him with everything of which I stood in need, but it was only at particular times that he had a few moments of ease, or could attend to anything, being in a dying state with an incurable disease." On this account I transacted whatever business I had with Mr. Timotheus Wanjon, the second of this place, who was the governor's son-in-law, and who also contributed everything in his power to make our situation comfortable. I had been, therefore, misinformed by the seaman who told me that Captain Spikerman was the next person in command to the governor. At noon a dinner was brought to the house sufficiently good to make persons more accustomed to plenty eat too much. Yet I believe few in such a situation would have observed more moderation than my people did. My greatest apprehension was that they would eat too much fruit, of which there was a great variety in season at this time. Having seen every one enjoy this meal of plenty, I dined myself with Mr. Wanjon, but I felt no extraordinary inclination to eat or drink. Rest and quiet I considered as more necessary to the re-establishment of my health, and therefore retired soon to my room, which I found furnished with every convenience. 
but instead of rest my mind was disposed to reflect on our late sufferings and on the failure of the expedition but above all in the thanks due to almighty god who had given us power to support and bear such heavy calamities and had enabled me at last to be the means of saving eighteen lives in times of difficulty there will generally arise circumstances that bear particularly hard on a commander in our late situation it was not the least of my distresses to be constantly assailed with the melancholy demands of my people for an increase of allowance which it grieved me to refuse the necessity of observing the most rigid economy in the distribution of our provisions was so evident that i resisted their solicitations and never deviated from the agreement we made at setting out the consequence of this care was that at our arrival we had still remaining sufficient for eleven days at our scanty allowance and if we had been so unfortunate as to have missed the dutch settlement at timor we could have proceeded to java where i was certain that every supply we wanted could be procured another disagreeable circumstance to which my situation exposed me was the caprice of ignorant people had i been incapable of acting they would have carried the boat on shore as soon as we made the island of timor without considering that landing among the natives at a distance from the european settlement might have been as dangerous as among any other indians the quantity of provisions with which we left the ship was not more than we should have consumed in five days had there been no necessity for husbanding our stock the mutineers must naturally have concluded that we could have no other place of refuge than the friendly islands for it was not likely they should imagine that so poorly equipped as we were in every respect there could have been a possibility of our attempting to return homewards much less can they suspect that the account of their villainy has already reached their native country when i reflect how providentially our lives were saved at tofoya by the indians delaying their attack and that with scarce anything to support life we crossed a sea of more than one thousand two hundred leagues without shelter from the inclemency of the weather when i reflect that in an open boat with so much stormy weather we escaped foundering that not any of us were taken off by disease that we had the great good fortune to pass the unfriendly natives of other countries without accident and at last happily to meet with the most friendly and best of people to relieve our distresses i say when i reflect on all these wonderful escapes the remembrance of such great mercies enables me to bear with resignation and cheerfulness the failure of an expedition the success of which i had so much at heart and which was frustrated at a time when i was congratulating myself on the fairest prospect of being able to complete it in a manner that would fully have answered the intention of his majesty and the humane promoters of so benevolent a plan with respect to the preservation of our health during the course of sixteen days of heavy and almost continual rain i would recommend to every one in a similar situation the method we practised which is to dip their clothes in the salt water and wring them out as often as they become filled with rain it was the only resource we had and i believe was of the greatest service to us for it felt more like a change of dry clothes than could well be imagined we had occasion to do this so often that at length all our clothes were wrung to pieces for except the few days we passed on the coast of new holland we were continually wet either with rain or sea thus through the assistance of divine providence we surmounted the difficulties and distresses of a most perilous voyage and arrived safe in an hospitable port where every necessary and comfort were administered to us with a most liberal hand End of chapter seventeen Chapter eighteen of A Voyage to the South Sea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter eighteen. At Kapang. June seventeen eighty nine. Timor. 
From the great humanity and attention of the governor and the gentlemen at Kapang, we received every kind of assistance, and were not long without evident signs of returning health. Shortly after our arrival, I presented to the governor a formal account of the loss of the bounty, and a requisition in his majesty's name that instructions might be sent to all the Dutch settlements to stop the ship if she made her appearance. With this, a complete descriptive list of the mutineers was given. I likewise requested at one of my first visits to the governor that Nelson might have permission to walk about the country in search of plants, which was readily granted with an offer of whatever assistance I should think necessary and the governor assured me that the country was well worth examination as it abounded with many curious and medicinal plants from this indulgence i derived no benefit for nelson who since we left new holland had been but in a weak condition about this time was taken ill in consequence of a cold caused by imprudently leaving off warm clothing to secure our arrival at batavia before the october fleet sailed for europe i gave public notice of my intention to hire a vessel to carry us to batavia in consequence of this notice several offers were made but none that i thought reasonable which determined me to purchase a small schooner in the road that was thirty-four feet long for which i gave one thousand rix dollars and fitted her for sea under the name of his majesty's schooner resource as the coast of java is frequently infested with small piratical vessels it was necessary that we should be provided with the proper means of defence in this i was assisted by the friendship of mr wanjon who supplied me with four brass swivels fourteen stand of small arms and ammunition which he obligingly let me have as a loan to be returned at batavia july twenty on the twentieth of july i had the misfortune to lose mr david nelson he died of an inflammatory fever the loss of this honest man i very much lamented he had with great care and diligence attended to the object for which he was sent and had always been ready to forward every plan that was proposed for the good of the service in which we were engaged he was not less useful on our voyage hither in the course of which he gave me great satisfaction by the patience and fortitude with which he conducted himself july twenty one this day i was employed attending the funeral of mr nelson the corpse was carried by twelve soldiers dressed in black preceded by the minister next followed myself and the second governor then ten gentlemen of the town and the officers of the ships in the harbour and after them my own officers and people after reading our burial service the body was interred behind the chapel and the burying ground appropriated to the europeans of the town i was sorry i could get no tombstone to place over his remains this was the second voyage mr nelson had undertaken to the south seas having been sent out by sir joseph banks to collect plants seeds etc in captain cook's last voyage and now after surmounting so many difficulties and in the midst of thankfulness for his deliverance he was called upon to pay the debt of nature at the time least expected august twenty our schooner being victualled and ready for sea on the twentieth of august i took an affectionate leave of the hospitable and friendly inhabitants of kapang and embarked in the afternoon we sailed having the launch which had so much contributed to our preservation in tow we exchanged salutes with the fort and shipping as we ran out of the harbour the town of kapang is situated in a great bay which is an excellent road for shipping the latitude of the town is ten degrees twelve minutes south according to the dutch charts it is in one hundred twenty one degrees fifty one minutes east longitude taking the mean between the longitude by my reckoning on our arrival at Kapang and the longitude afterwards calculated from our run to Batavia, gives me for the longitude of Kapang 124 degrees 41 minutes east. This settlement was formed in the year 1630 and is the only one the Dutch have on the island to moor. They have residents in different parts of the country. On the north side of Timor there is a Portuguese settlement. The product of the island is chiefly sandalwood and beeswax. The former article is now scarce. 
Wax they have in great plenty. The bees build their nests in bushes and in the boughs of trees to which the natives cannot approach but with fire. The honey is put into jars, and the wax is run into blocks of three feet in length and from twelve to fifteen inches square. The natives, at least those who live in the neighborhood of Kapang, are of a very indolent disposition, of which the Chinese have taken advantage, for, though the Malays are very fond of traffic, most of their trade is carried on in small Chinese vessels of from ten to thirty tons burden. There is a market at Kapang for the country people in which, however, there is little business done. I have seen a man from the country come to market with two potatoes, and this is not unusual. These being sold for two doits, equal to a halfpenny English, serve to supply him with beetle to chew, and the rest of the day is passed in lounging about the town. The inland people, who live at a distance from the Europeans, are strong and active, but their want of cleanliness subjects them to filthy diseases. The chief of the natives, or king of the island, is by the Dutch-styled Kafir, emperor. This prince lives at a place called Bakanazi, about four miles distant from Kapang. His authority over the natives is not wholly undisputed, which is by the Dutch attributed to the intrigues of the Portuguese, who are on the north part of Timor. The island has lately suffered much by a competition between the present king and one of his nephews, which caused a civil war that lasted from the beginning of the year 1786 to 1788, when their differences were settled by a treaty, chiefly in favor of the king. The ravages committed in these disputes have occasioned a scarcity of provisions that probably, from the want of industry in the natives, will not soon be remedied. I had an opportunity of making a visit to the king. His dwelling was a large house which was divided into only three apartments and surrounded by a piazza, agreeably situated but very dirty, as was all the furniture. The king, who is an elderly man, received me with much civility, and ordered refreshments to be set before me, which were tea, rice cake, roasted Indian corn, and dried buffalo flesh, with about a pint of arrack, which I believe was all he had. His dress was a check wrapper girded round his waist with a silk and gold belt, a loose linen jacket, and a coarse handkerchief about his head. A few of his chiefs were with him who partook of our repast, after which the king retired with three of them for a short time, and when he returned presented me with a round plate of metal about four inches diameter, on which was stamped the figure of a star. As I had been informed that Erak would be an acceptable present, I was prepared to make a return which was well received. They never dilute their liquor, and from habit are able to drink a large quantity of spirits at a time without being intoxicated. When a king dies, a large feast is made to which all the inhabitants are invited. The body, after a few days, is put into a coffin which is closed up and kept three years before it is interned. The Dutch have been at some pains to establish Christianity among the natives, but it has not gained much ground, except in the neighborhood of Kapang. The present king was christened by the name Barnardus. His Indian name is Bakchi Banak. The scriptures are translated into the Malay language, and prayers are performed in the church at Kapang by a Malay clergyman in that language. I met at Timor with most of the fruits that are described in Captain Cook's first voyage as natives of Batavia, except the mangosteen. The breadfruit tree, called by the Malays Sokom, likewise grows here with great luxuriance and appears to be as much a native of this island as it is of Otaheite. The fruit is exactly of the same kind but not so good. A breadfruit of Timor weighs half as much more as one of equal size at Otaheite. It is not used here as bread, but generally eaten with milk and sugar. At Bacchanassi I saw about twenty of the trees, larger than any I had seen at Otaheite. Here also is a sort of breadfruit tree that produces seeds not unlike Windsor beans, and equally palatable, either boiled or roasted. No other part of the fruit is edible, and though the tree, I am told, is to all appearances the same as the other, the fruits have but little resemblance 
the fruit of this being covered with projecting points nearly half an inch in length i received a present of some fine plants from the governor which i was afterwards unfortunately obliged to leave at batavia for want of proper room to take care of them in the packet by which i returned to europe mr wanjohn likewise favoured me with some seeds for his majesty's garden at kew which i had the good fortune to deliver safe on my return and some of the mountain rice cultivated at timor on the dry land which was forwarded to his majesty's botanic garden at st vincent and to other parts in the west indies a resemblance of language between the people of the south sea islands and the inhabitants of many of the islands in the east indies has been remarked in captain cook's first voyage here the resemblance appeared stronger than has yet been noticed particularly in their numerals but besides the language i observed some customs among the people of timor still more striking for their similarity they practice the tuugi tuugi footnote the tuugi tuugi is described in captain cook's last voyage volume one page three hundred twenty three and the ru aa in the same voyage volume two page sixty four end of footnote they practice the tuugi tuugi of the friendly islands which they call tum bak and the rum ee of otaheite which they call ramas i likewise saw placed on their graves offerings of baskets with tobacco and beetle i left the governor mr van esty at the point of death to this gentleman our most gracious thanks are due to for the humane and friendly treatment that we received from him his ill state of health only prevented him from showing us more particular marks of attention unhappily it is to his memory only that i now pay this tribute it was a fortunate circumstance for us that mr wanjohn the next in place to the governor was equally humane and ready to relieve us his attention was unremitting and when there was a doubt about supplying me with money to enable me to purchase a vessel he cheerfully took it upon himself without which it was evident i should have been too late at bactivia to have sailed for europe with the october fleet i can only return such services by ever retaining a grateful remembrance of them mr max the town surgeon likewise behaved to us with the most disinterested humanity he attended every one with the utmost care for which i could not prevail on him to receive any payment or to render me any account or other answer than that it was his duty end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of a voyage to the south sea this librivox recording is in the public domain a voyage to the south sea by william bligh chapter nineteen from timor to batavia august seventeen eighty nine thursday twenty from kapang we steered northwest by west having a moderate breeze at southeast with fair weather saturday twenty two at daylight we saw the island flores to the northward at noon latitude observed nine degrees twenty seven minutes south and longitude by account from kapang two degrees ten minutes west our distance from the coast of flores was about ten leagues and two high peaked mountains bore north half east and north northwest these two mountains resemble each other in shape and the westernmost is a volcano the interior parts of flores are mountainous and woody but near the coastland is a fine open country a dutch map with which i was provided places the south part of flores in nine degrees three minutes south which i am of the opinion is too far south we steered along the south side of flores mostly with light winds and hazy weather so that we did not constantly keep sight of the coast tuesday twenty five at noon we were off tourne's island which bore northwest by north three or four leagues distant our latitude observed was eight degrees fifty seven minutes south and longitude made by dead reckoning from kapang three degrees twenty seven minutes west turns island is about four leagues in circuit and has a craggy and uneven appearance there is a curious high peak on the southwest part the land near the shore is low and woody thursday 
twenty seven on the twenty seventh at noon we were near the entrance of the straits of mangarin which not appearing so open and clear as represented in the map i steered for the straits of sapi intending to pass through but was obliged to give up this plan by strong current setting to the southeast which there was not sufficient wind to enable us to stem saturday twenty nine i therefore again stood for the straits of magarin which we ran through in the afternoon of the twenty ninth being favoured with a fresh breeze from the south south east on our first entering the straits we got close to the flores shore our course through was north half east we tried for soundings but could not anywhere find bottom at twenty five and thirty fathoms depth on the flores side there are many good harbours and bays where vessels may anchor but the country hereabouts appears burnt up and desolate i had no azimuth compass and consequently could not observe very accurately the variation but i believe there is so little in mangarin straits that no great error will be occasioned by considering the true and magnetic bearings to be the same when we had passed the straits we kept to the westward running along the north side of the island sumbawa where there is a very high mountain near the coast at the foot of which i am informed are many runs of good water conveniently situated for ships to supply themselves the latitude of the north part of sabawa i make by my observations and bearings to be eight degrees six minutes south which differs very little from the dutch charts monday thirty one in the night of the thirty first several prows were rowing about us on which account we kept all night under arms september thursday three this and the two following days we were sailing along the north side of the island lumbach on which there is a high mountain most of the islands in this route are distinguished by high mountains lumbach appears to be well clothed with wood in the nights we saw fires upon the high lands at a distance from the coast sunday six in the afternoon we saw the high land of cape sandana which is the northeast part of java monday seven the next day we were off cape sandana which is a low cape projecting from the high land already mentioned this cape is placed by the dutch maps in seven degrees fifty two minutes south but according to my observation and our estimated distance from the land i make it in seven degrees forty six minutes south latitude the longitude by my dead reckoning from capang to cape sandana was eleven degrees thirty three minutes west thursday ten we steered to the westward along the coast of java and on the tenth at noon we anchored off past Sourwang a dutch settlement on the coast of java and two fathoms distant from the shore half a league the entrance of the river bearing southwest the coast hereabouts is so shoal that large ships are obliged to anchor three or four miles from the land as soon as we were at anchor i got in my boat and went on shore the banks of the river near the entrance were mud on which grew a few mangrove bushes among them we saw hogs running and many were lying dead in the mud which caused a most intolerable stench and made me heartily repent having come here but after proceeding about a mile up the river the course of which was serpentine we found a very pleasant country and landed at a small and well-constructed fort where i was received in a friendly and polite manner by m adrian van rye the commandant by the return of the boat i sent on board a small bullock and other provisions i likewise took a pilot to conduct us to sarabaya the houses of Pasarang are neatly built and the country appears to be well cultivated the product of the settlement is rice of which they export large quantities there are but few dutch here the javanese are numerous and their chief lives with considerable splendour they have good roads and posts are established along the coast and it appears to be a busy and well-regulated settlement latitude seven degrees thirty six minutes south longitude one degree forty four minutes west of cape sandana friday eleven the next day about noon we sailed saturday twelve and on the twelfth in the evening anchored in sanbaya road in seven fathoms the flagstaff bearing south one-quarter west 
distance from the shore one mile. We found riding here seven square rigged and several smaller vessels. It was too late when we anchored to send the boat on shore. Sunday, 13. The next morning before daylight three guard boats stationed themselves near us, and I was informed that I must not land or send the boat on shore. This restriction, I learned from the officer of the guard boats, was in conformity to general orders concerning all strange vessels on their first arrival. At nine in the forenoon, leave came off for us to land, and soon after the guard boats quitted us. I was received on shore with great civility and friendship by the governor or upper host M. Ant Barquet and the commandant of the troops M. de Bois. By these gentlemen I was hospitably entertained and advised to remain till the 16th when some vessels were to sail, with whom I might keep company, which they recommend on account of pirates. Sarabaya is one of the most pleasant places I ever saw. It is situated on the banks of a river, and is a mile and a half distant from the seashore, so that only the flagstaff can be seen from the road. The river is navigable up to the town for vessels of one hundred tons burden, and the bank on one side is made convenient for tracking. The Chinese carry on a considerable trade here, and have a town or camp on the side of the river opposite to Sobaya. The country near the bay is flat and the soil light, so that they plow with a single bullock or buffalo, carabo. The interior parts of the country near the mountains are infested with a breed of fierce tigers, which makes traveling inland very dangerous. They have here a breed of horses which are small, but they are handsome and strong. The Javanese in this neighborhood are numerous. M. Barquet and M. de Bose took me with them to pay a visit to two of the principal natives, whom we found attended by a number of men armed with pikes in great military order. We were entertained with a concert of music. The instruments were gongs, drums, and a fiddle with two strings. I hired a pilot here to carry us to Batavia. Our latitude observed in Saboya Road was 7 degrees 11 minutes south. Longitude made from Cape Sandana, 1 degree, 52 minutes west. Thursday, 17. On the 17th, we sailed from Saboya in company with three prows. At noon, we anchored at Crissy, which is a town with a small fort belonging to the Dutch. We remained here about two hours and then weighed. Latitude of Crissy, 7 degrees, 9 minutes south. Longitude from Cape Sandana, 1 degree, 55 minutes west. The navigation through the Straits of Madura is so intricate that with the little opportunity I had, I am unable to undertake a description of it. Friday, 18. The next day, having passed the Straits, we bore away to the westward along the coast of Java in company with the prows before mentioned. Tuesday, 22. We had regular soundings all the way to Samarang, off which place we anchored on the 22nd in the afternoon, the church bearing southeast, distance from the shore half a league, depth of water two fathoms. The shoalness of the coast here makes the road of Samarang very inconvenient, both on account of the great distance that large ships, of which there were several in the road, are obliged to lay from the shore and of the landing which is in a river that cannot be entered before half flood this river resembles the one at passerwang the shores being low with offensive dead animals laying about i was met at the landing place by the equipage master and he furnished me with a carriage to carry me to the governor whose residence is about two miles from the town of samarang I requested and obtained leave to have our wants supplied, which were to recruit our provisions and get a mainmast, having sprung ours in the passage from Sarabaya. Samarang is a fortified town surrounded by a wall and ditch, and is the most considerable settlement next to Batavia that the Dutch have in Java. Here is a very good hospital and a public school, chiefly for teaching the mathematics. They likewise have a theatre. Provisions are remarkably cheap here, beef being at ten duets per pound and the price of a fowl, twelve duets. I experienced great civility from some of the gentlemen at Samarang, 
particularly from m le baron de bose a merchant brother to the m de bose commandant of the troops at sourabaya and from m abeg the surgeon of the hospital to whom we were indebted for advice and medicines for which he would not consent to receive payment the latitude of samarang is six degrees fifty seven minutes longitude by my reckoning from cape sandana four degrees seven minutes west saturday twenty six on the twenty sixth we sailed from samarang and with this a galley mounting six swivels which the governor had directed to accompany us to batavia october thursday one on the first of october we anchored in batavia road where we found riding a dutch ship of war and twenty sail of dutch east india ships besides many smaller vessels end of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of A Voyage to the South Sea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter Twenty Occurrences at Batavia and Passage Thence to England. October seventeen eighty nine. In the afternoon at four o'clock I went on shore, and landed at a house by the river where strangers first stop and give an account who they are, whence they came, etc. From this place a Malay gentleman took me in a carriage to Sabandar. Mr. Englehart, whose house was in the environs of the city on the side nearest the shipping. The Sabandar is the officer with whom all strangers are obliged to transact their business, at least the whole must go through his hands with him i went to pay my respects to the governor-general who received me with great civility i acquainted his excellency with my situation and requested my people might be taken care of and that we would be allowed to take a passage to europe in the first ship that sailed i likewise desired permission to sell the schooner and launch all this his excellency told me should be granted i then took leave and returned with the sabandar who wrote down the particulars of my wants in order to form from them a regular petition to be presented to the consul the next day i had brought from the governor of copang directed for the governor-general at batavia the account of my voyage and misfortune translated into dutch from an account that i had given to mr van est so attentive had they been at timor to everything that related to us there is a large hotel at batavia fitted up purposely for the accommodation of strangers who are not allowed to reside at any other place it is situated near the great river in a part of the city that is reckoned the most airy and healthy nevertheless i found the air hot and suffocating and was taken ill in the night with a violent pain in my head friday two the next morning at nine the council sat and i attended accompanied by the sabandar and was informed that the council had complied with all that i had requested when i returned to the hotel my headache increased and a violent fever came on i sent to acquaint the sabandar of my situation and was soon after attended by the head surgeon of the town hospital mr onsorp by whose care and skill in less than twenty-four hours the fever considerably abated but a severe headache continued i had an invitation from the governor-general to dine with him which of course i was obliged to decline i hired a carriage which cost three dollars per day for the benefit of taking an airing my lodgings at the hotel were so close and hot that i desired the sabandar to apply to the governor-general for leave to hire a house in the country which request his excellency not only immediately complied with but gave directions for my being accommodated at the house of the physician or surgeon-general mr sparling one of my people thomas hall being ill with a flux i obtained leave for him to be sent to the country hospital which is a convenient airy building tuesday six 
This morning at sunrise I left the hotel and was carried to Mr. Sparling's house, about four miles distant from the city and near the convalescent hospital, which at this time also had sick men in it, the whole number of patients amounting to eight hundred. I found everything prepared for my comfort and convenience. Mr. Sparling would suffer me to take no medicine, though I had still considerable fever with headache, but I found so much relief from the difference of the air that in the evening I was able to accompany Mr. Sparling on a visit to the Governor-General at one of his country seats, where we found many ladies all dressed in the melee fashion, some of them richly ornamented with jewels. I had invitations from several gentlemen, and some very kindly pressed me to make their country houses my abode until my health should be re-established. My indisposition increasing, Mr. Sparling advised me to quit Batavia as speedily as possible, and represented the necessity of it to the Governor-General. I was informed from His Excellency that the homeward-bound ships were so much crowded that there would be no possibility of all my people going in one ship, and that they could be accommodated no other way than by dividing them into different ships. Seeing, therefore, that a separation was unavoidable, I determined to follow the advice of the physician, and, as a packet was appointed to sail for Europe on the 16th instant, I sent the request to the governor that I might be allowed to take a passage in her for myself and as many as my people as they were able to receive. In answer to this, I was acquainted that myself and two more could be accommodated in the packet, she being too small to admit a greater number, but that I might rest assured of passages being provided for those that remained at the earliest opportunities. Friday, 9. This day anchored in the road the General Elliot, an English ship commanded by Captain Lloyd. In the Straits of Banca he had met with some boats belonging to the East India Company's ship Vansitart that was lost in the Straits of Billiton by having struck on a rock that went through her bottom. Captain Wilson, who commanded the Vansitart, I was informed had just finished a survey of those straits and was hoisting his boat in when the ship struck. Immediately on receiving the intelligence, Captain Lloyd, in the General Elliot, and another ship and company called the Nunsuch, sailed for the wreck. They found the ship had been burnt down to the water's edge by the Malays. They, however, saved forty chests of treasure out of fifty-five which were said to have been on board. Most of the ship's company were saved. One man only was lost in the ship and five others in a small boat were missing, who were supposed to have taken some of the treasure. The greater part of the people went with Captain Wilson to China, and some were with Captain Lloyd. Saturday, 10. This morning the resource was sold by public auction. The custom at Batavia is to begin high and to lower the price till some person bids, and the first bidder is the buyer. She was accordingly put up at two thousand rix dollars, but to my great disappointment no one offered to purchase before the auctioneer had lowered the demand to two hundred ninety-five rix dollars, for which price she was sold, the purchaser being an Englishman, Captain John Eddy, who commanded an English ship from Bengal. If no strangers had been present at the sale, I imagine they would have let her run down to two hundred dollars, in which case I should have had no alternative. The launch likewise was sold. The services she had rendered us made me feel great reluctance at parting with her, which I would not have done if I could have found a convenient opportunity of getting her conveyed to Europe. Little as the schooner had sold for, I found I was in danger of having the sum lessened, for the Sabandar informed me that by an order of the council there was a duty on the sale of all vessels. With this demand I would by no means comply, for I thought I had sufficiently suffered in sustaining a loss of seven hundred five rix dollars out of the thousand by the purchase and sale of the vessel, she having cost a thousand rix dollars. This day Thomas Hall, whom I had sent to be taken care of at the hospital, died. He had been ill of a flux from the time of our arrival at Timor. Monday, 12. I agreed with the captain of the packet for a passage to Europe for myself, my clerk, and a servant. 
The Sabandar informed me it was necessary that my officers and people should be examined before a notary respecting the loss of the bounty, as otherwise the governor and council were not legally authorized to detain her if she should be found in any of the Dutch settlements. They were therefore at my desire examined, and afterwards made affidavit before the governor and council at the Stadt House. My officers complaining to me of the unreasonableness of some tradesmen's bills, I spoke to the Sabandar. A bill of fifty-one dollars for five hats he reduced to thirty dollars, and in other articles made proportionable deductions. Paper money is the currency of Batavia, and is so understood in all bargains. At this time paper was a twenty-eight percent discount, there is likewise a difference in the value of the ducatoons which at batavia is eighty stivers and in holland only sixty-three stivers this occasions a loss of twenty-one and one-quarter per cent on remittance of money it therefore follows that if any person at batavia remits money by bill of exchange to europe they lose by the discount and the exchange forty-nine and one-quarter per cent those who have accounts to pay and can give unexceptionable bills on Europe will find a considerable savings by negotiating their bills with private people who are glad to give them a premium of 20% at the least. This discovery I made somewhat too late to profit by. One of the greatest difficulties that strangers have to encounter is their being obliged to live at the hotel. This hotel was formerly two houses, which by doors of communication have been made one. It is in the middle of a range of buildings more calculated for a cold country than for such a climate as Batavia. There is no free circulation of air, and what is equally bad, it is always very dirty, and there is a great want of attendance. What they call cleaning the house is another nuisance, for they never use any water to cool it, or to lay the dust, but sweep daily with brooms in such a manner that those in the house are almost suffocated by a cloud of dust. The months of December and January are reckoned the most unhealthy of the year, the heavy rains being then set in. The account of the seasons is given to me here, I believe may be relied on. The middle of November, the west monsoon begins, and rain. December and January. Continual rain with strong westerly wind. February. Westerly wind. Towards the end of this month the rain begins to abate. March. Intervals of fine weather. Wind westerly. April. In this month the east monsoon begins. Weather generally fine with showers of rain. May. East monsoon fixed. Showery june and july clear weather strong east wind august and september wind more moderate october in this month the wind begins to be variable with showers of rain the current is said always to run with the wind nevertheless i found the reverse in sailing from timor to java between the end of october and the beginning of the ensuing year no Dutch ship bound for Europe is allowed to sail from Batavia for fear of being near the Mauritius at the time of the hurricanes, which are frequent there in December and January. My illness prevented me from gaining much knowledge of Batavia. Of their public buildings I saw nothing that gave me so much satisfaction as their country hospital for seamen. It is a large, commodious, and airy building about four miles from the town, close to the side of the river, or rather in the river, for the ground on which it sands has by labor been made an island of, and the sick are carried there in a boat. Each ward is a separate dwelling, and the different diseases are properly classed. They have sometimes 1,400 patients in it. At this time there were 800, but more than half of those were recovered and fit for service, of whom 300 were destined for the fleet that was to sail for Europe. I went through most of the wards, and there appeared great care and attention. The sheets, bedding, and linen of the sick were perfectly neat and clean. The house of the physician, Mr. Sparling, who has the management of the hospital, is at one extremity of the building, 
and here it was that I resided, to the attention and care of this gentleman, for which he would receive no payment, I am probably indebted for my life. The hospital in the town is well attended, but the situation is so ill-chosen that it certainly would be the saving of many lives to build one in its stead up the river, which might be done with great advantage, as water carriage is so easy and convenient. A great neglect in some of the commanders of the shipping here was suffering their people to go dirty, and frequently without frock, shirt, or anything to cover their bodies, which, besides being a public nuisance, must probably be productive of ill health in the most robust constitution. The Governor-General gave me leave to lodge all my people at the country hospital, which I thought a great advantage, and with which they were perfectly satisfied. The officers, however, at their own request, remained in the town. The time fixed for the sailing of the packet approaching, I settled my accounts with the Sabandar, leaving open the vittling account to be closed by Mr. Fryer, the master, previous to his departure, who I likewise authorized to supply the men and officers left under his command with one month's pay to enable them to purchase clothing for their passage to England. I had been at great pains to bring living plants from Timor in six tubs, which contained jacks, nankas, carabolas, namnams, jambos, and three thriving breadfruit plants. These I thought might be serviceable at the Cape of Good Hope, if brought no farther, but I had the mortification of being obliged to leave them all at Batavia. I took these plants on board at Kapang on the 20th of August. They had experienced a passage of 42 days to my arrival here. The breadfruit plants died to the root and sprouted afresh from thence. The carabolas, jacks, nankas, and namnams I had raised from the seed, and they were in fine order. No judgment can hence be formed of the success of transporting plants, as in the present trial they had many disadvantages. Friday, 16. This morning being sunrise, I embarked on board the Vallide packet, commanded by Captain Peter Corrette, bound for Middleburg. With me likewise embarked Mr. John Samwell, clerk, and John Smith, seaman. Those of our company who stayed behind the governor promised me should follow in the first ships and be as little divided as possible. At seven o'clock the packet weighed and sailed out of the road. Sunday, 18. On the 18th we spoke the Rambler, an American brig belonging to Boston, bound to Batavia. After passing the Straits of Sunda, we steered to the north of the Cocos Isles. These islands, Captain Couvret informed me, are full of coconut trees. There is no anchorage near them but good landing for boats. Their latitude 12 degrees 0 minutes south, longitude 96 degrees 5 minutes east. In the passage to the Cape of Good Hope there occurred nothing worth remark. I cannot, however, forbear noticing the Dutch manner of navigating. They steer by true compass, or rather endeavor to do so, by means of a small movable central card which they set to the meridian, and whenever they discover the variation is altered two and a half degrees since the last adjustment, they again correct the central card. This is steering within a quarter of a point without aiming at greater exactness. The officer of the watch likewise corrects the course for leeway by his own judgment before it is marked down in the log board. They heave no log. I was told that the company do not allow it. Their manner of computing their run is by means of a measured distance forty feet along the ship's side. They take notice of any remarkable patch of froth when it is abreast the foremost end of the measured distance, and count half seconds till the mark of froth is abreast the after end. With the number of half seconds thus obtained, they divide the number 48, taking the product of the rate of sailing in geographical miles in one hour, or the number of Dutch miles in four hours. It is not usual to make any allowance to the sun's declination on account of being on a different meridian from that for which the tables are calculated. They in general compute with the numbers just as they are found in the table. 
from all this it is not difficult to conceive the reason why the dutch are frequently above ten degrees out of their reckoning their passages likewise are considerably lengthened by not carrying a sufficient quantity of sail december sixteen in the afternoon we anchored in table bay december seventeen the next morning i went on shore and waited on his excellency m van der graaf who received me in the most polite and friendly manner the guardian commanded by lieutenant ra had left the cape about eight days before with cattle and stores for port jackson this day anchored in table bay the astri a french frigate commanded by the count de st revel from the isle of france on board of which ship was the late governor the chevier de entrecaste the other ships that arrived during my stay at the cape were a french forty-gun frigate an east india ship and a brig of the same nation likewise two other french ships with slaves from the coast of mozambique bound to the west indies a dutch packet from europe after a four months passage and the harpy a south sea whaler with four hundred barrels of spermaceti and four hundred of seal and other oils there is a standing order from the dutch east india company that no person who takes a passage from batavia to europe on any of their ships shall be allowed to leave the ship before she arrives at her intended port according to this regulation i must have gone to holland in the packet of this i was not informed till i was taking leave of the governor-general at batavia when it was too late for him to give the captain an order to permit me to land in the channel he however desired i would make use of his name to governor van der graaf who readily complied with my request and gave the necessary orders to the captain of the packet a copy of which his excellency gave to me and at the same time recommendatory letters to people of consequence in holland in case i should be obliged to proceed so far i left a letter at the cape of good hope to be forwarded to governor phillips at port jackson for the first opportunity containing a short account of my voyage with the descriptive list of the pirates and from batavia i had written to lord cornwallis so that every part of india will be prepared to receive them saturday two we sailed from the cape in company with the astri french frigate the next morning neither ship nor land were in sight on the fifteenth we passed in sight of the island st helena on the twenty first we saw the island ascension on the tenth of february the wind being at northeast blowing fresh our sails were covered with a fine orange-coloured dust fuego the westernmost of the cape de verde islands and the nearest land to us on that day at noon bore northeast by east half east distance one hundred forty leagues when we had passed the latitude of the western islands a lookout was kept for some rocks which captain coray had been informed lay in latitude forty four degrees twenty five minutes north and two degrees fifty minutes east longitude from the east end of st mitchell this information captain coray had received from a person that he knew and who said that he had seen them on the thirteenth of march we saw the bill of portland and on the evening of the next day sunday march the fourteenth i left the packet and was landed at portsmouth by an isle of wight boat those of my officers and people whom i left at batavia were provided with passages in the earliest ships and at the time we parted were apparently in good health nevertheless they did not all live to quit batavia mr elphinstone master's mate and peter linkletter seaman died within a fortnight after my departure the hardships they had experienced having rendered them unequal to cope with so unhealthy a climate as that of batavia the remainder embarked on board the dutch fleet for europe and arrived safe in this country except robert lamb who died on the passage and mr ledward the surgeon who has not yet been heard of thus of nineteen who were forced by the mutineers into the launch it has pleased god that twelve should surmount the difficulties and dangers of the voyage and live to revisit their native country end of chapter twenty a voyage to the south sea was recorded by tom crawford in cool california u s a 
and proof listen by Sheila in Nottinghamshire, England. If you wish to learn more about William Bly and HMS Bounty, look up either one in Wikipedia. In addition, two other books are available on LibriVox. George Hamilton, Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora, and Sir John Barrow, Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of HMS Bounty, Its Cause and Consequences.